My name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. In today's video, we're learning some of the basics of PowerShell, specifically on how to install or execute application installation. So,
Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, we're learning some of the basics of PowerShell, specifically on how to install or execute application installation. So what, we'll, uh, what I will teach you here is how to use some basic commands that would lead you towards creating your own scripts that would allow you to install software through the PowerShell. So basically, once you go to the internet and you download something, it's going to be inside of downloads folder and whatever you decide to install, let's for example, take this example here, Media Creation Tool 1809, you would simply double click it and you get the prompts and you go through the prompts and then you install everything like that. Well, you can also execute this through the PowerShell. So there are a couple of ways of doing this which will help you get to the point where you create your own script to run PowerShell remote installs or even local installs, if you will, and that is to get to the same directory. So if we type in CD downloads, it's going to take us to that directory. The reason it got us to that directory is because we were already partially there. But if we really wanted to navigate to this, it would be simple as this. We're going to type in users, name of the local profile that I'm using, which is YT login, and then I'm going to type in downloads, it's going to get us to the same place. So if we type in the IR, we can see that that media creation tool is indeed there as well. So this is one of those things you might want to double check every time you create or before you start to create your scripts. <clears throat> By the way, this is going to be a little bit more advanced, so it's a little bit more advanced for uh, you know people who are more familiar with computer software. But if you're new to computers, I will try to go as slow as possible. Comparatively speaking, here's the same directory in a GUI form. So this is inside of our Windows, and we can see that it's exact same stuff that we see in here. So let's go ahead and execute it from the PowerShell. And the way to do that is to type in start process. And then type in media creation tool.exe. See, now we get the same prompt to uh, go through our uh, prompts to, you know, basically install our software. However, if you want to make this to be a silent operation, you would do the same thing and then just do a switch or a command, which is forward slash s. This would execute it silently if it is an MSI package, typically. It won't work here because this is executable. It's designed to literally go through the prompts like that. But if you do have MSI package, it will allow you to do so like so. And for example of an MSI package, in case you don't know, is for example, this one. This is an MSI installer for that, and that is that .MSI. Now here's another example of how to do it on from a remote uh, remote location. In our case, we might have something on a network level, which is for me located here. I went ahead and created a folder for this example on forward uh, backslash backslash Kobuman one, and that is the PC name or the server name that you might be using. And then I'm going to type in folder name repo one. So if we look inside of this one, the IR, we can see that we still have that media creation tool inside of that. So the same way we can execute it from here as well. So we can start type in the same way, start process media creation tool 1809.exe. Since we're in the disk directory already, I can just hit enter and we're going to get that pop up again and it's installing. So I went ahead and canceled that. This is where you're getting all these errors. Now, we can the same way we can start our script by typing in let's see here start dash process and then we're simply going to navigate to the network location let's see here and then it's going to be cobleman one for uh, folder name repo one and then we're going to do a backslash and then we're going to type in media creation tool 1809.exe. Then we're going to hit enter. And now we have that pop up again. And again, if you want to make this silent, you're going to have to create your own MSI package or something like that and basically design it so it is silent. So meaning that nothing happens that you see visually, it just kind of installs it. So that's how you would do it. Uh, that's how you would start to create your script for a remote location using PowerShell. 
Now, you can also use a package manager to download different applications or access different applications and execute them like so, but you would have to have some kind of a uh, package manager that would allow you to do so. So let's look at a repository that's online available right now that you can kind of look at as an example of that. So there's one that was set up for testing by Microsoft, which we will navigate here in a moment. Let me just do a, a quick clear here so that we don't have any uh, confusion here. And in order to find these packages, we can type in find dash package and then we need to specify a provider which that means is you know dash provider this is basically indicates that we're going to now type in the provider name in our case the provider or our server name if you will is chocolatey i think that's how it's pronounced so we're going to hit enter here and see what happens so Here's just the run of all the things that are available as in packages on this repository or uh, server, if you will. So how do we get any of these packages downloaded to our computer? We just kind of have to know which one we want, but we can also kind of, if we specifically want to look for some specific, let's say, I don't know, uh, let's say Notepad. So we can stop it from kind of going through all the things and see if there's anything available for Notepad. Because you can see there are so many different things here. And if there's something specific that, you can, that you're can you looking for, you're going to have to, you know, kind of remember that or specifically search for. So let's stop this process here. And I'm going to leave it up just for the sake of reference. I'm going to open up a new PowerShell and we're going to access the same repository, but I'm going to tell it to look for a specific name. And in our case, we're going to use an example of namepad so we're going to type in again find dash package and then we're going to type in provider and then server chocolatey and i'm going to specify a command which is name that tells it i'm okay i want you to look for this specifically or anything or any derivative of that or anything like that i'm going to type in notepad and i'm going to use asterisk so i'm going to type in and everything that's uh, that has a notepad there's in, inside of this uh, repository it's going to show up as so so now we can see all the things that are available as a package um, inside of this repository so yes we can now download these packages and uh, we're going we can use them in our package manager to push this type of different software so what can we do with this point well we can install one of these packages so let's go ahead and pick a, a random one let's Let's pick this one, Notepad++. We're going to do Control c on this, so we have it saved. And then again, we're going to uh, we use some commands. And this, this case, instead of typing in Find Package, we're going to type in Install Package. Install Package. We're going to uh, type in Provider once more. And then we're going to type in Chocolaty. And then we're going to specify a name, and then we're going to say Notepad++. So let's see what happens when we execute that. And now it's asking us whether we trust this source, which is for the right reasons. If you're going to look at this repository, make sure that you feel comfortable with installing this on your computer. And here it asks you, are you sure you want to install software from Chocolaty? And I can say yes, yes to all, no, or no to all, suspend, or or if you're unsure, you can type in help. So in my case, I'm just gonna type in Y for yes, and I'm gonna hit enter. And now it's installing this package. So let's see what happened. Did this actually install it? This is actually what happened. When we did that, it actually just downloaded that repository into our folder that is created on the root of C, and it's going to be in our libraries. And here is our chocolatey, uh, well, there's a core extension, there it is, notepad++ is what we just got here and there are a couple of different packages here that are installed ah this one actually came with the installer so that's cool now we can actually execute this installer if we really wanted to and all right i found that some of these uh packages are not com incomplete that i've downloaded for example visual studio here this one doesn't seem to have the actual 
the actual uh, executable in there. But this one actually installed. What is this one? This is part of the same one. Okay, well, we can execute this now. And all we got to do is just copy this path here. And then we can type in again, start process. And then we can specify that. And then we, we need to get the name of that installation. Let's do the uh, x64, the 64-bit version of that. And I'm going to paste that in there. And I'm going to hit enter. And here it is. Now, let's see if it works silently. It errored out because I clicked no, as you saw. I'm going to use the S switch. Let's see if this, nope. So yeah, it has to be an MSI package for it to install silently. And this one is just a simple executable. Anyways, guys, I hope you find this kind of interesting because it really is. You can um, do, we can set up scripts that will allow you to install remote uh, software packages into multiple computers, this and that. There are many, many ways of going about it. This is kind of just an introduction to PowerShell. And uh, there are many, many different tools that you can look at. And, uh, and not only can you install, you can also uninstall. And again, there are different ways of doing this. You can use the invoke command or you can just use install package command. You can use the start process command, many, many different ways. And this is the great thing about PowerShell. You can customize this to your needs or to your business needs of just the way, you've, the way it feels the best for your type of business that you'll work at. And, you know, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, I know some of the basic stuffs, and I really believe that everybody should know and familiarize themselves with some of the basic stuff, just as much as you would familiarize yourself with just using command prompt and creating basic scripts. So that being said, thank you so much for watching this video. Please share it with your friends. If you have any questions, please let me know, and you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Welcome, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobu Man. Thank you so much for joining. Today's video will be about whatever the title says. Um, the reason for that being is because I need to actually figure out what we're going to talk about. And for that to happen, I will have to go to my website, which is CosmicNovo.com. And I'm just going to pick a random article that's on my website probably one of the more popular ones over here on the left hand side and just kind of talk about a random thing that comes up for example here's a top 20 network administrator interview questions and answers article and I'm going to pick that and kind of scroll down and pick a random interview question that we can kind of expand on you know what I mean so let's see here by the way, I have a video on this particular article as well. If you want to check it out, it's definitely on my channel. Let's see here. Can you name different types of network cables? What is a subnet mask? I think I have a video on that. Can you tell me the difference between a work group and a domain? I'm not sure if I have a video on this, but you know what? Let's go for it. Now, I'm going to just go to read this answer here. Um, to this question, and I'm going to expand on it, meaning I'm going to explain it in a way where it's pretty easy to understand to anybody, even if you're like brand new to computers. I really like helping people who are just starting to learn about computers. So this video will be for you. <laughs> so I, uh, all right, let's get to it. So the question is, can you tell me the difference between a work group and a domain? My answer here is, with a work group, you have a collection of systems that are connected to the same network, but have their own set of rules and permissions set at local level. So let's go ahead and, and expand on that right away, and then we'll come back to the domain part here, because it ties into it a little bit later and at a grander or a bigger scale, if you will. So, all right, let's have a look. If you have more than one computer at home, chances are that in order to share any, you know, data, any files between them, or, you know, to be able to remote desktop into any of them, chances are you would have to be connected to the same work group. Otherwise, you won't be able to see the other computer on the network. Um, and, and, and I mean that in a uh, easy manner, you know, you can always see which computers are connected 
to the network by you know pinging the you know certain you know uh, names and this and that but that's not what this is about this is about having an easy access to other computers on the same network which in a basic home environment would be considered as a workgroup so what happens is when you have let's say four computers at home and you know one is yours maybe you your other one is your wife's your kids or your brother your sister and uh, you guys want to kind of share information share files across you know between each other computer then you have to join each computer to the exact same work group which basically creates a mini network at a software level so this is different from a physical network where it's just you know you plug in all the computers to the same router and it's different from all the computers connect to the same Wi-Fi that's a physical layer of the network this is a software layer which are we which are which are some something we are dealing with right now so in order to access the software meaning the operating system of each computer then we have to make sure they're joined in the same group so if you look at the properties of this computer by the way these are just system properties that, that I went to uh, so we can get some basic information you can see that the name of this computer is tech support and it just says full computer name is tech support this is related to the networking part of it but it's the same so that's good and the work group here is called new server zero so each computer that is connected to the same router at home to the same physical network will have to be joined to the same work group if you want to share all the you know all the media across that same network including printers and all of that stuff so let's look at some advanced settings which will kind of tie into on how to join the computer to the same work group here are system properties and another way to get to the system properties aside from going you know of right clicking to this PC and then properties and then having to click click on change settings you can get to it through control panel as well this is one of the things I don't really like about the Windows 10 operating system you can see that a system option also came up here but let's see how we can get to it to control panel and it, we are getting to the same thing so if we select system in the control panel we'll get to the same area but then from here we can either click on advanced system settings or change settings here and we will pretty much get to the same place the only difference is if we click on advanced system settings here it will pull up in just a different tab you see that which is I really don't like this about Windows 10 but I digress because they don't make it simple just to get to this main advanced setting I guess this is designed to protect users who may make changes that may break their computer anyway let's get to the first tab of the system properties I'm gonna close this out and this is how you would change the name of this computer or added to a domain or a workgroup so while we're in the computer name tab we can just look down here and it's the last button that we have that's called change we can select that and here we can change the name of it we can have it join to a specific workgroup so here this would be empty chances are and then you would just type in new server zero and then click OK and then you would have to restart the computer and then your computer would be joined to that same work group so after you do that for all the computers and reboot all the computers you can now access resources for those other computers over the network so if you go here and then you can see that if I expand network that different computers will show up accordingly as soon as it loads a little bit some of the computers are asleep which may take a little bit for it to pull up but generally speaking once you are connected to the network you can see the other 
computers that are on that same network and everything else that is connected to the same network. Here you can see there's a web OS TV connected to it and there is TS um, client as well connected to it. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the network uh, that's the network work groups. Very simple. It's kind of something you would do in a small business environment or just at home, just so you have basic access to the same resources. Another thing you can do once you you know connect to the same network or I should say same uh, work group, you can use remote desktop. So you can use remote desktop connection like this and just type in the name of the computer you wish to connect to. And I'm going to connect to one of my computers that is called Koboman 1. Let's see if it'll actually let me do it since I'm already using remote desktop. You can see that I'm already connected to remote desktop. I wonder if I can double remote desktop. Let's see here. The computer is asleep over there. I'm looking at it right now. A lot of times it actually pings the computer and it just wakes up, which is also called wake up on LAN. But for some reason, my computer is fast asleep over there. Just a sec, I'm going to turn it on so we can try this again. Okay, so I uh, went ahead and touched the keyboard to wake it up. All right, let's see now. Configuring remote session, which means that it's aware that the computer is awake. Let's see. There it is. Now I can connect to Koboman1 using the username, login, and password that is on that computer over there. Okie dokie. So now we have that done. Now let's go back to the domain. So with a domain, you have a group of systems that are bound by the rules of centralized authentication server. In a domain system, each um, in a domain, each system has to connect through the domain server using provided credentials, also known as a domain controller. So somewhat similar to a work group, domain is a controller or a computer. Just imagine a server somewhere that controls the data that is shared between all those computers that are connected to that physical network. So instead of joining a work group, your computer would be joined to a domain. And that domain also controls your login information. So instead of using a login that's on your computer, which is in my case, YT login, you can see it here. I'll show you what I mean here. These are local. Here we go. Jeez, this Windows 10 really is so much different. And so roundabout, not very user friendly when it comes to I digress. Here are the local accounts that are on my computer. So these are local accounts that lets me log in locally to this computer. So BUCO and Koboman test account, they're all local accounts. As you can see, they're literally uh, labeled local accounts. There's another way to c connect to a computer uh, without having to a local account, and that is a domain login account. But for that to work, you have to join your computer to that same domain. And if we go back to these properties and click change settings here, and then click change once more here. So instead of joining work group, we can join our computer to a domain. So we just have to select domain here and then we can type in domain domain name just for example and then we can you know call it I don't know cobbleman.com whatever the name of the domain is. So once we do that we would click OK and then this computer that is named tech support will join that domain. However, you also have to go to the domain controller 
the server and tell it that you are allowing a computer name called tech support to join the domain. So once you click OK, it's going to ask you to restart the computer and then the computer will restart or reboot if you will. And then you get a login information from the domain controller that says, OK, now you use this login. So now that you are joined to that same domain, now you can start to share data between all of those computers that are connected to the same domain. And you also have access to other resources that are available for that domain. So let's say there's a, there's a shared drive somewhere or some kind of a database or something like that that is only available for the computers that are connected to that specific domain, now you will have access to that. So if you're at work and you know somebody says, OK, I want to connect to this server or I want to access this shared drive or something like that, and they can't, if you look at their login information on the domain controller, you can see which resources they have access to. And once you go there, you can see all that information. So chances are you may have to adjust their access to the specific resources. I hope that was pretty easy to understand. I uh, This was one of those slower pace videos because, you know, these things can be confusing to people and finding a good way to explain this in a, you know, slower pace is um, pretty rare to find on the internet. So, and I know that a lot of my viewers appreciate this type of explanation. So, I hope you like this. Uh, please leave a like on this video. I'd appreciate it a lot. And if you have any questions or any video suggestions related to, you know, just PC support in general, feel free to leave it in the comments box below. And don't forget to subscribe. All right. Thank you so much for watching and you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo In today's video, we have introduction to Microsoft Azure. Microsoft Azure is a web-based or a cloud-based platform, if you will, that allows you to deploy different type of applications using Microsoft's service or Microsoft's processing power. So just imagine a bunch of different locations all around the world that have server rooms inside of them. All of those servers you are able to access through the Microsoft Azure and set up or deploy any application that you may even think of. And I'll show you there are so many options that you can use. So without getting into too much of a detail, I will go ahead and show you on how to do certain things when it comes to Microsoft Azure and the things that are kind of related mostly to administration of the Azure web uh, interfaces and whatnot. There are so many different things that you can go through and I will show you step by step on how to do this, whether it's deploying certain applications or running different services. I will show you from the beginning to the end for each video so that way there is no confusion. Friends, if you like this type of content, please take one second to like the but to click the like button. I really appreciate it. It makes a huge difference for me. All right. So before you can get started, uh, you have to create an Azure account and have a Microsoft account. But before you can activate your Azure account or have full access to it, you need to provide identity, verif identity verification and they want or require a credit card for you to use to verify your identity and if they give you $200 uh, in, in credits in, uh, for first 30 days to use for all the testing that you want to do or deploy any type of services and after that I believe it's free for 12 months but it um, I'm not sure what the limitations are after that but if you want to you know go in there and set up an account for you know testing purposes for learning purposes you would need a credit card to get going they don't charge you as far as I know, maybe charge like a dollar just to, you know, kind of make sure that you are that, per, you know, the person that holds that credit card. Anyways, I don't want to get into that. That's not what this video is about. We are here to learn about Microsoft Azure. 
All right, so let's go ahead and have a quick look of how it looks like. This is me logged in into Microsoft Azure, and there are a couple of things that you notice first. This is the home page, and typically in the home page, what you see is different uh, applications or things you've installed recently, and that would be under recent uh, resources. Above here, you have Azure services, and from here, you simply select a service that you want to deploy. And don't worry, I'm not going to confuse you with any of this, but I just kind of want to show you what's there available. And I'm going to click on more services as I did over there, just to show you that there is a massive amount of different things you can learn. Here are some examples. Here are the categories. Uh, there are general, there are networking, storage, web, uh, you know, there's uh, analytics, there is even AI machine learning, there is uh, mixed reality security monitoring all kinds of different things you can learn so if i expand this even further to see all services you can see that there is just a massive amount of different things you can learn so that being said if you want me to talk about specific things that you want to learn when it comes to microsoft azure please let me know in the comment box below because i really you know it's, it's kind of hard to come up with topics especially when there are so many things to talk about so you know, there's no point of me doing a video on everything that you see here if, if there is not enough interest. So if there's enough enough, if there's enough interest for a specific topic, please let me know in the comments below. However, that being said, in the first two videos, we're going to concentrate on creating some virtual machines that I will show you how to access, how to monitor, and how to configure. And after that, the second video will be about uh, file storage and storage containers and how you can install them and run them using scripts through the PowerShell. All right. I hope I hope you're still with me because I promise it's not going to be uh, confusing or uh, super complex or anything like that. This is just a brief introduction to Microsoft Azure of the things that I will be uh, looking to show you. All right. So now that we're done with the brief introduction, we're going to start from scratch. So in order to start from scratch, we have to start with a resource group. So what the resource group is, and here you can see it right here, resource group is, you can think of it as a container that will have all the services, all the applications that you run in that one spot. So it's a form of, um, it's a way to organize everything in one place in order for things to function and of course things to be built properly because these are web services that you pay for typically and if you want to especially keep them running you're going to want to you're going to have to pay to Microsoft to run all these services for example let's say you want to install a web server and you want to deploy virtual machines and run Apache on it you're going to have to you know they want to know uh, they, they, they need to have a way to kind of keep track all of that. So that's what the resource group is. So I'm going to click on that and we're going to create a new one. You can see there are three different ones that I've created here. But let's go ahead and create one from a scratch. Again, this is just uh, basically, it, think of like creating a package of some sort. And the, for the package, you need that outside shell or outside box. So right now we're creating the box for our... Uh, services that we're going to run so this is going to be outside of it no labels on it yet or anything like that but we're going to uh, start creating that right now the first thing that asks here is a subscription and again that kind of ties in into what thing I was saying about them you know charging you in my case um, I'm using the Azure subscription one so this is just a way of you know a subscription you know if you will just like a Netflix subscription you would just kind of pick the subscription that you have currently right now and this is the free one that I'm using right now. There are $200 in credits available for it. So I'm going to click that so that way, um, you know, th th that's simply it is. You just kind of tell it, I want to use this subscription. And anything that's inside of this resource group is going to be charged under that subscription. This is incredibly important to know. So that way you know what you're uh, getting into and where the charges are coming from as well. All right, and then we're going to name this new resource group. So we're going to name it something that is appropriate for this tutorial, and we're going to just name it um, Azure Tutorial. We're going to name it that. Resource, next thing is resource details. This is also incredibly important. You want to make sure that everything that you deploy is in the same region. And you can see, if you expand this, that there are so many different regions. You got East, uh, US, 
um, U.S. East, I should say, and then Europe North, uh, U.S. Central, Africa, Asia, Canada, and, you know, a bunch of different ones. I'm going to stick to U.S. Central. So everything that I create in this has to be in the same region. Think about networking in a sense, especially if you, when you're trying to sync different services with one another, you want them to be in the same region, otherwise they may not work properly. Okay, now just keep that in mind. I'm going to click review and create, and after that I'm just going to click create. So here is our box, guys. This is the box that we've created, and now we're going to um, add more things to that box and the first thing we're going to do is create a virtual machine the reason I wanted to start with virtual machines is because most people are familiar with that especially if you're a system administrator of sort and uh, you know it's kind of simple to um, configure and install and most people understand what that is because it's you know most of the time it's just a you know operating system that you are familiar with all right now the, the way I'm going to add a virtual machine. I'm going to click on this little hamburger uh, icon here so I can have expanded menu and from here we can also select different services not just from home this is where we were at initially but you can also select some of the serv you know from the left hand side this is what I like to use for quick access so I'm going to go down and simply just select a virtual machine. I'm going to click on that and then I'm going to click on here to create a virtual machine and then we're going to create I'd say about three different ones just to show you so we're going to here we are in a, in a familiar window that we've seen earlier again we have to you know make sure that we have the uh, proper subscription selected this is you know again we're, this is how they're going to charge us for the service and again we have resource group and remember the one we created here we can just simply select that we're going to select our Azure tutorial this is our group and then we're going to name our virtual machine so let's see what's the most common operating system that people are using right now and that would be Windows right so let's go ahead and type in Windows 10 VM we're going to create one of those and luckily our region is automatically populated so we you know we just have to make sure it is that and it is indeed central US so it does memorize that which is really good and then uh, I'm not going to talk about infrastructure redundancy I'm just gonna leave it like that it's just a you know virtual machine and then here for the image by the way you can use your own image if you'd like it says here browse all public and private images that's just a you know a bunch of different things that they have available but from our understand you can use your own image as well but we're just going to use what they have here pre-built for now and then we're going to select Windows 10 and we're going to go with Windows 10 Pro version 1809 which is a little bit behind uh, the current version is 1909 I believe but that doesn't matter now uh, we can certainly update that later if if needed but for now you know we want to uh, we're just going to select that and here it is our size size but that means what it is is just the type of uh, CPU and RAM and system resources we want to use for this virtual machine and here it gives you an idea of what two virtual CPUs uh, cost with seven gigabytes of memory and it's 183 dollars a month so we're going to click change and we're going to select a different option that's going to be more affordable in this in the change window we have all kinds of different uh, options and as soon as the loss loads here here it is in costs a month we can select something that's a bit more affordable and uh, for that I'm going to just click this first one which is just two gigs of RAM, one virtual CPU and that's going to be good enough for our testing purposes of course testing purposes only and I do again I have that two hundred dollar credit but you know I'm just going to show this in case uh, uh, in case there's some confusion about billing or whatnot anyways so I'm going to choose one and here see how it says forty seven dollars a month this is estimated usage a lot of times and I'm not 100% sure if it the case is with Azure but I use uh, Google services for a uh, Google Cloud services for my website they will a lot of times give you different discounts so you know I'm not sure if that's 100% the case with Azure but I, I suspect it is it is just depending on what kind of a you know thing you're using uh, their services for and of course you can use you know the cheap one which is here $8 a month but this is incredibly slow so I wouldn't even um, 
uh, worry about that too much. Um, if you look at it closely, it gives you kind of a, a, a limits and how much storage you have. You can certainly look at those things uh, on your own, and it's going to be uh, dependent on your personal preferences or what what kind of a you know system that you need. Uh, but I'm just going to use it, you know, this general purpose one. I'm going to leave it at that, and I'm going to click select. All right. Now we have our virtual machine set up this is our this is going to be our settings for it so the next thing we have is creating administrator account so that we can log into it uh, and we're going to log into it using remote desktop this is pretty cool that they have it set up so i'm going to type in kobuman and i'm going to type in my password they really want a super long password which is perfectly okay so i'm going to type it in type it in twice all right, and here, uh, here are the inbound rules. Select which virtual machine networks, uh, network ports are accessible from the public internet. You can specify more limit or gradual network access to the network tab. So I'm going to leave it uh, at RDP, so that way we can use RDP. So I'm just going to leave it at that. And then here it says save money. Already have Windows Enterprise. So they're asking you about the license, whether you have a license or not. Now uh, this is something. You know, if, if you're seriously going to run this, you can look into later, but for now, it's just going to let us install it. So I'm just going to click review and create. And um, as soon as it approves the deployment, we're going to click create deployment. And after that, we're going to um, create a couple of more virtual machines. So here's our overview of the things we've selected. By clicking create, you basically you know agree to the terms of service, this and that, blah 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 blah. If you're interested in more details for that, you can certainly um, you can certainly uh, take a look for yourself. Again, we're just kind of trying to keep this as simple as possible, and then depending on what we want to do with this, we can kind of look at the more details later. Okay. Now, once we create this, as you can see, it's initializing deployment. It's going to start deploying it. What happens, it actually creates a virtual network automatically for you, and it places this machine into a virtual network for you, for, for your uh, container that we kind of talked about. So now, like kind of going back, that uh, resource um, that, um, container that we created is that box that we have now we're starting to put things inside of this box so everything that's inside of this box is the network that everything's going to be um, on and you know again we kind of made sure that we picked US Central in our case so everything that we put in there is going to be inside of that one box and everything's going to be connected and attached to itself all right so the deployment is underway so we can actually get out of this window and proceed to create a couple of more virtual machines. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to create a virtual machine uh, server. So I'm going to create a new one, I'm going to click on there. And you can see it's processing over here and that's perfectly fine. We already told it, go ahead and do this and it already has its settings and it's just doing its thing in the background. We're going to do the same thing for uh, let's see here, we're going to just pick a server. We're going to, uh, I think I want to do 2019. Uh, so again, if we go to do resource group, we're going to select Azure tutorial, and I'm going to name it Windows Serve 2019 VM. Make sure it's US Central, and I'm going to select Windows Server 2019 Data Center. I'm going to go back here and change to our standard, if available. We're going to standard uh, type of CPU processing. And it's this one, that's the first one. I'm going to select that. And again, if you're creating a server and you needed to do a certain uh, um, amount of processing, you can certainly change this at any time, even after you deploy it. So you can stop the service and later on change these settings on any of these virtual machines. I'm going to create our you know, administrator password and login. Just a moment here. I'm trying to remember there are thousands of passwords that I have for a bunch of different things. I'm trying to get a unique password for everything is a bit difficult. So again, we're going to leave the RDP open so that way we can access it. And I'm going to click review and create. And um, yes, you can go um, 
you can go into more detail and specify the type of uh, things you want on it. What does it say? It errored out. Required information is missing. What did we miss? Uh, basics. Oh, <laughs> I made it too long. The name of the virtual machine. All right. Anyways, we're going to click review and create. So yeah, you can go in there and specify the disk sizes and which network you want to use. But again, this is going to automatically put it into uh, the same the network that you need to. But if you want to go in and specify disks, you can go in there and specify type of disk you want. If you want the premium, you can certainly do so. You can add, uh, attach a disk on it. This is all virtually, uh, you know, you, you can virtually do this in any in, in type of uh, uh, virtual machine that you set up. And then if you go to networking, you can specify the network. But Again, it's automatically going to put you into the correct network, so I'm not too worried about that. And there are some other things you can, you know, check and, and adjust. But again, I want to keep this very simple so that anybody can get this going on their own. All right. So review and create. Now it should let us, uh, it should approve the deployment of it once uh, it thinks about it a little bit here. And then we're going to click, click create, excuse me, and then we're going to deploy this machine as well. It may take a little time, you know, these are not the fastest when it comes to uh, when it comes to creating virtual machine, but it is pretty, I should say it's pretty common to have this type of a uh, thing happening whenever you're using Google, no, I say Google because I use Google uh, quite often, but um, when you use uh, cloud services of this sort. But you know, you know, I digress. Uh, it is pretty fast, uh, considering that it installs an operating system on a virtual machine. Okay, let's see what our process or what our status is. It's still deploying the first one. Let's see here. Now you can see right here that uh, once I clicked on the little bell that I have $197 in credit remaining. I'm just going to leave it here for in this window for a minute and you can see here what it's kind of doing when it's deploying it's creating that you know the virtual machines and then it's reserving an IP address for it as well and it's kind of uh, telling you that it is putting it in the correct network all right let me see here you know what let's go ahead and and do another virtual machine but this time we're going to do a Linux machine and uh, yeah, this the first one is still creating. While we do that, I'm going to execute the other one. I execute the uh, deployment of our third virtual machine, which is going to be Linux. So here we are again, resource group. We're going to make sure we check check uh, Azure tutorials, and I'm going to type in Linux for the name of this virtual machine, and I'm going to actually label it Ubuntu because I'm going to select Ubuntu. Region is U.S. Central again. And then we're going, just going to leave it here on Ubuntu server 18.04. And again, you have you know different options for different types of Linuxes. And I'm going to go, go back here and select our standard type of machine for Linux. And uh, I certainly don't want to use the slowest one. And, yep, that's the one. I'm going to select that. And um, when it comes to Ubuntu or Linux. There are a couple of different ways you can access it. You can use SSH public key. So this is kind of confusing and this is another topic that you we would have to talk about and explain but it's just a different way of encrypt, uh, encryption access that you can use and then use that a, a key to access it. But that's confusing. I don't want to um, talk about that. I'm just going to keep it to simple username and password just like we have on the other one just to keep it simple and the reason I'm doing this guys is because I have people who are new to computers that watch my content uh, you know it's I can talk about SSH public keys and and this and that but you know, let's let's keep it simple guys I'm just gonna keep it simple so here we can change it uh, different sendings for the inbound ports uh, by the way if you are going to run a web server here, you can select to have it open for those as well here. 
this will allow all IP addresses to access your virtual machine. Now, if you're going to use this type of uh, uh, setup, you don't have to if you don't want to. Typically, you would just leave the SSH because you don't want to keep yourself, you know, get you know, open yourself up for the intrusion. Once you set up a web server, you'll have a way to access it um, through the web server interface. So you don't necessarily have to have these HTTPS open at this time at all. So you can leave just SSH because that's typically how you would access a Linux server because it's a command line anyways. So I would just kind of leave it at SSH and, and for that. Um, once you deploy a web server, for example, you can block access to SSH externally. There are different ways of doing it. You can use it um, to uh, you can use uh, configuration on the server itself to block access to SSH ports. But again, we're going to uh, just kind of leave it at that for now. I'm going to click Review and Create, and then once it approves our deployment, we're going to click Create. So keep it moving. Otherwise, this video would have been God knows how long if I kept talking about every detail of things, and it would be confusing as well. Okay, let's see. I'm just waiting for this window to go to the next window to kind of uh, confirm to me that it's submitted for deployment. And hopefully, hopefully our Windows 10, the first virtual machine, is deployed already. Now, I'm just kind of checking to see if everything is going right okay good good your deployment is underway all right so i'm going to go back home i'm going to click on home you can go go back to home and see the things that we've touched on recently and uh, it takes a while to update actually right here it takes a bit to update but this is what would have show up typically of the new things that we've touched on or created or adjusted and it also does that in the dashboard if we go to the dashboard okay good we got a message here that deployment succeeded for one of our virtual machines we're going to check that here in a minute but you know what let's let's pin it to dashboard because I wanted to go to dashboard anyways that was my next I'm going to pin it to dashboard so let's see what that is so next thing under home here is dashboard so we're going to click on dashboard to see what's there all right looks like our Windows server is deployed oh, where's our Windows 10 that's kind of weird didn't we have Windows 10 machine deployed as well? Did that succeed or not? Uh, Alright. Well, let's go to resources. I'm going to click on Go to Resources, Windows Server 2019. Oh, huh. this already deployed, but not the Windows 10 that I asked for. Okay. Well, let's go to our virtual machines again and see if it's there. Oh, it's still creating it. That's interesting. So Windows Server 2019 actually deployed faster than Windows 10. It's still creating it. Huh, that's very interesting. Anyways, let's go ahead and see the overview of Windows Server 2019. So again, we are on virtual machines, and this will show you all the other ones that we created as well. So we're missing a Linux here, which is still being created. And it takes a while to refresh to see. So we're going to click on Windows Server because supposedly that one is already deployed. We can see our public IP address of it. And we can here connect to it. But I kind of wanted to show you overview of it in the sense to see what is there for you to actually look at. Besides just regular information that is there. I mean, yeah, sure, you can see the IP address on it, you can see the subscription, subscription ID, you know, computer name if available, uh, but, you know, and, and then type of, uh, type of um, CPU that you're running and this and that. And you should be able to change this once you click stop, and th that's a topic for another video. But right now I wanted to show you what is kind of important as an Azure administrator, and that is monitoring. Now you can see that there are four different uh, four different graphs here and that are kind of the reason there are four and these specific ones because there is are kind of the most important ones that you would want to look at first one is being CPU average this is the usage of your CPU and the next one is network usage disk bytes which involves read and write bytes at any given time you can see it's it gives you how much on the left column here and on the bottom it tells you the time of it and also it gives you disk disk read 
and this right in bytes and uh, then on the other one on the other one here over here next to it it says disk operations per second on average and it gives you different times the reason this is important to have is that if you suspect something suspicious going on for example let's say you're running a website or a web server or you suspect attack on your server you can look at the different times and this different CPU usage different um, different uh, operations on it that are happening at certain times and uh, this doesn't give us a good example here because it's a brand new one but let's go ahead and connect to it and we're going to do some stuff on it so that way it's going to give us some data here which we can get back to and I can kind of talk about it a little bit more because right now it doesn't really give us enough for me to talk about so let's go ahead and click connect here and we're going to select RDP all right so what this does it's going to download an RDP uh, file for us that we can just simply click and use it just a regular you know windows remote desktop uh, remote desktop protocol so we're going to click on that and it's going to save it i'm just trying to check in okay you don't see the pop-up but there's actually a pop-up that says uh, do you want to save this file or just open it i'm going to click open it i'm going to click connect i apologize you guys don't see the login on this recording but it is there so what I'm doing is just typing in the password and the login that I showed you before that I've set up upon the creation of this and I'm going to click OK I will show you the the uh, whatchamacallit the remote desktop as well as soon as I get it going here okay just a moment please bear with me I just need to add a different source window capture I need to capture that window just a moment please bear with me here we go remote desktop here we are all right there you guys there you go I hope you can see it it's loading right now so I'm going to let's see here hope it doesn't break the The stupid recording window software is not is not being good to me. All right, looks like it's showing the RDP there, and it's creating it. You know the typical thing: the first time you log in, it's going to create your local profile, and it's going to take a bit to load. It's you know th this is very typical. Uh, you, you just kind of have to wait for it to start and get going and here it is finally coming up so this is our windows server machine pretty soon we're going to see that windows server setup configuration there and then it's just like using a you know regular windows server machine you is if you were there you guys know what remote desktop is but then again you have this goes to show you that you have full access to it okay now I'm going to go back to that overview and kind of look at those graphs with you and tell you kind of for the things to to kind of look for when it comes to monitoring this type of a system and then I'm going to show you the other machines as well depending how long this takes and see here it is here's that typical thing where it asks you to do you want to allow this PC to be discoverable and we're going to click yes for that so there you go this is typically what happens or what you see when you install Windows Server and uh, I'm just going to minimize this and go back to our Azure window okay there we are okay so we're going to click on overview again just so you can see all the things that are be that are happening on the window uh, on the um, Windows uh, 2019 server so since we've logged into it we saw more activity now we can see that at this time which is at 12 13 p.m. we can see that there is more CPU activity As a matter of fact they spiked to almost 100 percent and at the same time you can see that it kind of moves the other 
diagrams or uh, graphs at the same time so that way you can see what is going on at the same time so it kind of aligns it for you and now now you can see there is more read and write which is pretty normal it gives you the disk reads down here where it says 137 megabytes and then disk writes of 483 megabytes so this is happening as we are creating our local profile and at the same time we see some network activity and that is you know it says windows server is network in total is 147 megabytes and network out total is uh, let's see it's still happening it's at 1.27 megabytes so it downloaded 147 megabytes of data and it uploaded 100, uh, 1 megabyte uh, 1.27 megabytes and then we get more disk operations so why is this important why am i telling you about this if you suspect somebody hacking in to your system you might want to kind of look at the spikes in the graph otherwise you'll be just normal or just a little jagged like this normally this is pretty normal operation just kind of idling but when it comes to huge spikes like this you want to kind of look at this and see what is happening now if it's just a web server and you see increase in traffic you know people using your website and you see a spike like this but then you look at your other monitoring tools for the live traffic of people coming through and you see a spike on your server that's not normal right but if you suddenly see a spike at a certain time then you might want to see if there is some kind of a you know attack on your server or whatnot or if there's some kind of a you know who knows maybe even a virus happening on your computer if you have abnormal disk reads a bytes or cpu usage all right so the next thing i'm going to do is look at other things that are here under the overview there are a bunch of different things here that we can look at that help you deal with this type of stuff and things that you can change so if you click for example on networking here under settings you can look at the network segments of it and gives you more information on it you can add inbound port rules if you want to open up uh, you know uh, the different uh, ports or not you can at the same time you can disable one so here's our rdp here and we can disable it if we want so if you're occasionally accessing this windows server and using the rdp you might want to delete it so that way you're you know you're more protected nobody can really you know try to access it afterwards and then same thing uh, when it comes to disks if you click on disks here um, you can you know make changes to it if you'd like uh, a lot of times we have to stop the um, the service from running I'm not exactly sure if that's the case here with the Azure systems that uh, we can certainly try that and then we got a bunch of different monitoring uh, things that we can look at so one of the things that I showed you there are those graphs and there is a different way to look at that as well if you want a more customized and cleaner way of doing it if you click on the little hamburger thing uh, assign you can go down here and select monitor and you can look at uh, monitoring uh, metrics of it so if you click here explore metrics you can add different graphs that you can look at again I don't want to confuse you too much with this again this is just another way of looking at the same thing except in a more detailed manner where you can make adjustments and change the different metrics that you want to look at and here's a, just a real quick if we click here on the scope this allows you to select our resource so if we select our Azure subscription one we know this is where our resource group is at and then we can click Azure tutorial and then we're going to look down here for our server and for some reason it's not scrolling down but that's okay no problem we know that we have that service and to click on resource type I'm going to uncheck select all I'm going to just click virtual machines because that's the only thing I want to look at for now and I'm going to close that and now it's going to come up and say well you have three virtual machines which ones do you want to monitor I'm going to click I'm going to click Windows Server 2019 I'm going to select that and now it's asking me to select a metric so we can kind of replicate to you know what we've seen previously we can kind of select I don't know let's see disk read operations per second uh, we had that over there and then the graph is going to come up and show us you can see here and uh, there's that then we can you know add more to it or we can add another metric and uh, in a way where we can just select what was the other one network out total let's see where's our network network in total I should say and there was an out as well and it gives you that and it those they give you kind of side by side but if you want them to you know uh, kind of stack on top of each other you can certainly do that as well I'm just gonna move it to the right here to move the timeline but again 
there's not much going on right now so there really isn't much to look at and let me just try it one more here CPU there's I want to look for the uh, CPU one percentage CPU here we go average okay and it gives you see it's it's just not enough for us to kind of visualize Anyways, the machine is just too new for us to actually, for this to work properly, because it hasn't even replicated completely. We know there's a lot more going on, it's just that it takes time, and these things kind of take time to replicate for you to use this properly. But anyways, it's all here, it's just a different way of looking at it, and if you want to get a more you know, in-depth analysis of what's going on with the usage of that machine, you can certainly do that. Alright, let's go to other virtual machines. Uh, we can look at Windows 10, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, yeah, I, I went ahead and stopped it early. I don't know if you guys seen that, but I went ahead and stopped it from working. But it's because the way I access it is the same as Windows Server 2019. I just wanted to show you that you can deploy that. Let's go ahead and click our Linux Ubuntu machine. The way you can connect to this is if you click on the connect, you can use SSH, you can use RDP. But if we click on RDP, you can see that we have to install certain things on our computer in order to access this. This is not going to actually work. So if I click download RDP, it's not going to actually let me work to it. Typically you would, um, and it's closed. We know that the port is closed anyways. So uh, we can choose to connect with SSH with the key thing, this and that, but you know, I don't, I don't want to do that. There is an easiest way to connect to this. And if you scroll down under this, all the way down, there is a thing called serial console. So if we click on that, it will give us the same access as if it was SSH, I believe. Now, uh, it's going to ask us for our password so we can actually have access to our console. But once we go in there, uh, it's just an easier way to accessing it. As soon as it comes up here, it's going to ask us for our password and we're going to be able to, you know, browse it. Uh, it's just that, you know, once you, the way, the only difference is that it's it's not a pop out the window you know and for me it actually works out for me to show you like this and uh, okay login I'm going to type in my login name and I'm going to type in my password I'm gonna hit enter and as soon as it thinks about it we will have access and there it is we have full access to this server so if we do for example ls a it's going to show us what's inside of these different uh, folders and we can make adjustments you know updated do all kinds of different things we can create more monitoring we can install different uh, get app um, system analysis monitoring things that we can do okay anyways this is how you can access the linux server and just kind of you know go through it and and, and look at different things but right now we're just going to show you some, uh, let's see here, CDVR, VAR, LS. And it just kind of to show you that you can go in and browse. If you want to, you know, run something, you you know, you can just type in sudo, you know, which is super user, invoking a super user. And then, I don't know, you can just type in sudo, I don't know, VI, and this is going to create a new uh document this is just you know regular document that you can create and you know in you know install on there and whatnot and um yeah so there you go guys this is the intro to microsoft azure virtual machines i hope you like this video let me know what you think let me know if you like my style of teaching I, it, this is it's really hard to teach without being super technical so i'm really uh, trying to trying my best not to sound too confusing because if I was to go into Linux here and, and try to do all kinds of different things it would be way too much in just one video for a person to absorb not I'm not saying everybody because you know a lot of people are knowledgeable and that they would like to see this type of stuff but I do want to teach everybody you know at least give them some kind of confidence to get in, kind of get into this type of stuff to start with and once they get into it then they can you know learn more about it on their own or you know watching or, or learning or you know from other people and this and that but the best way to 
learn is to actually get in there and, and try you know do things uh, on it all right um, in the next video uh, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss it I will talk about uh, storage containers we're going to use some scripting to add the storage containers we're going to create some file shares and how to go in there and add them to different machines and it's it's pretty cool stuff guys all right thanks so much for watching have a good day bye bye hello my friends my name is Irvin also known as Kobo man today we're talking about Hyper-V what is Hyper-V let me show you what Hyper-V is Hyper-V Manager is a Microsoft version of a virtual uh, virtual machine creating software. <laughs> and that sounds kind of funny. But basically, it allows you to create a virtual machine of any operating system, test it out, and, uh, you know, basically for experimenting. But you can also use it as something that runs on your machine. And that, that way you can create multiple virtual machines, this and that. Anyways, we're going to test that out. I don't have a whole lot of experience with this, so I'm going to be learning with you guys as well. I normally use Oracle VM, uh, a virtual machine, virtual box for this type of stuff. So I'll be learning as well. This does not come installed uh, by default on Windows uh, machines. So you have to basically go inside of your add remove programs. Let's see, where is that? Programs and features. And then you have to turn Windows features on and off. So once you go in here, you have to find Hyper-V, you know, select it, make sure it's selected, click OK. And then it's going to update it and you know restart your machine and then you will have hyper-v installed all right let's have a look at hyper-v what we have here and uh it looks like there are options here to quick create which i'm assuming allows you to create a quick virtual machine which is cool but let's look at the hyper-v settings here so we what we have once we select this here the first thing that we see is that it's asking you to specify location of virtual disk this is the default location for the virtual hard disk. And you can change this if you want, but I'm pretty happy with the settings here. It looks like it creates a you know, specific folder for it inside of documents, and I'm perfectly happy with that. Next thing down is the location of, or the installation of your actual virtual machine. And looks like the default folder is set to Windows Hyper-V. Again, I'm okay with that because it created a separate folder for that. So it's not gonna have you know, files all over the place, which is, pretty expected third thing down is physical gpus and looks like you can select different gpu for it which is pretty cool actually and uh, use this gpu with the remote fx okay that's cool so i'm just going to leave it at that of course if, if you have another gpu you can certainly do so so here's actually a pretty good uh pretty good thing here so if you have a gpu installed you can still just select this one which is the onboard embedded into the processor so you can just run it off of that instead of using your main gpu which is pretty cool numa spanning uh, i don't know what this is you can configure hyper-v to allow virtual machines to span non-uniform memory architecture oh okay that's what that is when the physical computer has numa modes this setting provides virtual machines with additional computing resources okay so that's what that does it allows you to run more virtual machines at the same time allow virtual machines to span okay well that's cool uh, I'm not 100% sure what that is. If somebody's, uh, who, if somebody's more familiar about this, please let me know in the comments below. I really would like to learn more about this. But it basically looks like it allows you to run, um, you know, more virtual machines at the same time, which is cool. Storage migration. Uh, you can specify how many storage migrations can be performed at the same time on this computer. So this basically allows simultaneous storage migrations are allowed. So two. Okay, well, that's fine. That's just self-explanatory. There's really nothing to talk about that. Enhanced session mode, mode policy. You can configure Hyper-V to allow enhanced session mode connections to virtual machines running on this server. So enhanced session mode allows redirect of local devices and resources from a computer running virtual machine. So basically what it does, it allows you to use all the peripherals, all the you know, all the extensions of all the software or of all the hardware that's also installed I should say on your computer so it's an extension of that basically if you want to use internet this allows you to do so basically we'll create a virtual and extension of your adapter for example here you know what i mean so that's that's what that allows enhanced session uh in sense enhanced session mode requires a supported guest operating system it may require additional configure anyways so that's what that does now, uh, the other option here is use of keyboard 
lets you basically use physical computer, use the virtual machine, type of keyboard that you want, mouse release key, enhanced session mode. And how do you want to configure virtual machine connections to operate with enhanced session mode is available in guest operating system. So this is the kind of what I talked about earlier. Okay, and the last thing here is just lets you to reset everything there. Okay, I'm just gonna leave that at default and I'm assuming there gonna be, there's going to be more stuff to do when it comes to setup. So let's go to quick cre cre create, quick create. I apologize, guys. It's one of those days where it's just like, I, I, may, I may have had too much coffee or not enough coffee, we'll see. So the first option that comes up is installing a virtual machine that basically does the MSIX packaging tool Allows you to update the existing Windows 32 application installers to the MSXI format. Simply launch MSI package tool from the start menu to get started. So this is used basically to update all the applications that you have packaged yourself. You know, if you want to make addition, if you want to make changes or additions to the software that you've packaged before, this is what that virtual machine does. Another option here is to install uh, Ubuntu 18.04. The other option is 19.04. And then we have Windows 10 dev environment. For the fun of it, let's go ahead and, and leave it with Windows 10. I'm gonna create a virtual machine. So what this is doing is actually automatically downloading it, which is pretty sweet on some other software, like for example, Oracle here, Oracle VM Virtual Box. You have to actually find the image that you want to use. That's a good thing. Um, well, okay, so this is a good thing, I suppose. This makes it easier. You don't have to go fetch it and this and that unless there's an option to, you know, allow more options here, which I kind of didn't catch there for a moment. But let me see. Does it allow me to pull up another one here? Yes, it does. So this allows you to install local installation source as well. well that's pretty cool. So when you click it, you can just have to select the uh, image that you want. So that's cool. For a second, I thought it didn't have that. So... I'm just going to wait for it to install Windows 10 uh, development environment. It's actually a really large size, which is uh, kind of surprising. So I'm going to uh, fast forward the uh, video to the point where it's done installing, and then we're going to test that out. Anyways, it's the same in Oracle VirtualBox, but Oracle VirtualBox is actually a bit more complicated than this, but it does allow you to do more compared to Hyper-V. But you know what? I digress. Let's see how well this performs after we install everything. So as this is completing, I want to talk about real quick uh, about the reason why you would want to do virtual machine. Main reason for me is to learn how to use other operating system. For example, we could have installed Ubuntu on there and just kind of play around with it. But you know, in this case, I'm just going to install Windows 10 just so because it's, it's a random thing I picked to be honest. But when it comes down to it, you really want to have enough RAM on your computer to run virtual machines. The reason for that being is, aside from testing new operating systems like Ubuntu or just different versions of Linux, if you want to run an actual server, you want to make sure you have enough RAM and CPU power allocated for that environment, for that virtual environment, right? See, this computer only has four gigs of RAM, so it'll be interesting to see how well that actually handles it. Um, I, I suspect that it might be okay just for a little bit, but I mean, you know, as you can see, this, this computer itself just to run, which is Windows 10, obviously, is using two and a half. So we'll see how well that runs. So if you want to run especially multiple virtual machines, you might want to add a lot more RAM. And I have a video on basically building a machine that, you know, does that specifically designed for virtual machines. I can go ahead and link at the, end, uh, at the end of this video so you guys can check it out. Okay, extracting disk from image archive took a bit because I probably selected installation to be done on an, uh, a magnetic hard drive. So let's see what happens here. Virtual machine created successfully. And we have two options here. It says connect and edit settings. I'm gonna click edit settings because I wanna see what's going on here. These are some of the settings here. And it looks like you can add certain hardware. You can add SCSI controllers, network adapters, and this and that now this what is this remote fx 3d video adapter nibbles wow so that's pretty cool you can add a gpu i guess um uh, that does the processing that's really cool that's something i would want to look into like if somebody wants to because you know i don't know if you guys heard of uh, pcs that you can set up 
it's like a central PC, but it has really has really powerful GPU. You can possibly set up virtual machines that allows multiple users to connect to it and use the resources off that and basically share that uh, CPU and GPU power through the virtual machine. That's really cool, actually. Fiber channel adapter. And let's see what else. Firmware. Default switch. Secure boot enabled. Okay, that's cool. Memory allocated by default looks like two gigabytes. So we'll see how well that goes. And it looks like dynamic memory is available. Basically, it's virtual memory. Wow. Okay, okay. All right, that's cool. It assigned two virtual processors out of four that I have. So I'm okay with that. But looks like you can tweak any of these things. So if you wanted to add more RAM or, you know, less, you can do that. They can adjust the amount of CPUs used. Network adapter. It uses a default switch, a virtual switch. Basically, it's just going to route it through my uh, network adapter down here, which is normal. And then we get some management down here. Checkpoints. This is something that, uh, let's see here. By the way, I changed the path for the image itself because I didn't have enough room on C. So if you remember that earlier, I actually changed it to uh, to my D drive. Anyways, that's pretty cool so far. It doesn't seem like anything complicated. Looks like everything is already set up properly. So let's see what happens. Okay, the virtual machine is turned off. Okay, let's start it. So let's see here. I'm going to make this bigger here, hopefully. Let's see, how do I do that? Windows 10 environment failed. The virtual machine Windows 10 right, could not be set because a hypervisor is not running. What is hypervisor? Huh. So far it was great and then suddenly it's not running. So whenever 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 you get an error like that it says hypervisor is not running for example or something is not running that means that there is usually a service that's not running in the background. So we're going to check that here right now. All right, let's open up our task manager and look at services. Hypervisor. Let's see if we can find hypervisor in here. Hypervisor. Hypervisor. H H H H H. Mm. I don't see it. I, I probably should have sorted by name, right? Okay. A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. That's how I know my alphabet. <laughs> I have to actually recall it. All right. H, V, host, which I'm assuming is the one that we need. Because, you know, it says H, V, and hypervisor. But I wanted to see more detail about it. It says it stopped there. I have, okay, here we go. What did I squeeze this through? There it is. I wanted to expand this here a little bit here. You can says it stopped here. Uh, local system network restriction. So we're going to right click and start it. By the way, you can change this to start up uh, automatically. Uh, this is done in the services menu. So if you open services, you can tell it to start automatically if you want this to run all the time. Here we go. Here's the Hyper-V host service. And right now it's set to manual. You can change that to start um, automatically. Anyways, I'm going to minimize that. Wow. It it crashed my computer. <laughs> it crashed my computer. Oh, there it is. There it is. Wow. There you go, guys. If you don't have enough RAM, this is not something you necessarily want to do. All right, let's try it again. I'm just going to continue to see if it'll start now. Hypervisor is not running. All right. Well, maybe that wasn't it. Let's trigger it here from the services. Start. Uh, 
a device, a device attached to the system is not functioning. That's interesting. Huh. Remote desktop, heartbeat service. I'm going to do a reboot of this computer, see if that helps. Uh, this might resolve our issue, so I'm just going to go do a reboot real quick, then I'm going to start this again. All right, let's try this again. Here we go. Uh, here we go. After reboot, we're going to launch our Hyper-V Hyper -V Manager. And... Uh, there's our Windows 10 environment that we installed earlier. We're going to try it again. Hopefully, the uh, Hyper-V, everything that it needs to run is running. Connect. I'm going to start it. Okay, it's trying to start. Oh, error again. Hypervisor is not running. All right, let's try it again. Services. I feel like I really shouldn't have to do any of this. Maybe there are there are limitations, or. Uh, prerequisites to run it like not enough RAM it won't run or something like that but you can see it it stopped there again it stopped again it won't start start huh all right well let's go to services this is very interesting to uh, this is a good way to uh, learn to do some of the troubleshooting host service Device attached to the system is not functioning. Okay, let's see what that means. I don't know what it means because, as I've stated, I, uh, whatchamacallit, I uh, haven't used this publication before, so let's find out or together what that means. A device attached to the system is not functioning. Is not functioning. Let's see what happens. Here we go. <laughs> JackieChan.org talking about the same error. All right, let's go to this first one. So is this dude is getting the same error. I had an internet problem, was fortunate, and was fortunately able to fix it. All I need to do is remove Hyper-V using Control Panel, restart Windows, reinstall. All Hyper-V components of restart windows. I found that Hyper-V host service was already running. could not be even started manually before these changes. <sighs> See, this is something I shouldn't have to do. Like, really. This may fix it, but really, like, I've never used it, as you guys saw. This is the only... This is the only instance that I've installed on there. First time using it, and it does that. That's very, very, very disappointing. I kind of hate to see this coming to an end like so. But if, if this is the fix for it, to reinstall everything, then at this point, I don't really want to use it. You know what I mean? And I cannot... I mean, maybe it's just bad luck here, but I mean... If this is issue has been around since 2015 and it happens like so in 2019, then I mean, look, actually since 2013 and there's no clear cut like answer pointing me to what the problem is. So yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm just not gonna use it. You know, I'm just gonna use my good old good old until they fix this type of stuff 
Oracle Virtual Machine Box. If you want to see a video on this, I already have a couple of them. And I will link my most recent one to this if you guys want to check it out. All right, I'm sorry I couldn't demonstrate this properly, but it's not my fault. And I honestly don't want to reinstall all this again. It's just for the hell of it. Um, if somebody out, out there, if one of you guys know exactly what my problem is, I'll be more than glad to entertain the idea of doing everything together or doing everything over over again. So like if it's something silly that I, you know, that should have been like, you know, you don't have enough RAM or something like that, you know, or whatever. Uh, it would have told me that on the setup, like, wouldn't you think? So I, <laughs> I, I really wish I could have demonstrated this properly because some of the features that were in there looked really cool. And some of the, it, it, it was simple. It looked like it was simple to install. All right. If you like this video, please click that like button. Share it with your buddies. Ask them what they think that my, what my problem is here. You know, so... Um, yeah, if you have any questions, comments, want to say hi, please do so in the comments box below. Thank you guys. Have a good one. See you next time. Bye-bye. Hello. Welcome, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobu Man. Today's video is all about the virtual machines. I'm going to explain what the virtual machines are, how they function, how they're set up, and how you can install them to play around with different operating systems for yourself. In this case, we're going to use Microsoft's Hyper-V software that comes with Windows Operating System. It doesn't come installed by default, but you can install it as part of Microsoft Operating System. And I will show you how to do that. It's pretty simple. However, I believe it only comes with Microsoft Windows 10 Professional and or Enterprise. I don't think it comes with Home, but it will show you how to install it nonetheless. It's pretty simple, but it's also really fun, especially if you want to experiment with different operating system and like to learn about them. Really cool stuff. All right, guys, if you got one second, please click the like button. It only takes one second and it really makes a big difference for me, especially if you appreciate this type of content. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. First thing first, here is our computer that we're remoted in that we're going to use for our virtual machines. And uh, we got to install Hyper-V because in this video, we're going to talk about Hyper-V. We're going to uh, install this program, which will allow us to run these virtual machines. So that way we can play around with them. The way you install Hyper-V in Windows operating system is if you go to your apps and features, and then you go here into programs and features. This is the old school of add, remove, or uninstall programs that you will uh, normally see in like older operating systems like Windows 7. And what we are looking for is actually turn Windows features on or off. Remember how I said it's actually part of Windows operating system? This is exactly what I meant. So it's very simple. From here on, you have to make sure that Hyper-V right here is selected like so. And then once you click OK, it's going to download it, install it, and it's going to reboot your computer. The reason it's going to reboot your computer anytime you install a virtual uh, virtual machine software is because it has to use your hardware as an extension in order to work. So, for example, things like network adapters, uh, you know, CPU, RAM, a video card memory, and all that type of stuff. So, it has to do a quick reboot so that way it knows how to create an extension of those into those virtual machines because we're making a virtual PC and it has to have some kind of hardware associated with that to work. Okay, once you do that. We're going to open up Hyper-V. This is how it looks like for me right now, but this is how it's going to look like for you the first time you open. This is exactly how it's going to look like. There's not going to be anything installed on it or anything like that. Okay, so what you see here under the Hyper-V manager is name Koboman1. So what is this Koboman1? Well, that's my computer. That's my physical computer, and that's the name of my computer that I'm using right now. So you can tell also by where it says here that I am remotely desktop into a Kobuman 1 computer. And just to kind of show you one, one example, one other example here is that in Windows properties and computer properties, you can see that the computer name here is Kobuman 1. So what that is, if I click on it, it's my computer. This software is literally using my physical computer, my actual hardware as an extension to create these virtual machines. So 
again, once you install Hyper-V or even, for example, Oracle VirtualBox, which is also pretty good software, it's going to, again, reboot your computer because it's going to use your computer as an extension to run these virtual machines. So all these virtual machines are part of your physical machine. It's just they're creating these extensions to use in order to function as if it's its own thing, you know? And it is. Virtually speaking, it's its own thing. This is why you can have a server somewhere in a data center. For Imagine a rack server. I'm going to put a picture of it right now. This is kind of looks like these these servers are just on racks in big data centers somewhere in some building where AC is running really cold to keep him cool. And these servers can have many, many different virtual machines on them. And that's the whole point of creating a virtual machine is that, for example, you can have 10 different websites. You can have 10 different web servers, for example, running on a single server. And that's the great thing about virtual machines. If you have enough RAM, if you have enough processing power, you can run as many virtual machines as possible. So instead of just having one computer that's not using all of its resources, now you can have multiple virtual computers on that one computer or a server. So let me just kind of show you here just a brief example of what, kind of, what I kind of mean here. You can see that, that I have a CPU here and this CPU has eight processing threads, it says eight logical processors right here. And it's an i7, and this is why it has this. This is an older i7, but it's still a pretty good processor. But it has eight logical processors. On this eight logical, you can potentially run four different instances of virtual machines because you can literally split those into two for each. So two times four is eight. You can have four different virtual machines running off of this one single CPU as long as they're not super intensive. And of course, you got to have enough RAM. And you can see here that I have um, a total of 16 gigabytes of RAM. And then you can split that RAM amongst those servers, you know. In a real realistic scenario, since this is not a server computer, in this case, if I wanted to have really good, two really good virtual machines, I would just run two to three maybe, because you can see that the system itself is using up quite a bit of RAM just to kind of function, you know what I mean? And that's, you know, but if I added more RAM, I can, of course, even make that even greater. So that explains the hardware part of it, of how virtual machines are created on actual hardware. So it creates those mini copies of themselves, if you will, that are not as good, but they're good enough to do certain things. Again, it, you know, I used an example of a web servers, which is very typical to see if you if you uh, if you're familiar with the cloud cloud storage and cloud computing. This is that's all they are. They're all virtual machines running off of different servers and different hardware platforms. But when it comes to setup, is something we're going to talk about right now. All right. So when you initially start this, it's going to be blank here. There will be no virtual machines, but you can click create new. So we're going to click quick create new. Once this loads up, you can see that it actually offers you some, you know, typical stuff you can install on a virtual machine. This is just the kind of a thing that you can just literally click create virtual machine. It's going to create it and it's going to be these specific ones. It's what it's going to do is basically download these um, ISO images. Uh, you know, operating system images, and they're going to install them for you. And that's fine. If you want to try these and you don't want to really install anything else, you can certainly do that. But I want to show you that you can actually do it also by using your own image. So we're going to click local install source, and then we're going to specify different things. The first two we're going to install is Windows 10 and then Windows server 2019 so we're going to just kind of make sure that this is still checked here that what it says this virtual machine will run windows enable windows secure boot that's fine you can leave that like that and then we're going to click change installation source and now we're going to tell it to go to our desktop which is where our virtual machines are you can see right here we're going to select this one here so we're going to select that one so we're going to do windows 10 real quick and we're going to click create virtual machine so what this is doing is just kind of give you an option that says hey virtual machine already created you know it's already done but that was really quick 
it yeah sure enough it created a virtual machine virtual computer but we haven't installed anything yet it just created some basic settings and we can click connect and it's going to keep those basic settings for the hard drive for you know how much ram is being used you know everything else but we kind of want to learn more about this so we're going to click edit settings instead of connect we're going to click edit settings so we can see what's all in there what kind of can we make any changes well we certainly can here it is. This is our hardware, which says hardware. So if you click here on the firmware, it kind of gives you an idea of what is selected for our drive and for our network adapter. And that's kind of a kind of main things right now that we're looking at here. We can tell that we already selected the Windows ISO image, and that's fine. It's inserted in virtual DVD drive, and we can see that it created a new virtual machine hard drive. And we'll look at that as well. And it created also a network adapter, which is using a default switch, basically an extension of our network adapter that we're already using. Moving down, if we click on security, we can see that the secure boot is enabled. And then we can just kind of leave it here if you're using Microsoft Windows. That's fine. Uh, these are just some of the basics we're going to talk about. I don't want to talk about super in detail because this is just video on virtual machines. If we click on memory here, we can see that it specified two gigabytes of RAM, which is fine. That's that's what I would do with 16 gigabytes of RAM. Maybe add a little bit more depending on what I'm doing with the virtual machine. But for now, two gigabytes is fine. And then we're going to go click on the processors here. And we can see that we have number of virtual processors selected as four. We can adjust this to whatever we want. We can even do one if we really wanted to. But so so it installs faster on a computer. We're just going to leave it at three i'm going to leave it at three so that way i have at least uh you know uh, after i do two uh, virtual machines i'll have two processors running just for the base of my machine so that way i don't use all eight uh, processing threads so i'm going to change it to three and then let's see here i'm going to click apply here just in case you can you can change the resource percentages this and that and that's something advanced you can kind of fiddle with but i wanted to show you some main stuff if we click on the hard drive you can see that it's using a virtual scuzzy controller it really doesn't matter um, the virtual hard disk that it's using here there are different options of virtual hard disk you can create uh, if we click on edit we can create our own virtual disk and you know, it really doesn't matter. I really haven't found that there makes any difference when it comes to performance or not because it's all virtual anyways. So there might be certain situations where you might want to look into this, but this is not the video about that. And then the other thing we can look at, I mean, we can look at the DVD drive. I already said it's it's the DVD drive, virtual DVD drive that has Windows operating system inserted in it. And then we can look at the network adapter and it's using a default a switch, which, you know, you can disable it if you want but that's pretty much what it is to it. I don't want to talk about anything else because it's going to kind of take away from the point of this video. All right, so this is how your hardware looks like. We're set to install our virtual machine, and that's what we're going to do for our other machines that we, we create. All right, I'm going to click Connect. Where it says here the virtual machine is turned off, we can just click Start. So what it's now doing is basically post. You know, it's going to say, hey, do you want to <laughs> boot? Uh, see, I missed it. See, now it's trying to boot over PXE, over the network. But right, what it was doing here, actually, was trying to boot from the CD that we've inserted. So where is that? Where can we actually remove that? Because you don't want to keep this in there all the time once you install the computer. Otherwise, it's going to come up all the time. It's actually right here. So what I'm going to do is pause the machine. I clicked pause there. And I'm going to look at the DVD drive here. Well, I'm sorry. I'm going to turn it on. And we have to look at the DVD drive here, and then we can see here that we can eject that Windows ISO. So you want to do that after you install the operating, just like normally you would do. You don't want to boot from it all the time and try to install it. So uh, this is how we did it earlier. We can just simply click Insert Disk. Now we're going to go back to our desktop. We're going to specify our Windows again. And once we finish installing it, we're going to remove it. We're going to eject it, just like you would in a regular PC. So what I'm going to do here is actually reset the machine so that way we get a chance to actually hit any key here. I'm going to click reset and I'm going to hit any key and here it is. It's going to start our Hyper-V virtual PC and the virtual machine and here it is. Here's our Windows operating Windows operating system install. And from here, you know, you can just install operating system, click install. It's just like you would normally do with any time you install Windows 10. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, turn this off and uh, or switch our 
ISO. We're going to switch to a different ISO. We're going to eject this one, and then we're going to install, insert different disk, and we're going to select this one, which is the uh, Windows Server 2019. I'm going to reset it, and I'm going to hit any key and see how this one looks a little bit different. It's going to start our Server 2019 operating system install. And then again, you just got to go through the motion, install Windows Server 2019, and then you'll have a virtual PC running. And I already have that installed, and I'll show you how that's running. So this is why I'm going to cancel this. I'm going to select, I'm going to eject this one. I'm going to insert our Linux one. And here's a Linux Mint. I just picked a random one. So I got to be honest. I tried to install Linux Mint on there, and it didn't work because it's corrupted. My ISO is corrupted. You can see here that it's only 354 megabytes. I don't know why it showed up as completed or downloaded like that, but it's supposed to be around 2 gigabytes. I'm almost done um, downloading a slightly different version of, of uh, Mint, so we're going to try that in, um, in this situation here. I'm going to move it to desktop. Not that it really matters, but anyways, let's try this again. We're going to create a do a quick create, and uh, and this time we're going to click local installation source as well. And I'm going to uncheck this because it's not Windows. So I'm going to uncheck secure boot. I'm going to change installation source. I'm going to go back to our desktop, and we're going to select Linux Mint which is Mate version rather than Cinnamon. Either way, I just wanted to see, uh, I wanted to show you how, you how you can install this, how you can, you know, install, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Linux distribution on this, and just, you know, it's really good for learning. All right, let's go quick overview. My main thing to kind of check is to make sure I have at least two gigs of RAM, and then processors, I'm going to back change down back to three, uh, just to kind of, you know, keep it like that. And yeah, everything looks fine. So I'm going to click connect, and just to kind of show you here, this is what, what I would have done earlier. I'm going to eject this, go back here, just like I did with the previous one, insert disk, and then again, you know, check or, or select the Linux version. So now it's going to run just fine. We're going to launch this bad boy, and I'm going to start installing Linux. I'm going to hit enter here, and you can see that it's just going to install it as we are just kind of looking at it. And um, I wanted to show you the running virtual machines. I'm thinking, should I just kind of minimize this, let it, let it do its thing? Okay, let's try this one here. I'm going to run it just to show you a running virtual machine. This is either Windows 10 or Windows Server 2019. Either should work, connect. And it kind of asks, and let me log into this. If I can remember my password. But you can see it's just Windows operating system. And this is Windows Server 2019. Well, see, you can see this one is actually really responsive, which is good. And that uh, goes to show that you can run these type of machines and be pretty useful. Pretty, pretty fast. You see, whatever I'm clicking on, it's no problem whatsoever. I went full screen on this. Everything is responsive. Everything's fine. I don't know. Control panel. File explorer. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It works pretty good. And let me see if I can just do uh, open just Active Directory users and computers. There you go. It's snappy. It's working. And you can play around with it. When it comes to Linux stuff, you can just try different versions and see which one you can get going. Um, they're all going to be different. You know, obviously, some of them don't even have GUI at all. There's no desktop per se, or, ver you know, like a visual desktop. And, you know, there will be a lot of command line action going on. But this is virtual machines in the nutshell for people to kind of get introduced to virtual machines, and install their own and play around with. And there you go. I hope you like this video. Please share it with friends. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.
Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. This is a continuation of Microsoft Azure platform. We're going to be learning new things today. In the previous video, I've talked about on how to create different virtual machines on the Microsoft Azure platform, how to create them, how to configure them, and how to monitor them for different issues. Amongst other things that I've talked about in the video, it's really good idea to actually look at that and watch that first video in order to get a really good introduction of what Microsoft Azure is. As promised in that video, I'm going to continue with the second video that will be about storage accounts and we're going to create file shares inside of that storage accounts and then we're going to add those file shares into our virtual machines which are going to appear as shared drives. So if you do tech support, you're familiar with shared drives which is something that you would add to the users a computer in order for them to access it for storage. So again, I highly recommend that you watch the previous video as an introduction so that way you can follow along. Of course, I will have a pop-up link right here on the right hand side that you can simply follow and at the end of this video. All right, guys, that being said, please take one second to like my video. That really makes a huge difference for me. Thank you so much. I appreciate your support on this. All right, guys, let's get into it. And here we are in our home uh, page of Microsoft Azure. From here, we can click storage accounts, but another way to find storage account is to click on the little hamburger icon and just go down and select storage accounts. So let's go ahead and click storage accounts and we're going to create one. You already can see that I already have one and that's related to the fact that you gotta have one in order to store your virtual machines or anything else that you create that requires taking up space or storage, right? So of course, we're going to have to have, um, you know, a storage account already. But for this, we're going to create a special one just for file storage. So from here, we're going to click add, and then we're going to create one. And the reason we're creating one is related to billing mostly. So Microsoft wants to know you know, what are you using things for? Just like we created different resource groups for our virtual machines, Microsoft wants us to create a separate group for the storage accounts. So it's kind of related to billing, so that way they know what that is used for, so that way they can bill you for it. Kind of similar to what we had in our virtual machines, the first thing that comes up is to select our subscription. And again, subscription is basically the subscription that we're using for the Microsoft Azure platform, a way to bill you basically, just like you have, for example, Netflix subscription or anything else. So you tell it, okay, I want to use this one. In our case, it's already selected. And then here we're going to select a resource group. As I mentioned in the previous video, every time you create a resource group, which is what we've done in the previous video, you want to make sure that everything else that you want it to be connected to that, you want to make sure you select the same one. And in the previous video, we created a group called Azure Tutorial. So we're going to select that. And just to kind of quickly overview why we're doing this, when you make sure that you are selecting the same resource group, you also make sure at the same time that you're putting everything on the same network. So with this way, it's going to make sure that the, you know, the, uh, that the network connections between all those virtual machines and the storage is also working in the sense that they are on the same network. It's going to reduce the fact that you may need to configure different security settings, this and that. It kind of puts it in the same network. You will have connections to it, and that way you are good to go, especially when you create later on a sync uh, storage, which basically what it does, it creates a backup of the storage that you're uh, creating. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So you got to make sure that it is in the same resource group. And in our sense, we're kind of concerned about the same network so that there is connectivity. All right, we're good there. And now below, we can select a storage account name. We can type it in. We're just going to call, call it um, new storage. And it doesn't like the caps, so we're just going to use lower letters. New storage is already taken. We're going to call it new storage one. All right, we're going to we're going to name it something specific. I'm going to call it Azure Storage. Let's see if it likes that tutorial is already taken. All right. 
well, let's just leave it that Azure Storage Toot. We're going to leave it at that. So, uh, yeah, it's very picky, and uh, which is pretty common. So that's good. So the next thing we're looking at is performance. It kind of depends on what you're looking at. If you want the standard performance, you can leave it at that. If you want the premium, you can certainly select that as well, depending on your business needs. But we're just going to keep it standard for the purpose of the tutorial. And that's going to be fine. And then we can click next here so you can see the networking. But if you just leave it at default, it should work fine. It says here, public endpoint, all networks. All networks, meaning that all the network that you've created, um, you can leave it at that. And then if we click next advanced, you got different things that you can adjust. But as I've mentioned in my previous videos, I like to keep things simple so that way it's easier to follow. So we're just going to cl simply click review and create. All right, now it just says it that deployment is complete. We can certainly click on go to resources and go to it right away. But what I want to do actually real quick is make sure that at least one of my one of my virtual machines is turned on so that we after we configure our file share, we can go inside of it and use PowerShell to add that um, add access to the share that we create. So I'm going to click on the you know the little hamburger icon. I'm going to go down to my virtual machines and I'm going to make sure that at least one of them is running and looks like my Windows Server 2009 is uh, 2019 is running, which is good. We're going to access that in a little bit here. All right, I'm going to go home here. And as you noticed in our home page, it gives you access to the most recent things that you've worked on. And here is our Azure storage uh, tutorial account. We're going to click on that. So from here, we're going to click on file shares. I'm going to make it simple. I'm going to keep it simple. I'm not going to talk about anything else that that it isn't a topic of this video. If you have special requests, please let me know. So we're going to simply click on file shares because that's what we're creating. I'm going to click a little file share button here. And on the right hand side, we're going to, it's going to ask us for a name. So we're going to type in file share drive. And then right below it, it's super simple. I really like this. It gives you the ability to add the quota. So the size of the file share. So we're just going to make it 10 gigabytes. All right. We're going to go down here. I'm going to click create. And something very cool happens once you create it. Uh, it it's very simple. It just kind of allocates you know, shared space. It's going to be super fast. And it's already done. So we're going to click on that and see what's inside of that. So all right, so with our file share drive selected, what we're going to do here is add a directory. So that way there's something in there. We're going to call it uh, user storage storage. I'm going to click OK. So it's going to create just a folder called user storage. So that way, once we go in there, we're going to be able to see it once we connect to it. Then we're going to click connect. We're going to pick our J drive here so that we know it comes up. Then we're going to click copy the clipboard. We're going to back to our Windows server. We have PowerShell open and we have File Explorer open. You can see that there is no shared drive name J inside of it. So we're going to paste our script in there. And this is going to add, once it connects to it, it's going to add our J drive into it. So just kind of bear with me here in a moment. Uh, the virtual machine is kind of running slow. I'm not sure what's going on, but it will add it there eventually. So once it's done, I will show you that it did it. All right. So you saw that it was uh, waiting for response, waiting for connection, and then verified the credentials. And then you can see that it added that uh, J file share drive into here. And then it came up in our file explorer right here. And it says, see, you can see that it says here 10 gigabytes. And if we go inside of it, we should be able to see that directory that we created. And from here, we can literally just put anything we want that we can create. I don't know. Let's create a document. Test. Doc. All right. And then once we get out of it, in order to do this administration of it, if we go inside of user directory, we can see that test document that it came up. So as one of the last things I kind of wanted to show you that is really cool about these storage accounts is that you can actually monitor them just like those virtual machines that I showed you before. So let's go on back to it. And then if you scroll down, we selected that Azure Storage Toot here. If you scroll down, you can 
you know monitor the uh, its usage so you can, just like with the virtual machines you can monitor different usage and access at specific times and periods all right so why am i teaching you this uh, well, obviously, so you can learn how to use it and how to administer Azure storage accounts. But there is another reason for implementing this type of shared drive is that, you know, you can simply take that script if you want people to connect to it. And um, you can create that script. You can pass it on to people manually or you can create the script and set it up in Active Directory for a, pers for a certain group of people um, that work. For example, let's say you're in a business environment, there are five different groups. So let's say there is collections department, let's say there is accounting department, let's say there is a, uh, I don't know, some kind of a tech department, and they all are going to be in different groups in Active Directory. Well, you can set up a script, what they call a post logon script, that will add these type of shared drives to them automatically upon login. So you can use this script, you can implement it within Active Directory to run it for that specific group or even specific user if you want. But let's stick to the group. So let's say you want all you know, collections departments to have access to the specific storage that you've just created. So the way you would add it into Active Directory, you would set up the script. It's very simple. And um, every time they log in, it's going to run that script and make sure that they have that drive added. I mean, you can certainly you can specify it in different ways. You don't have to use this specific script, but this is an option, and um, it would just happen. They would get this storage attached. They don't have to worry about trying to add it, the network drive or the share drive themselves. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. Uh, again, if you want to check out my intro, I highly recommend that. Thank you so much for watching. Please take a moment to like, share and leave any comments that you may have. Thank you for watching, and you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Welcome, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to look a real-world scenario in which you may come across in tech support. In this situation, we cannot access a remote computer so we can make changes to it or fix something on it. So what happens is we, for example, try to backdoor into it to make some changes. We were simply you know for example type in uh, backslash backslash name of the computer that we're trying to access and then we would try to hit enter and the error would be well you don't have administrator privileges so you can't do anything with that or we are trying to remote desktop into it and it would be the same thing we would type in the name of the computer hit enter and it would say well oh, you don't have administrator privileges you can't access so what seems to be the problem well, here's the thing. As tech support, you probably belong to a group group uh, policy on the domain that has administrator privileges that's automatically applied to all the computers that belong to that domain. So in this case, what happened was is the chances are that that group policy hasn't applied to that computer locally. So let's say the name of your group on the domain Let's just open sticky notes real quick so we can have a reference. Let's say the name of your group is IT support. You and everybody else that belongs to that group, you and everybody that belongs to this IT support group on that domain has admin access. So at this point, in order to quickly resolve this issue, instead of going through, you know, reimaging the computer, this and that, or trying to force any of these things, we can just simply add IT support group that you belong to with administrator privileges. We can add it to this computer at local level. And if you appreciate this type of content, instead of me playing an advertisement here, please take a second here and just click the like button or subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And this way I don't have to bug you with ads. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to have a local administrator password or a local administrator login so we can make these changes locally. Obviously, uh, you need local admin uh, privileges. So what we're going to do is going to access our system with using local administrator. Now, this is one of those things that 
your company will provide for you. Uh, you know, if you have a good company that you work for, chances are that every computer that they have will have a backup login, which will be a local admin, local admin, and will have a specific password for it. So you're going to have to find this out. You're going to have to look up the name of the computer that you're trying to troubleshoot. For example, you can see here that the name of this computer is called Tech Support. So you would access the database that has the passwords for the tech support, um, for, for the local admins on tech support, and then you're going to find that what that password is and what the login name for that is, and then you would log into that computer. In my case, I am logged in as administrator using this login. So in my case, it's YT login and it has administrator privileges and it's for this computer that's called tech support and I am good to go. Now I can make changes to the group policy that uh, has applied to this computer. All right, so let's get to it. Now, in order to do this, we're going to have to open up our local group policy. Now, this is the wrong thing to look at. A lot of people look this up and they're like, oh, well, how do I do this? Where is this at? This is the wrong thing. This is local group policy editor for the components of the window or anything that runs on this computer. So what this basically does, you would go in and, for example, allow or disallow a component of the windows or software to run. For example, it would say allow, you know, or, you know, or deny um, whatever is trying to do, okay? And this is not it. What we want is actually called local users and groups. So in order to get that, we can type in lusrmgr.msc in our run command and we hit OK and it's going to open up our local users and groups. Here's where we are going to apply our changes so that we can go about our business and get to fixing this computer. Now, there are roundabout ways to get this. You can get to this through the computer management as well. If you go to control panel, click administrative tools and then select computer management, you can see that Local users and groups are here as well, which is the same thing as the window that we opened previously, like so. So it's the exact same thing. You can see users and groups here. It's the exact same thing as what we have on this other side. So that's one way to go about it. Now, you can apply this um, IT support group by selecting groups here and this in this left hand side so make sure you select groups not users users are just local accounts groups is what we want so we're applying a group policy to this computer and let me just expand this here so it's easier to see a little bit easier to understand because i really want to highlight the part that we're going to make changes to all right so what we're going to do is add administrators group policy to it. So obviously we're going to select administrators and you can see here, if you read it, it says administrators have complete and unrestricted access to computer slash domain. Get it. So IT support group belongs to a domain. Now we're going to add IT support to the administrators of this computer that is locally. And we're going to now do that and once we do that all the administrators all the people that belong to this IT support group will have administrator privileges on this PC at that time so the way you do that is simply select add and we're going to type in IT support and then we're going to click OK and in this case it's not doing anything because I, it's not it's just a fictional uh, you know uh, group policy so what happened is we would add it and then suddenly you would see IT support, a domain group policy applied to this and you would simply click OK and possibly reboot the computer, but it should take uh, effect immediately. At this point, the whole point of doing this is so that not only will you have administrative privileges on this computer, now you can make any changes to it you want remotely or this and that, but everybody else that belongs to that group. So all the people that work with you, now they don't have to go through this thing of getting local administrator login, the password, this and that. Now you can make all these changes and then everybody can just log in. And that's the quickest way of doing uh, doing this. Now, of course, if the local group, if the group policy hasn't been applied to this computer automatically for some reason, that there may be some other issue that you may want to look at it. However, this is a quick fix 
and you can just go about your business and then you know anything else i mean there might be multiple groups that need to be applied to this it just depends in, depending on the on the system uh of the business setup that you have where you work at it's just going to kind of vary uh you know from business to business anyways um if you like this type of information please don't forget to like subscribe leave any comments and I appreciate your support. Thank you so much, and you have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kubelman. In today's video, we're going to talk about a practical way of troubleshooting somebody's computer remotely without using remote desktop software. So there is not going to be any RDP action. There's not going to be any third-party software that we're going to use to resolve this issue at all. We're going to use things that are at our disposal that we can do to potentially fix the problem. So this will be really good for somebody who does help desk or desktop support or even tech support at, for example, a local office or a branch. And if you got one second, please click on the like button. I really appreciate it. I promise you this is going to be a great video and I always appreciate you guys doing that. Thank you. All right, here we go, guys. I've created a couple of tickets that we can work on. And the first one right here, it says, my program is not working. Now, keep in mind, again, we don't have access to remote desktop. We don't have any tools like Daimware or VNC or anything remote that we can use or any third-party remote software that we can use in order to help this user with their issue. So their issue is here, my program is not working. And uh, in the description, it says here, every time I click on a program icon, nothing help, nothing happens. Please help me. Thanks, Larry B. So here's the thing. Uh, first thing we got to do is actually ask Larry what his PC name is. Once he comes back with that information, we can start to work with that. So you may have to call him, you know, talk to him and say, hey, Larry, uh, what is your PC name so that way we can try to help you out but of course be more professional like you would call him and say hey this is for example for example this is Irvin I'm with end user support and I have your ticket about my program is not working I can help you but uh, can you please tell me what your PC name is so we're, we're, we're what we are going to do with that PC name is try to remotely access it However, first thing first thing first, we gotta assign this ticket to ourselves. So I'm going to assign it to myself. <laughs> I, although this is not a ticketing video, I want to make sure that that's happening. But so I'm going to actually reply here and also tell him, hello, this is Irvin with EUS end user support. Can you please tell me? what your PC name is. So, of course, I wanted to give you as detailed as possible how you'd work this. So this is why I kind of put this note in, which in reality, it should send them a, an email or a notification of some sort so he can respond to you with that information. Or again, you can just talk to him, call him, you know, get in contact with him to get this information. So that way you can take a look and see what's going on. Again, we don't have RDP, so there is no GUI that we can look at here. Uh, and uh, we're just going to use uh, PC name as that. So let's go to the PC, the, the user's PC, so we can find that out real quick. So here we are. This is the user's computer. So while they're on it, you can just instruct them how to get their PC name if they don't know how to. So we can say, Larry, can you please go to your search bar? And the reason I'm going about it in this way is because users are very familiar with the search bar because they always look at it. And you can just tell them, click inside the search bar and just type in system or PC or, or whatever you feel comfortable with because there are multiple locations where you can find the PC name. So here is just the system that comes up and then you can tell them, hey, where does it say system name? And here it is. It says Kobuman 1. So once he gives you that information, we're going to go back to our computer. So now we know that the PC name is, I'm adding an internal note, PC name is Kobuman 1. Now we're going to try to access it. Now, of course, while we talk to Larry here, we want to make sure that we know what which which uh, program is not working. So we're going to access that um, access his computer uh, using just over that network using using a file explorer over the network. So the way you do that is open a file explorer and just type in backspace 
or backslash backslash type in kobuman one and then another backslash and then we're going to access his c share drive which is should be enabled by default for your business it may not be but it really should be in, in a, a business type of environment it should let you in you may get a pop-up asking you to log in and that's fine to just use your credentials and if you have access that's great so once we're inside of C, right now we're connected to his PC over there. We can see that it's on the network connection right here. And then the name of his computer is Kobuman1. And we're inside of his C drive. We're looking at his C drive um, just using a file explorer. So he's using a program, right? He's using a program and we know it's not working. And then we're going to ask him which program is it, right? And then, of course, since we don't have remote desktop, we can't initiate the repair. Normally, you can just repair the program, and a lot of times that would fix it. You know, uninstall it, reinstall it, and whatnot. But if you don't have that option, or user doesn't, you know, have the admin privileges to do it either, and again, you don't have a remote desktop of any type of software, we're going to try to fix that by going to his local profile. Because in this case, if we go back here, it says nothing happens when he runs the program. So what do you suspect? Suspect? I suspect some kind of configuration issue or just corrupted data or a catch uh, inside of his local profile where the configuration resides. So we're going to go inside of users folder and we're going to look for his local profile. We're going to ask him what is your local profile name? And then he's going to tell you what his local profile name, which is going to be the same thing as his login. So we're going to pretend that his login is B-U-C-O. We're going to go inside of that. And typically, typically configuration data for any type of program that's run, there on, that's run under your local profile is going to be in app data folder. So we're going to click on app data. And then a lot of times it's either going to be in local or roaming. So let's have, let's go into local folder and see what happens so let's say he has problems with adobe we can simply uh, just to kind of clear the catch we can simply rename this folder into adobe old for example and as long as his program is not open it's going to let us rename it like that and this is okay uh, because once he launches adobe it's going to create a new version of the same folder and just to kind of show you what's inside, we're going to go inside of this and you can see that if you kind of browse through, you can see that it's either empty and a lot of times, uh, you know, I, I pick this randomly, but there will be some configuration data like config files and this and that. But since it's at the local profile level, it's not necessarily something that's part of the program uh as, as in program that it needs to function, it's something that's created for the local profile as the part of the configuration for that profile. And the same thing happens with anything else. For example, there's Google here. You know, if you go inside a Google here folder, uh, and if you go, you can see that it's a Chrome. And if you go inside of that, you can see there's user data. Again, this is what I talked about. And if you, for example, go to default, you can see that there is a cache data inside of it. And of course, you can find things like, uh, I don't know, their uh, favorites and stuff like that, which is, by the way, missing on this one, uh, but that's okay. So let's stay on track here. Since we messed with Adobe, I'm going to tell them, go ahead and Adobe, uh, try to open Adobe again. So let's go back to the user's computer. All right, so we're back at the user's computer. We don't need this window anymore. Actually, I'm just going to, yeah, let's close it. We're going to close it. And then we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm, so in this at this point, I'm telling them, okay, go ahead and open Adobe. So he's going to type in Adobe. And then we're going to click Adobe Reader. We can see that Adobe Reader works fine. And let's kind of go back to our computer so we can see again what's going on from our point of view. We are now back at, you know, our point of view as a technician. And we can see that the new folder was created for Adobe, like I stated. So that created new. And you can see that here that the date is 6-10-2020 at 1 p.m. And if you look at the time here, it's 1.01 p.m. So that means it created just like I said it would. And what that does, it basically resets that program. And a lot of times it actually resolves the issue. All right. Now, 
just in case you actually had to go in and change registry settings that's a not, that's something you can also do without having to have a remote desktop as long as you have the proper credentials to do so so on your computer on your own computer that you're using your work computer you're going to open up a registry editor and you have to run it as administrator so remember how computer name for this gentleman was Cobbleman one here and let's pretend that we have to go into registry and add some kind of a function some kind of key to make it work we can do that remotely as well so we're going to take Cobbleman one which is the name of his computer and we're going to connect to it over the network registry so we're going to connect to his registry on his computer over the network we're going to click network we're going to put in Cobbleman one we're going to check name to see if we can actually find it on the network and it usually takes a little bit it depends you know on, on the setup but you can see that it found it and it's located on this work group but a lot of times it would just be a domain name it says new server zero that's actually the name of my work group for my local computers at home but it will be kind of the same deal when it comes to domain it will be the main name first followed by the computer name so that means it found it when it's underlined like that it means it found it we can click OK and we are now directly connected into his registry so let's go ahead and kind of navigate see if we can find that Adobe we're going to expand H key local machine you know it's a local machine on his computer we, we are now connected to it we're going to expand H key local machine and guess next thing we're going to do we're going to use some logic here guys and we're going to just go to software we're going to expand software because we know adobe is software now there are a couple of different places that it might be depending on whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit software but you can see right away that adobe shows up here so if you expand that you can see that this is actually for premiere pro and after effects so that's not what we're actually worked on we actually worked on adobe uh, dc or adobe reader dc so if we scroll down and expand wow 6432 node which indicates that it's a 32-bit software uh, we can now look for adobe here and expand that and we can now see that there is adobe reader there right there and then if we expand that there's dc and inside of that we can you know whatever we need to make changes to we can now go inside of its uh, remote registry settings and make any changes this, that we want once we make these changes, we can immediately ask them to try, ask the user to try to see if the issue was resolved. Okay, now let's look at another example here and another example of a ticket. Of course, finish up noting your ticket. I'm going to add internal note here first. I'm going to say issue resolved by configuration. And then depending on the environment that you work in, you may have to specify what you exactly did. In which case we did, uh, um, I don't know, reset config folder data. We're going to save it. And then we're going to mark it resolved, completed. And that's that. That ticket, oops. I think it should be now gone out of our system and we're going to now concentrate on this second ticket all right let's click on this ticket this ticket is called I am missing internet shortcuts folder and then if you look in the descriptions we can see that it says internet folder is missing from my desktop so in this case there is a folder or there was a folder on their desktop that you know it was with deleted or just simply gone who knows maybe it was moved somewhere that happens sometimes too user would just accidentally you know for example they would like if you look at over here they would drag it somewhere and it would go god knows where you know so typically you would say hey can you check your recycle bin go inside of your recycle bin and check if it's in there you know this and that and yeah definitely do all of that stuff but if it's not there and you know it's just one of those things that you may have a copy of you know let's say you can't find it and then but you can find a copy of you can ask them hey does anybody else have a copy of it maybe i can copy it over because it's just internet shortcuts we can certainly do that again we're going to have to uh, get some information from them before we can proceed further but we're going to role play and then first thing of course we're going to do assign our ticket assign a ticket to ourselves and then we're going to reply to customer hello 
this is Irvin with US, or you can say tech support, doesn't matter. You know, let's, let's do tech support with tech support, or you know, you can say help desk, you know, whatever your situation might be. Can you please provide your PC name so that I can restore your folder? Thank you. Thanks, you. <laughs> Thanks, Erwin. Okay. So now user has been asked, or you can call them, you can talk to them. Again, we're going to go back to the user, and we, you know, we're going to get that PC name. And in this case, we're going to pretend that the same PC name is Kabuman. So we're going to keep doing that. The PC, let's do this, users. PC name is Kobolman1. All right. So kind of same thing. And I'll, I'll show you something else just in case this doesn't work. Uh, we can go back into his, uh, you know, desktop. And then we can just copy paste whatever it is that, that they need. So let's pretend that, uh, actually, let's go ahead and just create a quick folder called inter net shortcuts or f and now we're just going to copy pasta onto his desktop okay now let's go to his computer now we're at his computer and we can say hey can you please check to see if the internet shortcuts is back and sure enough there it is but what if for some reason just using a pc name doesn't work some, there might be an issue with dns so just type in in kobolman1 and you know go inside of that you know shared drive or shared network connection i should say what if that doesn't work then we're going to have to get an ip address and see how that goes so you can ask them too hey what is your ip address and if they're like uh, i don't know uh, you can just ask them okay well can you go command line this and that but that's too complicated so let's go back <laughs> and ask them to give us the ip address without any confusion but but let's see what else we can do you know before we do that let's let's see what else we can do without actually confusing things and confusing the user because we don't we don't want to do that we just want to find that out on our own all right let's go back to our own computer all right so let's say this this wasn't successful and this didn't work and for some reason we can't access it using you know Kobolman one like so Let's say that doesn't work. Let's say we're not able, we get an error, or it just doesn't, you know, it just says not found. Then we're going to find the, in, uh, their IP address and see if that works. So, of course, the first thing we can do is open our command line and do a quick ping. We're going to do a quick pingage. You're going to type in ping kobolman1. And here's our result. And guess what it is? It's an IP version 6. <laughs> it's an IP version 6. I, uh, if we do this, it's not going to work. Nothing's going to happen because this uh, systems are not set up to, you know, what I call backdooring into a computer. Some people may disagree, but this is what I call backdooring into a computer. You can just type in, and usually instead of just a, you know, PC name, you just type in the IP address, and same deal. Let's see if we can get that C share. Yeah, it's not going to work. So now, we need to actually find what the IP version or translated or I guess translated in, in a way, but what we're actually looking for is an equivalent IP version four of this IP version six uh, IP address. So this is IP version six that we're looking at here, but we wanna know what the standard is, what the standard IP version four is. So let's go back to the user's computer. You can say, hello, sir, can you please tell me what your IP address is? And you can just tell them, uh, can you please go to the search bar and then type in, I don't know, there are a couple of ways of getting to it. I'm just going to tell them to type in network. And then first thing that comes up is network status. And I'm just going to tell them, uh, why don't you go ahead and click on change connection properties. And then if we scroll down, it gives you a bunch of different information. Now here's our IP version 6. Remember, this is our IP version 6 that we tried earlier. And 
it didn't work. But luckily, we do have equivalent IP version 4, which is right here, and that is 192.168.1.102. All right, let's go back to our computer. All right, now let's try that. So we're going to backslash backslash 192, and you can see that I accessed it before. So 192.168.1.102, and then C dollar sign. Enter, and there it is. Same thing uh, that we can do with, uh, what shall I call it? Same thing we can do with the registry. We can connect to using the IP address. But let's go ahead and take care of this user real quick. We're going to go and copy the Internet Shortcuts folder back into their desktop. And now that we are back at user's computer, now we can see that Internet Shortcut has appeared. Now let's go ahead and do the registry edit thing, reg edit. And then we're going to use that connect network registry. Let me just minimize this stuff real quick here with this so it's out of the way. 192.168.1.102. Okay. And again, it takes just a little bit to kind of figure out what's going on. And now it's actually asking me for login ID. So I'm going to use, typically you can use your domain login but since I'm not on a domain, I'm just going to use a local admin, uh, a local admin ID and password. And there it is. We're back at the same thing, except now we're accessing it using an IP address. So there you have it, guys. There are many, many different ways to deal with this. I, uh, these are just the typical ones that I go for when it comes to resolving issues like this real quick whenever I'm working tickets, whenever, you know, I work as a business system analyst, but I do work on tickets, especially nowadays now that we're working from home, so they need more assistance. So this is what I do mostly nowadays, uh, simply because different times, you know, different times, guys. So now I'm just going to finish our my ticket here, you know, made a copy of internet folder to desktop whatever you want to put in there as long as it's in detailed enough so that if somebody looks at it like your boss knows what you did and i'm going to resolve this and mark it complete all right that's that guys i hope you like this video please share it with friends let me know if you have any questions just want to say hi i like making these videos and again i appreciate you guys liking the videos they are um, th that what you do really, really motivates me so much, so much. All right. You guys stay safe, take care, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. As you can tell by the video title and the thumbnail, today I will be talking about how to install operating system on 100 computers. And this idea comes from my article that is titled Top 10 Hard Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. If you're interested in reading this, there is a link at the end of the video to this article. If you watched my previous videos, I went through the first three questions and kind of uh, went and explained what they are about and provided some examples, which I will certainly try to do as well in the number four, which is the question we are up to in my video series, if you will. So when it comes to the way I explain things, I usually do it in four part answer, which consists of first thing I would do, second thing I would do, third thing I would do, and then last thing that I would do. The reason for that is related to the fact that you might be receiving this type of question when you interview for a job. So you want your potential employer to know that you are able to properly perform this type of a process or being able to resolve this type of issue. And it tells them also that you, the way you think is the proper way to go about it and also tells them that you're very knowledgeable so uh, this is a good way to kind of practice that. 
All right, so let's get to it. Number four, what is the best way to install operating system on 100 computers manually? Meaning you don't have an option to boot over the network or any automated system available. So typically in a large business, everything is automated. If you were to receive 100 computers, you can just connect them to the network. You would get host names for them and you would assign them, you know, which operating system to install, which programs need to be installed as well and everything would just be done automatically. You just kind of sit back and relax and everything's done. This is why this is a difficult question. And this is how I would go about it. First, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on. And that will tie in a little bit later here. I'll explain that. Of course, if these are new computers and I have an option to image them before deploying, I would try to keep them in the same area for easy access. So since I don't have an option of automation, I would make sure that these computers are kind of gathered together in, in uh, preferably in, in the same room. I would connect them together, power them on and everything like that. So that way they are uh, there for easy access for me to, you know, schedule a lot or, or start to re-image process on a lot of them. That's the point of that. Second, I would acquire host names for each machine so they can be added to the domain. This is why I was saying, First, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on so that afterwards I would acquire host names for each machine so they could be added to the domain. And for this to happen properly, all the computers need to be connected to the network and turned on. So this can be assigned through Active Directory, also known as the main controller. So you would go inside of the Active Directory and you would create 100 computer names, also known as the host names, and then you would assign them accordingly to all of these computers that are being re-imaged, and uh, with, it, with them being connected to the network, makes it an easy process. Okay, third, because booting over the network does not work, I would create multiple OS installed medias to use, CD or USB. So this kind of goes back to my trying to keep them in the same area for easy access. And that's exactly why. So that I can use installed media on them. Um, afterwards, I would manually boot to inserted media and execute OS imaging process. You see how everything kind of ties, ties in. The way I would do things, it's kind of systematical and everything kind of goes back to itself this is a great way to tell your potential employer that you have a really good way of thinking on how to resolve these big issues. Because, you know, trying to install operating system on 100 computers and doing it in a an acceptable time frame, you got to know what you're doing and have a good plan. You know what I mean? So lastly, upon image, and image completion, I would ensure that each computer has host names attached and is added to the domain or a work group. Work group um, usually is used, you know, in a small type of business. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about that if you're interviewing at a big company. But, you know, you got to make sure that is added to the domain and host name attached, meaning that associated with each computer. In addition, I would install any software required per department templates or requests. And that kind of goes back to the part of automation that I mentioned earlier that normally happens is you select the type of software that you need and it would install it automatically. In this case, you would have to do it manually, install any software required per department templates or requests. So if somebody needs Microsoft Office professionally installed, this is what we would have to do manually for each computer. And, uh, you know, you would have to kind of get that information to make sure you don't spend too much time installing stuff um, uh, that's unnecessary stuff, you know what I mean? Because you don't necessarily have to install the same program on all of these computers. Because who knows? doesn't mean that all these computers are going to the same department, so they may have different templates that you would use and go by. All right, guys, I hope you find this video useful. Uh, unfortunately, in number four question here, I, there was really nothing for me to show inside the computer. But if you take a look at my previous three videos that I made, 
uh, in regards to in relation to this article that I wrote you can see that I provided some uh, computer examples um, so you guys can also learn from that there will be a link at the end of this video uh, there will be icons or uh, thumbnails at the end of this video as I am speaking right now I hope you guys like this video please share it with your buddies let me know what you think if you have any questions I'll gladly answer them and you have a wonderful day okay make sure you have a wonderful day because i really want you to have a wonderful day all right guys bye bye welcome my friends to another video my name is Irvin, also known as kobu man today's topic is about email formatting and is incredibly important to learn this when you're communicating issues to a third party that has access to a certain system that you do not. The reason that is important is because if you don't provide the correct information right away, the issue is just going to take longer to resolve. And this is production impacting and this looks bad. So what are some of the things that we need to include in our communication with other parties? We will go over here in a, in a second. But let me just tell you that I kind of got this idea from my previous video when I talked about ping command and a situation in which you may have to contact somebody else that's outside of your company or somebody that's within your company, but you don't have direct access to that system. And now you have to reach out to somebody else that you do not know. So if you want to check out that video, there will be a link right here. And also this idea for these videos. Uh, came from my website, which is CosmicNovo.com, and the article name is Top 20 Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. All right, guys, that is that that is all for the introduction of this video. Now let's get to the important part of this video, and that is communication. This is incredibly important to pull off perfectly the first time that you are communicating something to somebody, so that way the issue can give result really fast and then you look good not just you but you your group also and your manager and then you know this could potentially get you a raise anytime you do a good job and make sure that you're professional about it, it always gives you a chance to get a raise all right so let's have it in a situation where the website is down so let's pretend that my website is down cosmicnova.com and now people can't access it but they need to use it for everyday use let's just pretend that so what do you do you don't have access to cosmicnovo.com so now you have to contact the tech support or the webmaster at cosmicnovo.com so the first thing we need to find is obviously their email we need to have their contact and once we find that we come into a situation where we have to contact them so if you can't reach them by the phone or that you do reach them by the phone and suddenly they're like, okay, well, we need more information. Well, the best way to communicate that is via email in this format. So let's pretend that their email address is third party support contact at cosmicnovo.com, which is, by the way, fictional email address. It doesn't exist. So don't don't send the emails to that. <laughs> Anyways, let's pretend that this is the contact email. So the first, next thing we need to uh, add on there is the subject line, of course. However, make sure you CC your manager or any other team members that you work with. So that way know that they know that you are communicating this information to this company, to this support. And of course, that they know that you are working. This kind of tells them, okay, I'm going to add my manager at Kobuman, ah, Kobuman.com. So that way he knows that I'm also working on this. You know what I mean? You want to tell him that you're working. This is job security for you. You know what I mean? This is one of those things that people never really talk about, you know? We want job security. It's incredibly important too. Just as it's important to resolve this issue in a timely manner, so there's no production impact, I want to also make sure that my job is secure as well. Why not take credit for something that I'm doing? You know, very simple to understand. And the next thing is subject line, also incredibly important. The uh, reason you want a good subject line is so that it gets attention to the 
of the person or the team that you're contacting right away. So can you imagine people getting hundreds of emails a day and they see so many emails a day that all of them just kind of look the same. So they are like, oh, okay, this is another FYI email. This is another email that's just like everybody gets this and that. Well, we want a good subject line that catches their eyes. So we're going to say cosmicnovo.com is down. So now whenever this email pops up in their inbox, they're like, oh, that looks important. So they're going to grab that and they're going to be like, okay, this is something important. I need to fix this right away which is great. Simple enough. We want the subject line to be incredibly important and eye catching, eye catching, because this is a big issue. Anyways, if you've never contacted these people before, you want to have a good professional introduction. And regardless to whether I've contacted this person before or this group before, I always do, I always do this. I always, uh, have a professional introduction regardless because I don't know just because I talked to Bob at third party support contact just because I talked to Bob last time doesn't mean that Bob is going to work on this email maybe Joe is going to work on this email next time so I'm always going to have the same introduction and it's very simple I'm just gonna say hello and I'm gonna say my name is Irvin with PC support at and then you specify this location you know city state uh, country if you do tech support outside of country for somebody else you know that's fine too you just want to kind of specify who you are where you at and why you would want to contact them you know and then you can you know fill this in fill in the blank basically in this part of it so the next line we want is an important line as well we want to say we have received a report that CosmicNovo.com is either not working, down, or whatever the issue is for all users. So if this is extreme case scenario where the whole website is down. It's not just like part of the website. This The whole website is down, so we want to specify all users. Now let's go back to the we part. The reason you want to say we is because this implies that you work as part of a team and then more than one person, as in you, is aware of this issue. So yes, I said my name is Irvin with PC support at this location. So that's just me. I am working on this. That's all that means. However, we, as in team that I work for, have received a report. That means it makes it more urgent. So the reason I'm, the way I'm looking at it right now is from a psychological point of view to um, encourage urgency. And as you see here, this kind of a theme started from the top here from the subject line. This is incredibly important. You're a professional. However, there's a sense of urgency in a very professional manner and you're right to the point. There is no, you know, there's no beating around the bush, as they say. So this is incredibly important to have. And this is how I format my emails every time I contact somebody that is uh, that is a third party and they I, and I need their assistance. So let's go further down. What are some of the things we need before uh, we send this email. Well, we need a lot of information. This is what they typically ask. How many users? So now you don't type this in in the email, but this is what they would ask. So you, you wouldn't type this in, but you would say as an answer to this question, you would say all users. So you can kind of use this as a template. Again, make sure you don't have the actual question there. So now the question that they would ask is how many users and you say all users boom all users are affected by this issue okay and i do know that i've stated this earlier as well but we're just going down the line in case it just kind of going down the line of the things that they would normally ask about and they would say what is the link used 
So, you know, this is definitely important. Um, in this case is a website. So we would just type in cosmicnovo.com. Now you want, you can be specific. You can type in HTTP forward slash forward slash cosmicnovo.com. However, it's HTTPS. So this is another thing we need to provide as well. Now we're going to remove the question itself. Now we have is the link they use as in users they. Now, of course, if this is like some kind of a application or a software issue, you know, they may not la they may not ask for the link, you know, obviously, because it's not a website. If it's something else that they might ask, which, for example, which version of the software are you using, right? They can ask that. And then you can simply reply, we use version, for example, 7.5.9 of this software, right? So that's in case it's some kind of a software issue. But we're going to go back to our situational uh, thing where the website is down. So I'm going to remove this so it doesn't confuse you. So now we are back at this situation where just the website is down. But the other thing was just in case it was an app issue, application issue, if you will. So the next thing they might ask is, when did this issue start? This is what they would ask. And the reason they would ask this is so that they can look at the log files on their end. They can look at the log files and kind of help them narrow down what the issue is much quicker. So think about this. The website goes down, let's say, at 8 a.m. So this is what I'm going to type in. The issue was reported at 8 a.m. And then you might want to specify time zone. So I'm just going to put down Eastern time for an example. And then since we have that information, I'm going to remove the question of it as part of our template. And then we're going to just say it happened at 8 a.m. Eastern time. So now they can go in and look at the logs from 8 a.m. Eastern time and then see what happened. And it will help them resolve this issue much quicker when they have more information. Think about it. It's kind of similar to whenever you do, you know, just regular PC support, you know, you know, user reports that there's something wrong with their computer and they're very vague about it. Well, you need more information to resolve it. Just the same as the webmaster or the third party contact for this cosmicnovo.com will also need that information as well. So, these are some of the very basic things that are a must when it comes to reporting an issue like this. We have three different things that they can look at. We can say that everybody's affected. We can see that this is the link. We can tell them this is the link that they use and they can see, well, okay, well, that's a correct link, right? So it's not a, a, an issue where it's a, just a wrong link because that happens sometimes. They have to ask this type of stuff. And then we know that the issue was reported at 8 a.m. That's when the issue started. Now they can look at the log files. So what else can they ask? Well, they can ask a bunch of different things, but this might be something that in, comes up in a follow-up email. For example, can you provide example IP addresses where I'm sorry, off the PCs that use this website. So this is what they might say in a reply, you know, but we want to wait for them to actually ask this because if, if it's an issue where they can't, 
when it becomes more complicated, they can't figure out why it doesn't work because they they might might say simply, well, it works from our end, but it doesn't work from your end. So this could imply that there is some kind of a firewall issue that something happened on the firewall or a proxy for your business. And so for some reason, you can't reach CosmicNova.com. They may reply with this and say, can you provide example IP addresses of the PCs that use this website? So that way, from their end, they can see if they can reach these, these computers and then see if it's a firewall issue or not. They may also reply and say, can you provide user or users to test with via remote desktop so the reason they would want this is obviously so they can test the changes that they have or kind of have a look at this issue from a user point of view now you might want to be careful with this if it's a you know outside of company but if it's within the company this is perfectly fine but if it's outside of company then this would be a security breach so you don't want to you know let you know third party support contact name bob from cosmicnova.com access your company system i mean you know it's up to you but technically it's a security breach so but if it's a, if it's a, somebody that works within your company that supports this website then yeah that's perfectly fine they work for your company it should be perfectly fine you know but they might ask for that but typically in this situation they would resolve the issue on their end unless it's a firewall type of uh, situation in which case they may start to reach out to you know whoever the uh, you know whoever controls that network whoever has access to the domain controller whoever has access to the proxy because it could be just a proxy issue too we don't know it could be that one of the load balancers on the proxy is down and they need to fix it so that it can provide proper routing and proper access to the external websites for in this example cosmicnovo.com and then of course let me finish up our initial email you can just say thank you and then you can just sign off you know type in your name and then i don't know your signature might have more contact like you know your email at you know whatever it is and you know phone number for example i don't know you know zero 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 <laughs> and your title of course you know you guys know how to set you know set up your uh, signature and here i'm going to type in my signature business systems analyst and uh, <laughs> that's that's an example of of, of uh, my signature uh, that i use in my email of course with the real information, this is all fake information. But that's how you guys do it. You know, at this point, you just kind of wait for them to reply, to contact you, they might call you, they might reply, they might send you a message over the instant messenger, who knows, but this is an example of how you would format the email and the information that you might want to provide to the support for this type of business. I hope you find this video educational and helpful. I uh, will be making more videos like this. I do, you know, YouTube as like a more of a hobby than anything else. So I don't release videos too often. But when I do, um, you know, if you want to see the notification, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. But I do try to release at least four videos a month, at least one one a week whenever uh, i have free time as as you know here i work as business systems analyst on my main job but i do enjoy a lot to make these type of videos for you guys all right thank you so much for watching please share with friends have a good day bye bye 
Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about Reliability Monitor. It's one of those tools that comes with Windows 10 that people don't really talk about or mention, but it's actually a really cool monitor that kind of uh, filters everything out for you when it comes to system issues or system events. So it's similar to Event Viewer, except it's a little bit easier to follow, a little bit easier to navigate through. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. So let's go ahead and pull up Reliability Monitor. You can simply search for it and just type in Reliability Monitor and what comes up is View Reliability History. Alternative way to get into it is through Control Panel. If you go to the Control Panel, select Security Maintenance here and then expand maintenance and then from here we need to click on view reliability history we're going to click on that and now it expands our reliability monitor once more so what is again reliability monitor you can think of reliability monitor for example as a highly filtered version of event viewer so instead of giving you all the details for that one day on your computer um, it gives you kind of filtered version of it that's much easier to follow and it kind of mostly points out um, software updates and critical issues that may happen on your computer it lists successful and failed software and driver installations as well crashes apps and programs that stopped responding and other errors of course on a time-based scale so what does that mean? That means it shows you events for every viewer, every day, I'm sorry, just like event viewer, except it's a lot more sp simplified and it gives you this kind of a graph with dates aligned as this. You can see the only main thing that keep in mind is that reliability monitor, monitor only goes back as far as one month. So it only gives you one month of uh, event viewing when it comes to issues on your computer which could be good enough to kind of troubleshoot all the computer issues that are happening so you don't necessarily need to go back over a month ago to figure out what is going on right now with your computer on top of that uh, reliability monitor it can often provide important clues about the cause of sudden changes in system behavior as well and that can be determined by the events that happened and it can also kind of gives you an idea why for example my computer is crashing what happened with the application why did it stop you know this and that so again it's an event viewer in a sense except it's a lot more user friendly if you will or IT support friendly so with a reliability monitor let's go ahead and look at an example and here's a good one it says here that on October 5th 2019 something happened so if we just click on this bar we can see that it gives you the details as well but it also points out a critical event with this circle with a, a red circle with the X in it and then we have the uh, warning one uh, exclamation mark here which is in yellow and then we just we have regular event here which is in blue so let's look at the first critical event and it says windows was not properly shut down and you can see how it's easily laid out for you and it gives you the date here and it says you know it's october 5th at 8 a.m and then of course on the right hand side of it you can click on view technical details which will give you more information on it if you select that so you can imagine you know your let's say your computer is unstable and says you know your computer is shutting down just randomly windows was not properly shut down so what does that mean it means that either somebody pulled the plug the power went out or something caused the crash so let's go ahead and click on view technical details and expands it and it gives you a little bit more information but as far as the computer knows it just it just knows that windows was not properly shut down so this could mean literally that it lost power and then it also in description it says the previous system shut down on uh, let's see what is this six days ago was unexpected so it gives you an idea that hey this happened also five days ago so that can give you a clue of what might be happening so you can either ask the user hey do you remember it shutting down before or you can simply confirm what the user is saying hey this happened before and then you look and look at it you, you can say hey did this happen about five days ago and then you can see that there's a pattern going on here so very similar to event viewer and of course I have a video on event viewer if you want to check that out I'll toss a link on the right hand side here so let's look at the uh, exclamation uh, one that it's just a warning and it says here google update 
helper and it says unsuccessful application reconfiguration and it happened at on the same day at 808 um, a.m. So let's say somebody's complaining about Google Chrome, for example, because Google Chrome is the only product I have on this computer. And of course, it's going to have a Google update helper. And then I can see, well, all right, well, something's going on here. And then obviously it says here unsuccessful application reconfiguration. So I'm going to click on view technical details and it's going to give me a little bit more of the information. And again, it kind of uh, repeats what it said earlier here and, and on the top and then in the description it says Windows installer uh, reconfigured the product and it gives you the product name and that is Google Update Helper and it gives you product version product language manufacturer Google LLC and then it gives you reconfiguration success or error status so at this point we don't know what happened because if it says unsuccessful uh, application reconfiguration as far as we know it could be just permission issues but at least we have an error status, which is the error code 1638. So we can simply Google this and find out on the internet what the, what this error actually means. But again, it could be just simple permissions issue, you know. And if user is complaining about Google not working properly, or Google Chrome or this and that, this kind of gives you a clue, at least a starting point. So let's just look at some of the uh, uh, blue. Uh, events that happened and informational events are down here and then again you can see there is uh, another Google update help, uh, helper and then it says here successful application reconfiguration and it happened kind of exact same time uh, where the where it unsuccessfully did it so that means most likely that it did get its uh, permissions that it needed to do so and then it actually did it so we can kind of confirm here that that well that was successful and we can see that the error status is zero so right away we can see well that's not the problem just because it failed here it actually succeeded below here so we're done with the google issue here and then of course we just have a regular event and it says here cumulative update for uh, .NET framework for Windows 10 and it says successful Windows update. So generally speaking, informational events are just that. It gives you information that something usually just happened normally and that is also good to know so that way we can kind of uh, exclude those things as possible problems for this PC. So with this tool, we can just keep going and scrolling through all the events. You can see some of them are just blank. There is basically just means there's no issues on those days. And then we got, again, just a, you know, the blue event that happened and it's just normal. But well, the ones we want to kind of concentrate on here are the ones that are critical events. For example, this setup host.exe stopped responding on October 13th at 8 53 a.m. and then we can just keep going and kind of look at those issues and what see what happened and it kind of gives you a really good starting point when it comes to figuring out what is wrong with all of these computer issues that may be happening and sure i can go through all this stuff together with you and let's just go ahead and take a quick look this one looks a little bit different because it's a setup host.exe and it says again stop responding at 8 53 a.m and it gives you quite a bit more detail and this is going to vary from program to program of course but again, it gives you starting place to help you troubleshoot what the issue is. And for example, this one says stopped interacting with Windows and it was closed. To see uh, more information about the problem, um, check the problem history in the security maintenance control panel. So it gives you another starting point here. It also gives you application path in some cases. And you can see where this program is located. And this is a Windows component. And then let's look at the same thing similar and it says uh, for this uh, yellow exclamation mark right underneath it, it says notepad plus 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 unsuccessful application installation and uh, we can see more details of this one as well again this one happened on 8 51 a.m. and it says windows install install the product blah 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 and then installation success or error status so this is most likely a failed installation and then we can look up again what the error is to clarify that information well there you have it guys this is a very useful tool in my opinion if you don't want to look all the information um, in the event viewer if you find that confusing because i can see how event viewer could be 
uh, harder to navigate through, especially for new people to tech support. So, hey, if you get an issue from a user or a report, a user reports an issue, it says, hey, my computer is unstable. I don't know what's going on. Reliability monitor, monitor is a good place to start to give you a quick look to see what's going on with that PC. All right, I hope you like this video. Please share it with friends. If you have any questions, please let me know. Leave any likes and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Welcome, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. And today's video, as you can tell from the thumbnail and the description, it's about printers on how to set up a printer properly and the idea comes from my article that is about top 10 hard desktop support interview questions and answers that is located on cosmicnovo.com there will be a link at the end of this video if you'd like to read this for yourself this is a third video based off of this article first one being uh, remote desktop and DNS related. Second one being about missing files and desktop icons. Again, at the end of this video, there will be icons that you can select to watch either one of those. And if you're interested, I highly suggest that you do. Very interesting stuff. I go about uh, explaining these type of videos in a specific way where it's easy to follow for anybody. So today's printer, uh, today's printer, <laughs> today's question is related to installing a new printer at the office place that you work at. Now, before I go through it, let me just kind of explain my method of explaining this um, in a answer format. Um, I usually have four steps, and that is first, second, third, and last point or uh, explanation that I have for each uh, question that is presented to me, especially if this is a you know interview question, because I want the potential employer to understand that I am, you know, very knowledgeable when it comes to IT, and you guys can do the same. All right, so let's get to it. The question is: Your office received a new printer, and now it needs to be configured for everyday use by a specific department in your building. So. Keep that in mind, it's for a specific department only. How would you go about installing this printer in a direct IP printing setup? The direct IP printing setup also being something to remember. And the way I would start to explain this, I would say first, I would unpack the printer to make sure all parts and cables are there. Uh, then I would connect and plug in the printer into the power and network port available at designated location. Also, designated location here is very important to keep in mind. So obviously, um, for when it comes to this, you know, you get that giant box and, you know, these are large printers for businesses. You know, you unpack it and then you make sure everything's there, right? You make sure it has all parts and cables and then you put it together, plug it in, and you know plug it into printer into power network port at the designated location second i would make sure that this new printer has a static ip address assigned to it and that kind of goes back to our designated location for this designated location where we have placed our new printer we have to kind of take note of the port that is there for the network uh, cable that is connected to right we, we, we would know okay well this is the port number for this, you know, for this location. And then we would talk to our network guy or we would do it ourselves and make sure that we have a static IP address available and assigned to it. So let me show you what I mean. If you go to your network adapter properties and look at the those those settings there, you go to properties, right? And you would make sure that you have a static IP address available to you. So if you have a static IP address that you want to use for that port, uh, this can be assigned um, through the switch itself and that port would simply just use that and it would never change. And that's the whole point. It's static, 
we don't want it to change because we want users to connect to it every time. So when you go here into the, the Ethernet adapter properties and select Internet Protocol version 4, if your company is using uh, IP version 4, you will go in here and if you have to, you would specify the static IP address. So I'm just kind of showing it to you on the computer itself, but this is what you would do inside the printer. You would say use this you know, IP address if this is something you have to do. This is just me explaining to you what a static IP address is and why you would need it for a printer so that users can always connect to it and know where it's at. So that way they can install it on their computer afterwards. And I'll show you that as well. And also, I would acquire driver pa package for the specific model printer, unless the printer is set up to push the drivers automatically upon a request. So if printer for some reason doesn't come with driver package or software, obviously you would go to the manufacturer website, download all these drivers that you need. So let's say it's an HP, it's a HP printer, you would go to HP and specify model, get this information, and then the reason for that is, if needed, we would um, basically go to Active Directory and tell Active Directory to push this driver. But just kind of hold on to that thought, uh, because most new printers automatically push the drivers. So if it's a brand new computer, a brand new uh, printer, it would automatically push the driver to the user that is trying to install it. And I will go back to the Active Directory part that I've uh, that I've uh, that I spoke about. Third, Active Directory needs to know of the printer added. So this is where that comes in. It needs to be, it would know it needs to know that it's added and it added to the domain itself, right? Active Directory, you know, domain. So what happens is you would take a host name. You would create a host name for this printer you would assign a host name and then you would add it to the actor directory so that actor directory knows that there is a printer connected to this domain so that way it can control who can use this printer through gpo or a group policy and what this does is it only allows certain users of that department to use the printer so basically once you have a group of people, a group of users for a specific department, you can literally just add all of those people into the permissions to use that printer that's been added to Active Directory. So Active Directory is a simple, simple way to control who can, who can use the printer and who cannot. And that kind of goes back to our part uh, where it's kind of related to the driver package. If you have to specifically get the driver package, you can uh, set up Active Directory to push the driver as somebody tries to install it. So, uh, but again, new printers will just do this automatically on their own whenever somebody tries to add it. And that is done by the uh, static IP address or the host name. And this is why I talked about it here. If driver has to be pushed separately, this can be configured as well and in Active Directory. Lastly, I would notify the users of the new printer and its IP address and assist accordingly. So of course, you would have to help them because that's your job. Remember how we talked about a static IP address here? Well, your printer with the static IP address that you assigned it to would be used by users or you would do it for them let me just pull up my printers menu and here we would add our printer. So the way we, we would do it, we know with printers um, menu, we would simply just select add printer. So now it's searching for the printers, but usually you saw how that little, that popped up this link. It usually doesn't find it right away. So you have to specifically tell it. So with the users, when it comes to users, you would simply give them the IP address and say, hey, this is the IP address for this printer. Just add it in there and it's going to automatically install it for you. But a lot of times you would do it for them. So you just click this printer that I want isn't listed because it's not going to find it most of the time. And that's okay. And now we have this menu that you may be familiar with. Uh, and remember how we talked about that 
IP address? Well, here it is. We can add the printer using TCP IP address or host name. So we can either use the IP address or the host name. Usually what I do, I just, you know, go by the IP address because uh, it's, I don't know, it's just the way I prefer it, but it really doesn't matter. So you have select that and then we would select next and it brings us to this menu. Here we would, for example, just type in the, you know, IP address that we've assigned it and we would, in my case, I'm just going to, you know, come up with an IP address. Let's say it's 192.168.100.1. So let's just assume that that's where our printer is located and that's its IP address. And something to keep in mind when it comes to installing the drivers, if it's a newer printer, you'll be able to simply select the check mark here if not selected. By default, it is, I believe. And what that does is queries the printer. It pings the printer and says, hey, do you have a driver? And the printer says, yes, I do. And it then automatically installs it on your computer. So that's pretty awesome. Um, if you don't, you can later on specify the driver that you want to use. But this should be set up so it automatically does it. And then simply you will select next. And it's going to look for it. And then it's going to install it. Of course, I, I forget to mention the printer may have a port assigned to it as well. And uh, you would simply type that in after the IP address that I showed you. Okay, <laughs> let's see. Uh, lastly, I would notify the users, the new printers, and the IP address. I said that already. And that was the last part of this. If you have any questions in regards to this, I know this is a little bit complicated. And that's the whole point. The title of this article is Top 10 Hard desktop support interview questions and answers because you know you have to explain your steps on how to do this and I wanted to make these type of videos so you guys can kind of learn from this and to at least make it as easy to understand as possible whether you have experience or not it's good to have this type of knowledge or refresher for you know uh, my friends that are already IT professionals like me. All right, guys, please like this video. Share it with your buddies. I'm sure they will like it. And don't forget, I have those two other videos you can watch. There is a link in the description. And hey, if you want to check out my computer setup that I have, there's also a link in the description below. So if you want to check that out, that's cool too. All right, guys. I wish you best of luck and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin Olson with Kobelman. In today's video, we're reviewing an awesome brand, an adapter that allows you to back up your data easily. However, this adapter can also be used to recover data if you're doing tech support. So let's say you have a broken computer. Um, you can take that drive out of it slave it to the other computer and then you can recover data like so but it is designed specifically to be used as a one touch backup and i will go ahead and show you about that so right let's get to the unboxing this adapter supports ide 2.5 inches and 3.5 inches along with sata connection and i'll show you how it looks like so here's what it is in the box here's the little uh, adapter that comes with it you supposedly press the button once you install all the software and it does all the backup for you. But here's the main thing. This is three and a half inch IDE and I'll show you a hard drive that connects to it. And here is SATA connectors and here is two and a half inch if you happen to have one of those. And back here you just have on and off switch like so. And then of course you have the connectors for the power for the cable that goes to the USB and another power cable for SATA. And I'll show you what's inside as well. All right, so that's the adapter itself. Let's see what else is inside. The next thing we have is the cable that comes with it. And here is this part of it. This is just Molex cable that goes in the back of your hard drive. I will show you that as well again. And here is the USB cable. Matter of fact, we're going to connect that right away. 
as I am unpacking this, I'm just going to keep connecting it. And this is where that goes. You just have to make sure it's aligned properly. And then I'm going to push it in. So that's connected. And again, that goes to the USB. All right. I'm going to keep this here just for the moment. And I'm going to check out the last thing that's in here. I'm going to open that up so we can see what's going on with that. So this is just a regular, this is a US connection type. Uh, I'm assuming if you buy this from Europe, uh, you get a different type of adapter. And this is simply goes here. Just a power adapter similar to what you would do with a laptop or any other electronics that has an external adapter like so. So I'm going to push it in. Snaps in just like that. And then the last or a couple more things in the in the package itself. Here are the user manual instructions. The manual itself also talks about a software that you can use inside of it. And for that, there is this CD that came with it. So this is SATA hard drive. So you just align it and then you push it in like that. There it is, that's already connected. And then let's see, I do have an IDE. This is an older style of hard drive, but you know, this is why I say it might be good for tech support in case you're trying to recover some data or if you have like some kind of a shop that deals with data recovery. And then this goes here, IDE, two and a half. And I'm just gonna align the notch and I'm going to push it in. And here it is. It's connected like that. And again, we have this Molex connector, which we're going to connect to right there. Molex four pin connector pushed in. So that's all connected. Now all we gotta do is just connect it to our USB and then connect it to the power and then we're going to test it into the computer right now. So as you can see, I have it just sitting here on my desk and then I'm going to take this USB connector and I'm just going to match it with the blue connector on here which is USB 3.0 so that way we can get the maximum speed. After that, I'm going to pop my CD in that came with the box. I'm just going to put it in there and I'm going to install the drivers that came with it and then we'll see what happens. So here we are inside the computer. I'm going to open this PC. I'm going to see what shows up. You can see right away that both of those drives actually showed up and I'll show you what I mean. So it's the uh, gateway, the one's called Gateway F. This is a old hard drive from my old laptop. And then there is a local H. I believe those are the ones that are connected to that adapter. So right away without installing any adapters, it's plug and play, you can see that it works. Let me go ahead and I'm going to run over to the computer over there and uh, I'm going to unplug a USB so we can see exactly again which ones do show up right away. You can hear me probably talk. I'm going to walk away just for a second here. I'm going to unplug it and I'm going to plug it back in and see what happens when uh, the, I do that. And let's see here. I have plugged it back in and there it is. All right, cool. Let's see what's inside of it. So now we can, I can recover any of this data that's from this old drive. And uh, this is the old gateway. Again, we can just recover all the data that's on it. So that's really cool. As recovery device, you can certainly recover anything. Now, if you happen to have a BitLocker locked hard drive, you're going to need the key. It's not going to be unlocked. Say, for example, this local hard drive C has a BitLocker but it's unlocked. If you plug in the BitLocker one, it's going to be locked, but you need a recovery key. If you want to watch video on that, there I have made video for that. I'm going to make it show up right here if you want to click that on how to recover data from a BitLocker key. So, from our understand now is that if you want to do one touch backup with this thing, meaning that the way is just sitting there on the desk, uh, you can just press that middle button there that I showed you earlier and it just does automatic backup for you. For that, you actually need to install this software. So I'm going to go ahead and install it real quick so we can check it out. So this is going to install this uh, one-touch backup. See, it says OOTB. 
And all right, let's go ahead and uh, install everything on here, see how it looks like. I'm going to create a desktop icon. I'm going to launch it right away. Check system settings failed. Let me make sure the program run on administrator permissions. Uh, yeah, that actually makes sense. So it did open it up when I closed that. Let me see what's going on here. I'm going to close it. All right, so we have the software installed. I'm just going to drag the icon here. I'm going to double click it. And it's asking to run as administrator, which is fine. I'm going to do that. And it says check system failed. Make sure the run is administrator. Okay, it is running. Okay. They came up three times. It's a bit odd. Um, anyways, the program came up after you click on it three times. And it's asking for a device. So I believe this is the device you are creating a backup to. So in our case, I'm going to I'm going to back it up to this one. I'm going to use Gateway F as backup drive. Okay, I'm going to use backup as backup drive and I'm going to select F. Okay? And it says here that it's USB 3.0 and its backup is uninitialized. So we haven't started it yet. He knows what it is. And then I'm going to click on the next tab. It says configuration. And I'm going to set it. Let's see here. I'm going to reset that. I'm going to set it as original PC. Uh, okay. And I'm going to leave the backup file attributes as original files. And... So basically what it says here, and it took me a little bit to actually read through this because I tried this a little bit earlier uh, and uh, it was a bit confusing to me to what was going on. Anyways, you're, you're supposed to set it up to original PC and it is now and you can leave it as original file is up to you. And then it's telling you here that it's going to create backup onto that drive, which is F. So that's where the backup is going to go. From here, it's F. From there, it's F, and basically meaning that that though that's the uh, that's where the backup is going to go to. All right, now we're going to click on the third uh, thing here. It says OTB path. So this is kind of confusing here a little bit. It says OTB path. This is one touch backup path, but I wish it would kind of say uh, where what do you want to backup basically. So we, here we have to tell it that we want to back up certain things and we can select my desktop my uh, my documents i favorite which is typically what people do so you can just check all of these things and it's just going to create a backup of those of course you can also tell it okay i need you to back up certain things so if you go in a root to c here you can literally go to users and then backup entire local profiles of anybody who's there so right now i'm using yt login and that's my local profile and I'm going to click save on that because I wanted to create a backup of that when I press the button and I'm going to leave this here. I don't have to do this now because I've selected the entire profile, but I just want to see what happens. So I'm just going to click save options saved. All right. So now it should work. Now we can, uh, you know, click uh, right here in the, in the in the system tray. You can see we can click start backup and then it's going to click I'm going to click OK it says error when searching files please check the source directories uh, okay well let's see if it actually created a backup so if I go to F looks like there's a folder that's called AI OTB I'm going to go here and check the backup there's my desktop there's nothing there it kind of looks like it failed didn't it OTB path Let's uncheck this. Let's just leave it root of C users. Maybe it doesn't like that in copying entire profile. All right, let's do this. I'm just going to tell it to copy documents folder. How's that? So that way we can test to see if we can just back up one folder so because because basically we can just go in here and create a folder it's called backup and whatever we want to keep keep everything in there and then do backups of that later so all right let's go do this and again we're gonna we're gonna try the one touch button thing as well so i'm gonna click start backup start backup backup complete all right so that supposedly work let's have a look in here so we know it's inside of f 
we go inside backup and see I'm assuming users YT login and documents okay so that works that's good so why didn't it want to hmm maybe it didn't like let's let's do a little bit of troubleshooting here I'm not gonna spend too much time on this did it not like doing this Maybe you needed some other. Maybe that's where the error for the administrator privileges comes in. Start backup. Yeah. So for some reason, it doesn't realize that you've given it admin privileges to begin with, and it doesn't like copying these um, directly. But if you do go, because I know I am logged in under YT login right now. So let's see. What were those things that I was trying to copy? Documents, desktop, and favorites. Let's see if it's going to copy it now. I'm going to do it. Start backup. Backup complete. All right, let's see if it actually did it. Okay. So there's nothing in the desktop because these are system, uh, these are in public. Uh, f uh, these icons are all in public uh, folder, but there should be stuff in favorites and there it is so it works so you just have to fiddle a little bit with it the software is not perfect obviously there are issues with the software I mean there's no denying that I'm gonna go over there and uh, I'm gonna press that one touch backup button and see what happens on our computer so you can hear me talking and uh, walking away here I'm gonna press the one backup button so that's what happens when you click the one touch backup thing on your desktop. So let's say you have it next to you, you can click to backup and then you still have to click OK. So I wish it was just doing it automatically. Maybe there's a setting in there somewhere. Let's see, an option where it just does it. Confirm before backup. OK, so yeah, you can uncheck that and then, you know, and then you can just press the button, then it should just do it. All right, guys, if you're interested in this product, there's a link in the description. Um, I would use this as something that you can access, like if you have a hard, extra hard drive and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to mess around with open up your computer and uh, trying to install a new hard drive. If you're not familiar with computers, you can just plug into your USB and just take that hard drive, plug it in, and just keep it on your desktop as a backup or you know to access that hard drive or you can use the backup features that's fine some people like to do that some businesses do that as well and um, I would personally use it in tech support um, if you are trying to recover data off a computer it seems to work plug and play which is great you don't have to install any software you just plug it in you you know can you connect that SATA or IDE drive on it and you can recover data that's mainly what I would use it for but it is good for backup I'm not impressed with the software that's on here. There are some, some, are some issues here, and there are some, uh, uh, I've noticed a couple of, uh, you know, typos. See, my computer is missing R there. So, in my opinion, they should spend a little bit more time on this software and figure out what's wrong with that. And But it works. It does work. It just does need, it need a little bit of a fiddling with. So... If you like this video, please leave a like. I'd really appreciate your support. If you have any questions or comments, I'll be glad to answer them. And you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin Olson and this Man. In today's video, we have a refresh course for help desk desktop support or tech support in general. What I do is every couple of months, I would take the videos that I've made over that time and combine them into a single video that you can watch without having to go through and find these individual topics on your own. So let's see what we have. First thing, we have a real world scenario where the issue is no administrator access at local level. I will show you how to do that. I will also talk about BitLocker encryption and its use in a business environment. Third part of that is installing software through PowerShell. So it's an introduction to PowerShell and how to use it to install and uninstall different programs. It's really good to use for somebody who might be interested in that. Last part of the video talks about file association along with some java troubleshooting guys let me know if you like this type of stuff if you have any comments please leave them below and i'll answer them as well and if you got a moment please click the like button this really makes a huge difference for my channel i really appreciate that and i hope you enjoy this video thank you
And in today's video, we're going to look a real world scenario in which you may come across in tech support. In this situation, we cannot access a remote computer so we can make changes to it or fix something on it. So what happens is we, for example, try to backdoor into it to make some changes. We would simply, you know, for example, type in uh, backslash backslash name of the computer that we're trying to access. And then we would try to hit enter and the error would be, well, you don't have administrator privileges, so you can't do anything with that. Or we are trying to remote desktop into it and it would be the same thing. We would type in the name of the computer, hit enter, and it would say, well, you don't have administrator privileges, you can't access. So what seems to be the problem? Well, here's the thing. As tech support, you probably belong to a group, group, uh, policy on the domain that has administrator privileges that's automatically applied to all the computers that belong to that domain. So in this case, what happened was is the chances are that that group policy hasn't applied to that computer locally. So let's say the name of your group on the domain, let's just open sticky notes real quick so we can have a reference. Let's say the name of your group is IT support. You and everybody else that belongs to that group, you and everybody that belongs to this IT support group on that domain has admin access. So at this point, in order to quickly resolve this issue, instead of going through, you know, reimaging the computer, this and that, or trying to force any of these things, we can just simply add IT support group that you belong to with administrator privileges. We can add it to this computer at local level. And if you appreciate this type of content, instead of me playing an advertisement here, please take a second here and just click the like button or subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And this way I don't have to bug you with ads. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to have a local administrator password or a local administrator login so we can make these changes locally. Obviously, uh, you need local admin uh, privileges. So what we're going to do is going to access our system with using local administrator. Now, this is one of those things that your company will provide for you. Uh, you know, if you have a good company that you work for, chances are that every computer that they have will have a backup login, which will be a local admin, local admin and will have a specific password for it. So you're going to have to find this out. You're going to have to look up the name of the computer that you're trying to troubleshoot. For example, you can see here that the name of this computer is called tech support. So you would access the database that has the passwords for the tech support, um, for, for the local admins on tech support, and then you're going to find that what that password is and what the login name for that is, and then you would log into that computer. In my case, I am logged in as administrator using this login. So in my case, it's YT login and it has administrator privileges and it's for this computer that's called tech support and I am good to go. Now I can make changes to the group policy that uh, has applied to this computer. All right, so let's get to it. Now, in order to do this, we're going to have to open up our local group policy. Now, this is the wrong thing to look at. A lot of people look this up and they're like, oh, well, how do I do this? Where is this at? This is the wrong thing. This is local group policy editor for the components of the window or anything that runs on this computer. So what this basically does, you would go in and, for example, allow or disallow a component of the windows or software to run. For example, it would say allow, you know, or, you know, or deny um, whatever is trying to do. Okay. And this is not it. What we want is actually called local users and groups. So in order to get that, we can type in lusrmgr.msc in our run command and we hit OK and it's going to open up our local users and groups. Here's where we're going to apply our changes so that we can go about our business and get to fixing this computer. Now, there are roundabout ways to get this and you can get to this through the computer management as well. If you go to control panel, click administrative tools and then select computer management, you can see that local users and groups are here as well, which is the same thing as the window that we opened previously, like so. So it's the exact same thing. You can see users and groups here. 
it's the exact same thing as what we have on this other side. So that's one way to go about it. Now you can apply this um, IT support group by selecting groups here and this in this left hand side. So make sure you select groups, not users. Users are just local accounts. Groups is what we want. So we're applying a group policy to this computer. And let me just expand this here so it's easier to see, a little bit easier to understand because I really want to highlight the part that we're going to make changes to. All right. So what we're going to do is add administrators group policy to it. So obviously we're going to select administrators and you can see here, if you read it, it says administrators have complete and unrestricted access to computer slash domain. Get it. So IT support group belongs to a domain. Now we're going to add IT support to the administrators of this computer that is locally. And we're going to now do that. And once we do that, all the administrators, all the people that belong to this IT support group will have administrator privileges on this PC at that time. So the way you do that is simply select add and we're going to type in IT support and then we're going to click OK. And in this case, it's not doing anything because I, it's not, it's just a fictional, uh, you know, uh, group policy. So what happened is we would add it and then suddenly you would see IT support, a domain group policy applied to this and you simply click OK and possibly reboot the computer, but it should take uh, effect immediately. At this point, the whole point of doing this is so that not only will you have administrative privileges on this computer, now you can make any changes to it you want remotely or this and that, but everybody else that belongs to that group. So all the people that work with you, now they don't have to go through this thing of getting local administrator login, the password, this and that. Now you can make all these changes and then everybody can just log in. And that's the quickest way of doing uh, doing this. Now, of course, if the local group, if the group policy hasn't been applied to this computer automatically for some reason, that there may be some other issue that you may want to look at it. However, this is a quick fix and you can just go about your business and then, you know, anything else. I mean, there might be multiple groups that need to be applied to this. It just depends on, depending on the, on the system uh, of the business setup that you have where you work at. It's just going to kind of vary, uh, you know, from business to business. And in today's video, we're going to talk about BitLocker and its use in tech support or in a business environment, if you will. BitLocker is used for encrypting of your drive. So for example, let's say you have a computer at work, chances are it will be encrypted with some kind of software, typically would be the C drive, for example, here. So there are many types of encryption software. And for example, one of them is Sophos, but a lot of businesses are going towards a BitLocker because BitLocker is part of Windows operating system and it's free and it's convenient and it works well. BitLocker uses AES 256 encryption and that's another reason to use it because it's just about impossible to uh, decrypt it in basically access any data on it unless you have a key for it or direct access, hardware access to it. So in addition, what I'm going to do is actually talk about how it's implemented in a business environment and which kind of uh, operating systems can use BitLocker. So for BitLocker to work, you have to have Windows 10 Pro Enterprise or educational version of Windows operating system, meaning that if you have Windows Home operating system, you will not have the option to turn on BitLocker. You need to have at least Windows 10 Professional. So that won't work if you have Windows Home. Okay, I digress. So let's move on. So let's talk about the importance of having drive encryption. So what happens is if somebody steals this computer, they can literally take this C drive here, they can take it out of the computer, and they can plug it into their computer, and they're going to slave it to their computer, it's going to kind of look like this, it may show up as local disk D, for example, and they're going to try to access it. However, if it's encrypted, they won't be able to access it at all, it would just say, well, you need the key to unlock this drive. So there's a great security feature that comes with any type of drive encryption, but this is um, also made easy with a bit locker. So if they have access to your computer, let's say they steal it and you know, 
chances are that you have a password, right? Most of us have a password before they can log into their computer, so they can't get back past the password. So they take the drive out and they try to slave it inside of their computer. And if you don't have encryption, they can literally just go inside of C. They can go to your documents and look up anything that's inside and have full access to it. You can see there are some important stuff in here and then you don't want them to have any access to that, especially if you have passwords that are saved, for example, in a notepad. Let's say you have a notepad that you just keep around for a password. For example, let's say you see you have your Gmail password and then you have your login, chances are, you know, Gmail login, and then you may have it saved on a in a notepad and there's nothing wrong with that as long as you have drive encryption so keep that in mind if you are saving any passwords to your computer in a format as such which is completely normal you if you don't have drive encryption then you're just kind of asking for uh, data loss or somebody you know god forbid you know this is just the worst type of you know scenarios that somebody steals your hard drive or they can even access it um, over um, in other ways right so that being said, we definitely want to have our drive encrypted. In our case, why not do it? Because it's free. It's completely free with Windows operating system. So let's look at the implementation of this in a business environment. But before I proceed, I would just like to ask you to take a few seconds to click like on this video or subscribe. In this case, I don't have to play an advertisement for you. Instead of waiting 30 seconds, you can just spend five seconds here and click like or subscribe. I really appreciate it, guys. I really do. Thank you so much. So let me show you how BitLocker is enabled. If you just have a personal computer, you can simply right click any of the drives and then you can select turn on BitLocker. So what happens is when you click turn on BitLocker, the computer itself will test the drive to see if it's compatible with BitLocker and then it will tell you whether you can turn it on. Chances are that it will be because most drives are compatible with BitLocker encryption. So here we go. It gives you an option to save a recovery key. And again, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. A recovery key can be used to access your files and folders if you're having problems unlocking your PC. It's a good idea to have more than one and keep each in a safe place other than your PC. So this is incredibly important to save somewhere else that's not your PC. I personally, what I do is I either save it somewhere on like somewhere externally and you can, there are many options of doing this. For me personally, I have multiple copies of the bed locker and you know, you can, so here's an option. You can save it on the external USB if you really wanted to. You can save it on, uh, you can send it to your email. You can uh, just print it out if you really wanted to. Those are certainly options that you have here. And of course you have an option here that says save to your Microsoft account. I don't really do that because I may lose the password to my Microsoft account. You can save it to a file. That's definitely an option. You can print the recovery key as well. We will have a look here in a moment on how you would use the recovery key as well on an encrypted drive. However, let's touch on how this is used or implemented in a business environment. So the drive would be encrypted after the computer has been imaged or re-imaged. So after the, the system used in your business, it has finished installing the operating system anew, it would start to encrypt the drive with BitLocker. And at that point, whatever the system has initiated, I mean, this could be done possibly with a, you know, a, a batch script or some kind of a, a tool that initiates BitLocker and at the same time saves the file to a remote loco location. So it, that way you have access or a, a copy of that recovery key in case of a computer crash. So let's say user reports an issue where he says, or he or she says, my computer crashed. And you look at it and you're like, oh, wow, this is a hardware hardware problem, let's say a motherboard died or something like that. And the problem is that you can't just take that drive and plug it into another computer. It won't work because BitLocker knows that that drive belongs to another PC. So you only the only way to do the only thing you can do here is slave the drive. And let me just cancel this. Or no, let me just move this out of the way. You can slave it your drive and they would kind of show up like this, like local disk D. And then you would have an option. You would have a, like a lock key and I'll show you this. And it would ask you for recovery key. So 
that's the thing. It would have a copy of this key somewhere else remote, and this process would encrypt it, save it somewhere else. So in case of a crash, of a hardware failure, you would have this system or a tool. It really depends on the business setup environment. It could be just a, a file spreadsheet somewhere. We don't know. But I digress. It would have that key, and then you would look it up probably by using the host name or maybe the serial number of that computer. You would look up what the key is for that so that way you can recover user data. So let's go ahead and do it manually here so to see what happens. I'm going to save it to a file and I'm going to click here, save. And you will see a specific error. And uh, for, for this here, I'm just gonna leave the bedlock recovery key as it is. So that way I don't need to, I don't need to change it to anything. It's self-explanatory, I already know what it is. But I wanna show you what happens if I was just to click save here. And you can see, right away that the BitLocker wizard here says, you can't save to this PC, please choose uh, another location. So let's go ahead and try a desktop. We're gonna click save. Again, says this location can't be used. Your recovery can't be saved to an encrypted drive. Choose a different location. You see how everything kind of comes back to this to have a remote somewhere else recovery key located so that way you don't so that way you can recover the data, right? In case of a crash or anything like that. I mean, as far as I know, you may like, you may forget a password for your drive and then you can recover it with a recovery key. As long as you remember to keep a key somewhere safe that you know to look for it. Okay, so let's go ahead and save it to another drive. I'm gonna to try to see if I can save it to this other drive that is not encrypted. So I'm just going to leave it at D here uh, matter of fact, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it BitLocker Keys and I'm going to go inside of that and then I'm going to save it as so. So let's go back in here and make sure that we do have that BitLocker Key. Where's our thing? BitLocker Keys and here's our file. If we look inside of it, here are our keys. Here's the recovery key, here's the identifier for it, and that's you can see that that's reflected in the file name as well. And uh, here is our recovery key in case of a crash. So you can see that the recovery key in this case is just a combination of different uh, of uh, numbers uh, with dashes, and this is 256-bit encryption for your drive. Okay, now that we have the key saved, I can go ahead and, and click next. It gives you an option on how to encrypt it. You can see the encrypt disk usage, encrypt used disk space only, and it's faster. And that's set up for base brand new computer. So if it's a brand new install, this is what typically what happens. And anything else that's added to it, you save new files, programs, this and that, it's going to encrypt it automatically as it states here. And But if you have a computer that's been used for a long time, you might want to encrypt the entire drive, which is slower, but this is what happens. So, you know, chances are, if you remember that you know, once your computer is reimaged, just, you know, use uh, the fast one and that should be fine because everything else you add to it later on will be uh, encrypted as well. So it's going to click next, new encryption mode. Here's a choose a, which encryption mode to use. As you can see here, there's a two different types of mode. Uh, the newest version is installed or introduced in version 1511 of Windows 10. And if you're unsure, you can just leave it at compatible mode so that way it's backwards compatible for all other versions of Windows that you may be running. If you're not worried about it, you can just leave it in new encryption mode because I believe the newest version of operating system, I believe it's 19 something so we're well past that either way it's fine uh i'm just going to leave it in compatibility mode just in case and then i'm going to it's going to ask you are you ready to encrypt this drive encryption may take a while depending on the size of your drive he says you can keep working which is fine although your pc might run more slowly so it's asking you if you want to do a, a bit locker system check in this case all it is doing is just making sure that the hard drive itself is in good running condition, meaning that there are no errors with the drive itself. And you can certainly do that just to be sure. So let's go ahead and do that. And then again, don't forget, I will show you how it looks like uh, when we are trying to recover data on a, an, an encrypted BitLocker drive. So what you're looking at here is what happens if somebody tries to boot from the BitLocker hard drive. 
this is the error they get. Now you can see it's referring to a recovery key ID, and if you remember, it's the exact same one that we have for our hard drive. So I literally put it in another computer, try to boot it from that drive as well, and then now it's saying, well, you need the key to even, even attempt to even get to the login screen of this PC. And here's our reference number. We can compare it exactly to our key, and it's this here and then we have the identifier for it so now it's asking for this specifically all right now let's see what happens when we log in to our computer and see it as a slaved drive so here we are our encrypted drive is now slaved now we can see that it has a little lock key on it so let's double check it and see what happens here we go again it's asking for that bit locker recovery key all right let's give it a shot and see what happens with that i'm going to open up our recovery file here is our key i'm going to copy this entire key like so i'm going to try it again i'm going to paste that in there i'm going to hit unlock and there you have it guys now you can see the little lock is unlocked and now we can go inside of this make any changes and recover user data which is typically located in users and under their login profile and lastly going back to our computer where we have encrypted it originally we're going to have a look of some options that are there available for managing a bit locker if we right click the c drive and select manage bit locker we can see that we can once more back up your recovery key if you need a copy of it or you can also turn off bit locker if you choose so in today's video we're learning some of the basics of powershell specifically on how to install or execute application installation so what will what i will teach you here is how to use some basic commands that would lead you towards creating your own scripts that would allow you to install software through the PowerShell. So basically, once you go to the internet and you download something, it's going to be inside of downloads folder and whatever you decide to install, let's for example, take this example here, Media Creation Tool 1809, you would simply double click it and you get the prompts and you go through the prompts and then you install everything like that. Well, you can also execute this through the PowerShell. So there are a couple of ways of doing this which will help you get to the point where you create your own script to run PowerShell remote installs or even local installs, if you will, and that is to get to the same directory. So if we type in CD downloads, it's going to take us to that directory. The reason it got us to that directory because we're already partially there. But if we really wanted to navigate to this, it would be simple as this. We're going to type in users, name of the local profile that I'm using, which is YT login, and then I'm going to type in downloads it's going to get us to the same place so if we type in the ir we can see that that media creation tool is indeed there as well so this is one of those things you might want to double check every time you create or before you start to create your scripts <clears throat> by the way this is going to be a little bit more advanced so it's a little bit more advanced for uh, you know people who are more familiar with computer software but if you're new to computers I will try to go as slow as possible comparatively speaking here's the same directory in a GUI form so this is inside of our windows and we can see that it's exact same stuff that we see in here so let's go ahead and execute it from the PowerShell and the way to do that is to type in start process and then type in media creation tool dot exe See, now we get the same prompt to uh, go through our uh, prompts to, you know, basically install our software. However, if you want to make this to be a silent operation, you would do the same thing and then just do a switch or a command, which is forward slash S. This would execute it silently if it is an MSI package, typically. It won't work here because this is executable. And it's designed to literally go through the prompts like that. But if you do have MSI package, it will allow you to do so like so. And for example of an MSI package, in case you don't know, is for example, this one. This is an MSI installer for that, and that is .msi. Now here's another example of how to do it on from a remote uh, remote location in our case we might have something on a network level which is for me located here I went ahead and created a folder 
for this example on forward uh, backslash backslash kobuman one and that is the pc name or the server name that you might be using and then i'm going to type in folder name repo one so if we look inside of this one the ir we can see that we still have that media creation tool inside of that so the same way we can execute it from here as well so we can start type in the same way start process media creation tool 1809.exe since we're in the this directory already i can just hit enter and we're going to get that pop up again and it's installing so i went ahead and canceled that this is where you're getting all these errors now we can the same way we can start our script by typing in let's see here start dash process and then we're simply going to navigate to the network location let's see here and then it's going to be cobalman one for uh, folder name repo one and then we're going to do a backslash and then we're going to type in media creation tool 1809.exe and then we're going to hit enter and now we have that pop up again and again if you want to make this silent you're going to have to create your own msi package or something like that and basically design it so it is silent so meaning that nothing happens that you see visually it just kind of installs it so that's how you would do it uh, that's how you would start to create your script for a remote location using powershell now you can also use a package manager to download different applications or access different applications and execute them like so but you would have to have some kind of a uh, package manager that would allow you to do so so let's look at a repository that's online available right now that you can kind of look at as an example of that so there's one that was set up for testing by microsoft which we will navigate here in a moment let me just do a, a quick clear here so that we don't have any uh, confusion here and in order to find these packages we can type in find dash package and then we need to specify a provider which that means is you know dash provider this is basically indicates that we're going to now type in the provider name in our case the provider or our server name if you will is chocolatey i think that's how it's pronounced so we're going to hit enter here and see what happens so Here's just the run of all the things that are available as in packages on this repository or uh, server, if you will. So how do we get any of these packages downloaded to our computer? We just kind of have to know which one we want, but we can also kind of, if we specifically want to look for some specific, let's say, I don't know, uh, let's say notepad. So we can stop it from kind of going through all the things and see if there's anything available for notepad because you can see there are so many different things here and if there's something specific that you can there you're looking for you're going to have to you know kind of remember that or specifically search for so let's stop this process here and i'm going to leave it up just for the sake of reference i'm going to open up a new powershell and we're going to access the same repository but i'm going to tell it to look for a specific name and in our case we're going to use an example of namepad so we're going to type in again find dash package and then we're going to type in provider and then server chocolatey and i'm going to specify a command which is name that tells it i'm okay i want you to look for this specifically or anything or any derivative of that or anything like that i'm going to type in notepad and i'm going to use asterisk so i'm going to type in and everything that's uh, that has a notepad there's in inside of this uh, repository it's going to show up as so so now we can see all the things that are available as a package um, inside of this repository so yes we can now download these packages and uh, we're going we can use them in our package manager to push this type of different software so what can we do with this point well we can install one of these packages so let's go ahead and pick a, a random one let's Let's pick this one, Notepad++. We're going to do Control C on this, so we have it saved. And then again, we're going to uh, we use some commands. And this this case, instead of 
type in in find package, we're going to type in install package. Install package, we're going to uh, type in provider once more, and then we're going to type in chocolatey, and then we're going to specify name, and then we're going to say notepad++. So let's see what happens when we execute that. And now it's asking us whether we trust this source, which is for the right reasons. If you're going to look at this repository, make sure that you feel comfortable with installing this on your computer. And here it asks you, are you sure you want to install software from Chocolady? And I can say yes, yes to all, no, or no to all, suspend, or, or if you're unsure, you can type in help. So in my case, I'm just going to type in Y for yes, and I'm going to hit enter. And now it's installing this package. So let's see what happened. Did this actually install it? This is actually what happened. When we did that, it actually just downloaded that repository into our folder that is created on the root of C, and it's going to be in our libraries. And here is our Chocolady, uh, well, there's a core extension. There it is. Notepad++ is what we just got here. And there are a couple of different packages here that are installed. Wow, this one actually came with the installer. So that's cool. Now we can actually execute this installer if we really wanted to. And all right, I found that some of these uh, packages are not com incomplete that I've downloaded. For example, Visual Studio here. This one doesn't seem to have the actual the actual uh, executable in there. But this one actually installed. What is this one? This is part of the same one. Okay, well, we can execute this now. And all we got to do is just copy this path here. And then we can type in again, start process. And then we can specify that. And then we, we need to get the name of that installation. Let's do the uh, x64, the 64-bit version of that. And I'm going to paste that in there. And I'm going to hit enter. And here it is. Now, let's see if it works silently. It errored out because I clicked no, as you saw. I'm going to use the S switch. Let's see if this... Nope. So, yeah, it has to be an MSI package for it to install silently. And this one is just a simple executable. Anyways, guys, I hope you find this kind of interesting because it really is. You can um, do, we can set up scripts that will allow you to install remote uh, software packages into multiple computers, this and that. There are many, many ways of going about this. This is kind of just an introduction to PowerShell. And uh, there are many, many different tools that you can look at. And, uh, and not only can you install, you can also uninstall. And again, there are different ways of doing this. You can use the invoke command or you can just use install package command. You can use the start process command, many, many different ways. And this is the great thing about PowerShell. You can customize this to your needs or to your business needs of just the way, you've, the way it feels the best for your type of business that you'll work at. And in today's video, I want to talk about file association. This is a good to know for everybody, for everyday users like me and you, but also for people who do tech support. A lot of times you'll come across an application that requires specific software to run, but sometimes, and for some weird reason, it doesn't work because it doesn't know which application to use. This is usually, or this is typical with apps or applets that need to have a base software to run underneath uh, so that way it can do its thing. And that good example of that is Java applications or applets or even Java plugins. So, of course, we know what the basic file association is. If we look at this video file, we can see that it opens up using a Windows player. So if we right click it and go to properties, we can see that it opens with movies and TV, which is part of Windows, so it's a Windows uh, video player. But if you want to open this .mp4 file with something else, we can simply do this. Click Change, and for example, select the VLC media player. Click OK, select it, and now it's using Windows media player. So that's a quick file association. And 
you know, this is pretty easy. Anybody can do this and it's really quick and really simple. But sometimes in tech support, in a business environment, this breaks. Even if you have the correct software installed, and sometimes it may not prop run properly. So let me show you an example that I've kind of recreated to show you what happens. So here is a website. This is a NASA website. They have a bunch of Java uh, applets or you know, simple Java applets that you can run. And if we click save, it's going to download it to our folder. So if we click open folder, we can now see that this extension that is JNLP uh, there's nothing associated with it. If I double click on it, it's just not gonna know what to do because you know it doesn't doesn't even have Java installed on this computer. However, sometimes even if you do have Java installed on your computer, this file association will break. In our case, there is no Java installed on this computer. Um, yeah, new web browsers like for example Chrome here and uh, probably Edge as well. And I'm assuming, um, I, you know, I'm not 100% not sure on IE, but um, Chrome, uh, I know, uses uh, Java plugins to run. So it wouldn't even need that. I went ahead and downloaded Java. So we're going to install Java here. And you can see that the file association will change immediately. But I will show you nonetheless on how to do it manually and properly in case this breaks and it becomes just a white sheet of paper as it is right now. So simple way to, to resolve this is to make sure you have Java installed. So we're going to install Java. And uh, I'm not going to, OK, I'm just going to click okay and it's just going to install it real quick for you and then this is going to change hopefully into the correct java um, file association it should when it's done it should know that it's downloading now or that it's installing it should know that java is installed uh, this is typically what happens whenever you install a program it runs the file association at the end it changes these settings right away and it should work but again sometimes it breaks and then you have to do it manually and there is a different way of going about it instead of a quick way so all right let's see what happens i'm going to click close and we can see that it nothing happened so uh let me go ahead and refresh this to see nothing happened so if i double click it oh huh, it actually knows but it didn't tell us that so what it does now it's actually downloading this uh it downloaded that little applet from the nasa website and this is exactly what happens whenever you need that file association or otherwise you'll never get to this point where it's going to run that applet so now if we click run it's going to start our little application can't find the name of intel icd open <laughs> okay so it's not working for me because it doesn't have the open gl driver anyways so here's what happens it actually started using uh, OpenGL on uh, uh, Java without OpenGL and it's still it's working so that's good now we have this little globe and now we have file association um, that is working so let's go ahead and close this real quick and go through Windows and tell it what it needs to use in order to run properly so the way we're going to do this is going to right click on this little windows icon we're going to select apps and features up here and then we're going to select default apps here very important and then we're going to scroll down and we're going to select where it says choose default apps by file type so this may take a little bit to pull up because it's literally pulling up all the file types in the entire system so what you're going to see here uh, in a moment here is bunch of on the left hand side dot extensions so it's going to for example have all of these dot 3gp and everything else so what we're looking for is an extension that is called uh, let's see here dot jnlp i wanted to make sure you guys see that so it's dot jnlp you can also see it right here it says jnlp so we're going to look for that we're going to scroll down JNLP. All right, JNLP, JNLP, where is it? Where is it? There it is. So it already knows to use uh, Java Web Launcher. So to show you where that is, actually, in case it's not detected, um, Java Web Launcher. Uh, it's also known as Java Web Start. So if we go in the root of C, 
and then we look for program files x86, Java, JRE, and then uh, bin, and then we're going to look for Java web start, which should be Java WS. Uh -huh. I probably passed it. Java WS, Java WS. Java CPL, that's the Java control panel, which we will pull up as well because I wanted to show you the, there it is, Java WS, because I wanted to show you the actual applet that downloaded to your computer. So Java WS, and that's the extension that it needs. So in this case, uh, let's see here, file association for that is correct. So it's Java uh, Web Launcher, which is also known as Java Web Start here. You see it says Web Start Launcher, that's the same thing. So since we are here, I'm going to open up a Java control panel, which by the way is also the same thing as if you were to go to control panel of the Windows. So if we just type in control panel and open it up, and where is it? Java, there it is. Java 32-bit is the same thing as Java control panel, which is Java CPL. So here we are, and in this here, I'm going to show you what exactly downloaded to the Java applet. And this is always going to be on the first tab. You don't gotta you don't have to go anywhere else, but you do have to click here where it says temporary internet files, click view. And we can see now that it downloaded that Java applet right here, which is Whirlwind KML, and it's by NASA. And you can see that it type is application. So you will see this a lot when you do web, uh, web support. And again, if you're having issues with this, you can literally just delete it uh, right here, just be clicking the X. And uh, we're going to reinitiate it again because this applet, all it does here, it just calls for um, downloading off that from NASA website. See, it downloaded it again. And it's giving me the stupid error again, but that's not related to that. It's still going to run. Anyways, exit. Come on. Anyways, here it is working again. And that's how you do a file association in tech support and just on your computer, if that's what you're into. Uh, let's see. While I'm here in Java, I want to show you a couple other things to kind of look out for. Uh, the, one of the other typical things is security. Some websites will never get to that point where you get that applet to come up. So if you were to go to here and download it and this and that, uh, you, you may never come up to that point if you remember seeing that security pop-up or are you sure you want to run this type of thing. Uh, that sometimes you have to um, add that website as a trusted website and an exception list. And this is located in security. And this is typically done for uh, uh, web start applications. You can see here, web start applications. And if I click here, edit list, I can literally add the name of that website in there. And after that, it should start working. All right, let me just go to this website here real quick. And then we can copy this here. Cup, cup, <laughs> copy. And then we're going to put it in here. And now, the security prompts, if any, will not pop up and it will allow Java to run uh, automatically. Now let's double check again here. And this is another troubleshooting thing. Let's see where it's downloading from when I run this again. See, it's downloading actually from HTTPS worldwind.ca. So that's another way to troubleshoot this. So we can go in here and type in HTTPS worldwind. Dot CA. I think that's what it was, Whirlwind CA. So if you're having trouble running these type of applets, whirlwind.arc.nasa.gov. Okay, so um, I was wrong. It's the same thing, whirlwind.arc.nasa.gov. Okay, so yeah, because sometimes it does, you know, the applet itself may actually look uh, for a different location to download uh, the application itself um, locally, which... I have shown you that in Java control panel, and that was here under view, temporary internet files. All right, guys, I hope you find this useful. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below. Please leave a like. I really appreciate that. It really helps the channel move forward. Um, it, it helps get more views, to be honest. 
and I really appreciate you guys watching and your support. I, uh, I'm utterly grateful. So <laughs> thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're talking about top five reasons why your computer might be running slow. Number one, background processes. Number two, low RAM. Number three, computer updates. Number four, virus or malware attack. Number five, computer overheating. And as a bonus, I will talk about why a video game might be running slow. All right, let's look at number one reason, and that is background processes. So what is a background process? Well, it's self-explanatory. It's a process that runs in the background or a program, if you will, to make it a little bit easier to understand. So you can find these in your task manager. If you right click your toolbar in Windows, select task manager, you can see that there are a bunch of background processes running. That's because that's the first, very first tab here. You can see there are a bunch of things running in the background and some are idle with taking up some of the memory or RAM, I should say. And then there are some that are constantly running in the background like so. If you see that it's running like this, this is pretty normal, you know, I'd say around 5% of CPU usage max on idle is probably okay for most computers. However, if you see this go up, you know, really high, that means that a process in the background is taking up your CPU power. And every time you try to launch a new application or even just use the computer, your computer is going to run really slow. Let me show you an example of that. By the way, if you open this up in a Windows 10 for the first time, this is how it's going to look like. In order to see everything, you just have to click on more details. But I digress. Let's look at an example of a background process that could cause a lot of CPU usage. So I'm, I have a ImmuNet open, which is antivirus software. So I'm just going to click full scan. The reason I'm using this as a demonstration is because a lot of antivirus softwares, including this one, like to run background scans like this for viruses automatically. So they have a set schedule and it would show up kind of like this. Now it's using up 34% of your CPU power. And of course, they can, this can spike up quite a bit, even up to 99% or even 100% of CPU usage. Now this is you know normal for immune net to do as long as you're aware so you don't necessarily want to kill this um, service which would obviously speed up your computer so if you just go over here and then stop it right if you end task it's going to stop it and then of course you can speed up your computer like that but in this case you might want to you know stop and, and well you might want to actually stop and wait for it to finish right so if i stop scan and then i just close you can see that it cancel that and now it's going to go back down to normal speeds of the immune net it takes a few seconds here and that's what happens sometimes you would see memory usage be super super high that could be another reason uh, of a, another uh, example of a background process taking up too much power and now you can see that immune net is going down slowly here which is really normal so if you can't prevent a background service to run uh, that's probably related because it's scheduled or it's set up to start at a startup so you re you reboot your computer or even log out of your computer log back in it's going to start up and that is located in the a startup menu which is the fourth over in the task manager you can see them here uh, they're conveniently uh, positioned here so you can literally look at what they are and you can see which one of those actually start automatically here is the immune net this is the antivirus, it starts automatically. I want that and I'm perfectly okay with that. If I want to disable it, I can disable it down here on the bottom, simply click disable. Since I don't wanna do that with the antivirus, I'm just gonna, as an example, I'm going to disable this audio manager and you can see now that it's disabled. Now keep in mind, there's one more place that a computer, or I should say that a program can run on startup and have a background process running like that. And one of those, is in this location. This is Program Data, Microsoft, uh, Windows Start Menu Program Startup. What this is, this is a path for a shortcut to be placed by a program which initiates the startup of that program that has that shortcut. So like, for example, if I have Microsoft Edge in here, it's going to start up Microsoft Edge every time I reboot the computer which could be run as a service, as, as a service running that's in the background process, I should say. So 
if I reboot the computer, Microsoft Edge will show up here and it's gonna show in here as running. So if you have anything else in here that you find that you don't want to run on startup, this is where you would find it and this is where you would remove it. So by default, program data is invisible. So if you go to C, you can see the program data is not there because it's a hidden folder. You can simply enable, you know, show hidden icons or whatever, or like this hidden items. And you can see the program data showed up there. And then you go to program data and I showed you that, you know, it's Microsoft. Let's see here, Windows, start menu, programs, startup. Okay, now we don't want Microsoft Edge to start up. We're gonna delete it and that's that. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, so number two reason is not enough RAM. So let's go back to our task manager and look to see how much RAM we have. I purposely set this up so you guys can see. If I go to performance tab, this is one way to see how much RAM you have. You can see that I only have four gigabytes of RAM and half of that is being used, which is 54% which is 54%. So let's say you have a program that demands a lot more, or you want to run more than one program, chances are that four gigabytes is not going to be enough. So I'm already using 2.1 gigabytes out of four, and that's used for catching, you know, page file, this and that. And of course you want to allow this because, you know, your computer is going to run more efficiently. Um, with, with not having enough RAM, if I run more applications than this, let's say, you know, video editor, uh, you know, a video game, uh, some kind of virtual machine or whatever else, this is gonna be a problem because I'm going to run out of RAM. So what that means is that once you run out of RAM, it's going to switch to using the local disk page file, which is also known as virtual memory. Let's have a look at that to, so I can explain to you properly what that means. If you go to advanced system settings and look at the very first performance tab if we open it up and select advanced again you can see what the page file is set to this paging file size for all drives is 1.4 gigabytes and it's also known as virtual memory as you can see here but it's also it has a really good description here it says a paging file is an area on the hard disk that windows uses as if it were ram keep in mind it switches to using your local disk as RAM. Local disk is a lot slower. I mean, a lot slower than your RAM. And that's the whole point of having RAM is to use it as a temporary storage for the applications that are running in the background because it's a lot faster than your local C drive. So if you run out of RAM, your computer would crash if you didn't have virtual memory set up so it switches over to using the virtual memory that's on the C and it slows down. Okay, let's have a look at the other example. So number three is computer updates. Computer updates is something that can slow down the computer. You could also see that the computer updates are happening in your task manager as well as a process. But one way to make sure uh, you know, or to double check that you do have updates is to sim simply go to check for updates tab and you can see whether if there, whether it's something happening here. Right now I am up to date, but if you go to Windows Update, you can see that there's something running here and that could greatly slow down your computer. So the best thing to do is just wait for it to finish and then reboot. Another big problem with Windows Update is that it takes forever to reboot the computer at times. And biggest, uh, the best solution for that is to upgrade your computer to a faster local drive. Or I should say, if you have a magnetic old drive, it's best to upgrade it to solid state drive. This is why you see people upgrading to solid state drives because they are a lot faster compared to old magnetic type of drives. And this will save you a lot of times, especially uh, when it comes to updates or anything else that you do within the computer and inherently will speed up every component of your computer. So I highly suggest to upgrade to solid state drive if you haven't done so already. Again, if you want to look at the examples of my gear that I use, uh, there's a link in the description box. All right, let's move on to the other example. 
So number four example is virus or malware attack. When you have a virus, it's most likely going to act just like a process running in the background that is taking up a lot of CPU power, especially if it's a zombie type of virus, but it basically takes up, it takes over your computer and it uses its resources to do malicious stuff. And that could be presented here in CPU and memory usage. So you can clearly see that. Obviously, solution for that is to run your antivirus, you know, make sure that everything is safe and good. But if you do have a virus or a bad malware, it will be running back here and it would look very weird. You could kind of recognize it. If you familiarize yourself with the processes that are normally running on your computer, you can see uh, a virus clearly it will be named something weird or something off. For example, it would say system two, for example, to hide itself from a plain site. You know what I mean? But in general, it would be using a lot of CPU usage. Sure, there are viruses that sit in the background and quietly do their stuff, which you may not notice. But if your computer is running slow, chances are that it's if it is caused by the virus that it's using up the CPU or RAM power and uh, or RAM resources, and that would be causing a lot of slowdown issues for your computer. And again, you would just use antivirus to get rid of that. Or if you have to, um, you would reimage the computer, basically reinstall the operating system if you cannot get rid of the virus itself. Okay, moving on to the next one. So number five reason is computer overheating. Why is this happening? Well, this can happen if your computer is dirty. So it might be a physical issue that requires your attention when it comes to cleaning your computer and your CPU is suffering because of that. And I'll tell you why. So let's say you're experiencing slowdowns and then you can't tell why. Chances are that it's caused by CPU overheating due to the dust collected in your computer or simply, you know, CPU not installed properly. Here's an example of that. Here's the CPU that's on this computer. You can see that it's Intel 6500 CPU and it runs at 3.2 gigahertz. However, you can see that it's set at 3.19 right now. And that's a perfect example to show you that your computer can automatically adjust the speed of your CPU based on the conditions. So yes, this CPU can probably run at higher speeds. Uh, probably, I think the turbo for this one is around four gigahertz and your computer will bring it up to the four gigahertz speeds as well. If the conditions are right, means that the temperatures are right. CPUs are super sensitive to temperature at the same time. If your computer is overheating, it's going to automatically bring down the speed and it's even possible that it would go even lower than the standard speed or stock speed, I should say, of your CPU. So if your computer is dirty, it's overheating, then it could cause slowdowns because your computer decided to save your CPU instead of letting it burn out. So the faster you go, the more heat you create because more power is required to run it. And if you can't cool it off because your computer might be dirty, then this is something you have to rectify in order to increase the speed or get back to the normal speed of your computer. I hope that's clear enough for you guys. All right, let's move on to the bonus and that's gaming related. So bonus one is related to the gaming. Gaming peoples, my friends, your computer cannot run a game and it runs too slow or this and that. Well, chances are you have just a standard, you know, onboard graphics card, which in my case is Intel R HD graphics card 53, 530, I should say. And this thing, I don't know, maybe can run some games on low, super low quality, maybe. Even then it will be slow. And this is the main reason why your games are running slow. You need to upgrade to a better video card or in some cases in to any video card because this thing is slow okay i mean they are i mean they've come a long way i have to say uh, but you know they're a little bit faster but you know if you want those 60 fps 
on your computer, you're going to want to upgrade a video card. If you have any questions about that, please let me know and I'll have a good suggestion for you when it comes to upgrade of that. Or you can simply check out my gear that is in the description box below. One last thing to mention is that if your computer is just plain old, then chances are it won't be able to keep up the with today's technology. You know what I mean? Let's say you have a computer that's like, you know, 10 years old. Of course, it's not going to run fast. It won't be able to keep up with anything from CPU to RAM to whatever else. It's just not going to be fast enough to keep up with the new applications. And the, <laughs> the only thing you can do is replace the computer. It's not even worth upgrading. If your computer is 10 years old, don't waste your time on it trying to upgrade it just buy a new computer guys i hope you find this video helpful share it with your buddies let me know what you think or if you have any questions i'll gladly help you leave a like oh god what else is there to say when it comes to this youtube stuff they always say leave a like subscribe so if you guys have time for any of that i'd appreciate it but you don't have to i just appreciate you guys watching thank you and have a good day day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Erwin, also known as Kobo Man. This video is about most common audio issues. So let's say you come across this video, but you have a specific issue that you don't know how to fix or figure out. Chances are I have a solution for you. You just have to watch the whole video. Here's the thing. I am an IT professional and I will go through many, many different things here that could be causing a problem with your audio. And there are things that you don't even think about as someone that doesn't work with computers as much as I do. And I'm not trying to glorify myself. All I'm trying to say is if you watch the whole video, chances are one of these things that I show you will fix your problem. So let's say you can't hear from your headset. Let's say people can't hear you on your microphone. Chances are I'll have a solution for you here. All right, so let's get into it right away. So the first thing we have here is typically what you see on the right hand side is the little speaker icon that you select. Believe it or not, I've seen people's computers muted like that and they say, I can't, I can't hear people. Well, it's muted. So obviously you would do that. Next thing we want to look at is the sound settings here. So if you right click the little icon here and then select open sound settings, this is where it would take you. The first thing you see here is the output device. You can see that it's right now selected to Realtek High Definition Audio. What that means is that this is the most common audio system that's installed on your computer, whether it's a laptop or a desktop, this is the default. This is whatever you plug into your computer. And I'll show you a screenshot of that right now. Whatever's plugged into that, it's going to go through this. So in order for it to work, obviously this has to be selected like so. If you click on it, anything else that's connected as an audio device will show up. So let's say you have a USB headset, then it would show up just like so. So if I select this, now I'm using USB headset. As simple as that. That means whatever you want to use, you would pick that. So let's say you just have regular headphones with its 3.5 millimeter little jack. You plug that in, make sure you plug it into the correct one. And, you know, depending what it is, if you just have regular headphones, no microphone, make sure you connect it to the proper port, which is 3.5 millimeter as well. And then you got to make sure that it's selected to this real tech, because that's what you plugged in. You literally plugged it into the computer that you're using, right? So, but if you use your USB, uh, you know, headset, then you have to make sure that it's that selected, right? And of course, make sure the audio is adjusted accordingly. Okay. Now let me touch on Bluetooth real quick, which is right here on the right hand side. If you select Bluetooth and you can see that your Bluetooth audio device is there, then chances are then that you have to move on to the other things that I will talk about here in a second. But if you're if you don't see your if you don't see your Bluetooth device here, make sure you click add, select Bluetooth and make sure it's paired with your headphones or headset or speakers or whatever it is that you have connected. So that's the first thing if you have a Bluetooth device. Otherwise, Whatever I'm going to talk about next is not going to apply to you at all unless you already paired your Bluetooth headset. All right, let's move on to the next thing. I'm just going to close this right quick so I can show you where the sound panel is. So if we go back here, right click and open sound settings. And the next thing we're going to look at is sound control panel, which is right underneath the Bluetooth and other devices. So I'm going to select that and I'm going to close the window behind it real quick. So that way I have a better of a, better of a contrast um, going on here. 
So the first thing we see that is that we have two different devices here. Let's say you bought a new USB headset, you plugged it in and then suddenly it's not working. Well, chances are this is what you're looking at here. This blue, or I'm sorry, this green circle with the white check mark inside of it means that it, this device is set as default. It means that this is selected right now to be used. Remember the first thing I told you and showed you in the drop down? This is the exact same thing, except this is a more advanced way of doing it, right? So if you want to use your USB audio device, which is this, make sure you select it and click set default, right? You se select it set as default. If you can't see your USB audio device, chances are it may be disabled. So if I, and I'll show you here, if I disable this, by default, show disabled devices is not there. So if it's disabled, chances are you may not even see it. So if you right click anywhere in this right area and, and, sh and click show disabled devices, you can see that it comes up right there. And all you gotta do is just select enable. So guys, this is, this, guys, this is one of those things where I was telling you, Chances are that I have a solution for you in this video. You just have to watch the whole thing because there's so many things that you can adjust that, that, that could be your problem, right? Anyways, so this is basically how you would make sure that you can hear from, that you can hear inside of your headset. So your speakers, right? Your speakers have sound. And of course, you can double click any of these things and change the levels, but it's the same difference as if you were going to the, you know, if you collect, a, if you select a little, you know, speaker icon here and adjust it like that. You just have to make sure that whatever it is that you're trying to do here, whatever it is that you're trying to use here is set by default. So let's move on to the next tab. And this is going to be for the, for you guys that have an issue with people uh, can't hear you on your microphone or you have low microphone um, output, right? Meaning that people can't hear you as well. Here is what shows up in the microphone. Again, show disabled devices is like this right see this is our real tech front panel and the rear panel as well so if you have a computer right and it has these 3.5 millimeter jacks and again i'll show you a screenshot here so you can see it so you can understand that it's super easy these are right now unplugged and this is what that red pointing down arrow means it means that these are enabled but there's nothing plugged inside of them and you can see that it's separate from here. So here is the microphone. And if you had something connected to it, it would turn, it would just disappear. It would not have that red arrow and it would be full on, full contrast like this. Right now, what we have is a microphone on the USB headset that is connected. So we have to make sure that that's selected as default, right? Since I have no other microphones connected right now this one is going to be set as default but if you have multiple ones you have to make sure that you select the correct one and then select set as default just like i showed you right on on the previous tab for the playback or for uh, the speakers right so if people can't hear you well through your microphone we have to look at the properties of the microphone itself so you can select properties down here or we can just double click it and then it opens up our microphone properties panel. The first thing that we can select here as the next tab over is listen. If we select the listen and apply, what happens is we are testing to see if we can hear ourselves through the microphone. This is actually a really good way to see how or to hear how well other people can hear us through that microphone. So once you do this test, make sure you uncheck it and click apply. Otherwise, you're going to hear yourself, your own echo all the time. But this is a really good way to check to see the levels of your microphone. Um, and I would suggest actually you turn this on and so you can go to the next step and troubleshoot the volume of the microphone easy. So the next thing we click over in this tab, what you would typically see is a microphone boost check mark. So this is on regular standard headsets it would say literally microphone boost instead of AGC. AGC here means that it automatically adjusts the levels of the microphone depending, it just does it automatically. So you don't have to worry about that. But if you need to enable microphone boost, this is where it'll be under custom. The next tab over is the levels. So if somebody can't hear you well or your recording is not that good on the microphone, this is how you would adjust the volume for the microphone. As simple as that, make sure this is enabled, but sometimes you would have this 100%, but you still can't hear well, 
that's when you go back to custom make sure this is enabled or again i would it would say microphone boost right the only problem with microphone boost is the chances are that it may pick up noise meaning like audio noise background noise static and this and that so i highly um, suggest that you test that beforehand so that way you know you have really good clean audio going and again you can do that through the listen here or you can record yourself for example using audacity or you know something like that uh, windows has a built-in sound recording uh, little app that you can try as well so what if your problem is that you don't have you don't see any of your you know devices connected whatsoever there's nothing that comes up well, chances are you need to install the device driver for it. Where do we find that? Well, we have to go to the device manager to find that. So if you just go to search button, search box here and just type in device manager, it will show up like so. Or alternatively, you can right click the Windows icon here and select device manager. In here, if you have your device, audio device connected, it would be under the first tab here. And if you click a little, you know, if you expand it, you can see what shows up there. If it's disabled here or there's a little exclamation mark, chances are you may need to update or install the driver for your specific headset or speakers or, you know, sound card that you may have installed for your computer. This is pretty rare nowadays. This used to be more common with previous version of Windows. But if that's your issue, make sure that, you know, the, it, it just kind of check here. And if there's an exclamation mark or it's disabled in here, make sure you get the proper driver from the manufacturer of your headset or your sound card. All right, guys, these are some of the most common audio issues that you may encounter. If you like this video, please share it with friends. So leave a like. If you have any comments, I will be more than glad to answer them. I, I enjoy helping people. So this is one of my things that I do. So. All right, so thank you so much for watching and I wish you a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Welcome my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobu Man. In today's video, we're going to talk about BitLocker and its use in tech support or in a business environment, if you will. BitLocker is used for encrypting of your drive. So for example, let's say you have a computer at work, chances are it will be encrypted with some kind of software, typically would be the C drive, for example, here. So there are many types of encryption software. And for example, one of them is Sophos, but a lot of businesses are going towards a BitLocker because BitLocker is part of Windows operating system and it's free and it's convenient and it works well. BitLocker uses AES 256 encryption and that's another reason to use it because it's just about impossible to uh, decrypt it in basically access any data on it unless you have a key for it or direct access hardware access to it so in addition what i'm going to do is actually talk about how it's implemented in a business environment and which kind of uh, operating systems can use bit locker so for bit locker to work you have to have windows 10 Pro enterprise or educational version of Windows operating system, meaning that if you have Windows Home operating system, you will not have the option to turn on BitLocker. You need to have at least Windows 10 Professional. So that won't work if you have Windows Home. Okay, I digress, so let's move on. So let's talk about the importance of having drive encryption. So what happens is if somebody steals this computer, they can literally take this C drive here, they can take it out of the computer, and they can plug it into their computer, and they're gonna slave it to their computer. It's gonna kind of look like this. It may show up as local disk D, for example, and they're going to try to access it. However, if it's encrypted, they won't be able to access it at all. It would just say, well, you need the key to unlock this drive. So there's a great security feature that comes with any type of drive encryption, but this is um, also made easy with a bit locker. So if they have access to your computer, let's say they steal it, and you know, chances are that you have a password, right? Most of us have a password before they can log into their computer, so they can't get past the password. So they take the drive out and they try to slave it inside of their computer. And if you don't have encryption, they can literally just go inside of C, they can go to your documents and look up anything that's inside 
and have full access to it. You can see there are some important stuff in here and then we don't want them to have any access to that, especially if you have passwords that are saved, for example, in a notepad. Let's say you have a notepad that you just keep around for a password. For example, let's say you see you have your Gmail password and then you have your login, chances are, you know, Gmail login, and then you may have it saved on a, in a notepad. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you have drive encryption. So keep that in mind. If you are saving any passwords to your computer in a format as such, which is completely normal, you, if you don't have drive encryption, then you're just kind of asking for uh, data loss or somebody, you know, God forbid, you know, this is just the worst type of, you know, scenarios that somebody steals your hard drive or they can even access it um, over um, in other ways, right? So that being said, we definitely want to have our drive encrypted in our case. Why not do it? Because it's free. It's completely free with Windows operating system. So let's look at the implementation of this in a business environment. But before I proceed, I would just like to ask you to take a few seconds to click like on this video or subscribe. In this case, I don't have to play an advertisement for you. Instead of waiting 30 seconds, you can just spend five seconds here and click like or subscribe. I really appreciate it, guys. I really do. Thank you so much. So let me show you how BitLocker is enabled. If you just have a personal computer, you can simply right click any of the drives and then you can select turn on BitLocker. So what happens is when you click turn on BitLocker, the computer itself will test the drive to see if it's compatible with BitLocker and then it will tell you whether you can turn it on. Chances are that it will be because most drives are compatible with BitLocker encryption. So here we go. It gives you an option to save a recovery key. And again, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. A recovery key can be used to access your files and folders if you're having problems unlocking your PC. It's a good idea to have more than one and keep each in a safe place other than your PC. So this is incredibly important to save somewhere else that's not your PC. I personally, what I do is I either save it somewhere on like somewhere externally and you can, there are many options of doing this. For me personally, I have multiple copies of the bed locker and you know, you can, so here's an option. You can save it on an external USB if you really wanted to. You can save it on, uh, you can send it to your email. You can uh, just print it out if you really wanted to. Those are certainly options that you have here. And of course you have an option here that says save to your Microsoft account. I don't really do that because I may lose the password to my Microsoft account. You can save it to a file. That's definitely an option. You can print the recovery key as well. We will have a look here in a moment on how you would use the recovery key as well on an encrypted drive. However, let's touch on how this is used or implemented in a business environment. So the drive would be encrypted after the computer has been imaged or re-imaged. So after the, the system used in your business, it has finished installing the operating system anew, it would start to encrypt the drive with BitLocker. And at that point, whatever the system has initiated, I mean, this could be done possibly with a, you know, a, a batch script or some kind of a, a tool that initiates BitLocker and at the same time saves the file to a remote loco location. So it, that way you have access or a, a copy of that recovery key in case of a computer crash. So let's say user reports an issue where he says, or he or she says, my computer crashed. And you look at it and you're like, oh, wow, this is a hardware hardware problem, let's say a motherboard died or something like that. And the problem is that you can't just take that drive and plug it into another computer. It won't work because BitLocker knows that that drive belongs to another PC. So you only, the only way to do, the only thing you can do here is slave the drive. And let me just cancel this or no, let me just move this out of the way. You can slave your drive and they would kind of show up like this, like a local disk D and then you would have an option. You would have a, like a lock key and I'll show you this and it would ask you for a recovery key. So that's the thing. It would have a copy of this key somewhere else remote and this process would encrypt it, save it somewhere else. So in case of a crash of a hardware failure, you would have the system or a tool. It really depends on the business setup environment. It could be just a, a file spreadsheet somewhere. We don't know, but 
I digress, you would have that key and then you would look it up probably by using the host name or maybe the serial number of that computer. You would look up what the key is for that so that way you can recover user data. So let's go ahead and do it manually here so to see what happens. I'm going to save it to a file and I'm going to click here, save. And you will see a specific error. And uh, for, for this here, I'm just gonna leave the bedlock recovery key as it is. So that way I don't need, I don't need to change it anything. It's self-explanatory, I already know what it is. But I wanna show you what happens if I was just to click save here. And you can see right away that the BitLocker wizard here says, you can't save to this PC, please choose uh, another location. So let's go ahead and try desktop. We're gonna click save again says this location can't be used. Your recovery can't be saved to an encrypted drive. Choose a different location. You see how everything kind of comes back to this to have a remote somewhere else recovery key located so that way you don't so that way you can recover the data, right? In case of a crash or anything like that. I mean, as far as I know, you may like you may forget a password for your drive and then you can recover it with a recovery key as long as you remember to keep a key somewhere safe that you know to look for it. Okay, so let's go ahead and save it to another drive. I'm going to try to see if I can save it to this other drive that is not encrypted. So I'm just going to leave it at D here. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it BitLocker keys and I'm going to go inside of that and then I'm going to save it as so. So let's go back in here and make sure that we do have that BitLocker key. Where's our thing? BitLocker keys and here's our file. If we look inside of it, here are our keys. Here's the recovery key. Here's the identifier for it. And that's you can see that that's reflected in the file name as well. And uh, here is our recovery key in case of a crash. So you can see that the recovery key in this case is just a combination of different uh, of uh, numbers uh, with dashes. And this is 256-bit encryption for your drive. Okay, now that we have the key saved, I can go ahead and, and click Next. It gives you an option on how to encrypt it. You can see the encrypt disk usage encrypt used disk space only and it's faster and that's set up for base brand new computer so if it's a brand new install this is what typically what happens and anything else that's added to it you save new files programs this and that it's going to encrypt it automatically as it states here and but if you have a computer that's been used for a long time you might want to encrypt the entire drive which is slower but this is what happens so you know chances are if you remember that you know, once your computer is reimaged, just, you know, use uh, the fast one and that should be fine because everything else you add to it later on will be uh, encrypted as well. So it's going to click next, new encryption mode. Here's a choose a, which encryption mode to use. As you can see here, there's a two different types of mode. Uh, the newest version is installed or introduced in version 15.11 of Windows 10. And if you aren't sure, you can just leave it at compatible mode so that way it's backwards compatible for all other versions of Windows that you may be running. If you're not worried about it, you can just leave it in new encryption mode because I believe the newest version of operating system, I believe it's 19 something so we're well past that either way it's fine uh, I'm just gonna leave it in compatibility mode just in case and then I'm going to it's gonna ask you are you ready to encrypt this drive encryption may take a while depending on the size of your drive he says you can keep working which is fine although your PC might run more slowly so it's asking you if you want to do a, a bit locker system check in this case all it is doing is just making sure that the hard drive itself is in good running condition, meaning that there are no errors with the drive itself. And you can certainly do that just to be sure. So let's go ahead and do that. And then again, don't forget, I will show you how it looks like uh, when we are trying to recover data on a, an, an encrypted BitLocker drive. So what you're looking at here is what happens if somebody tries to boot from the BitLocker hard drive. This is the error they get. And you can see it's referring to a recovery key ID. And if you remember, it's the exact same one that we have for our hard drive. So I literally put it in another computer, try to boot it from that drive as well. And then now it's saying, well, you need the key to even, even attempt to even get to the login screen of this PC. And here's our reference number. We can compare it 
exactly to our key and it's this here and then we have the identifier for it so now it's asking for this specifically all right now let's see what happens when we log in to our computer and see it as a slaved drive so here we are our encrypted drive is now slaved now we can see that it has a little lock key on it so let's double check it and see what happens and here we go again it's asking for that bit locker recovery key all right let's give it a shot and see what happens with that i'm going to open up our recovery file here is our key i'm going to copy this entire key like so i'm going to try it again i'm going to paste that in there i'm going to hit unlock and there you have it guys now you can see the little lock is unlocked and now we can go inside of this make any changes and recover user data which is typically located in users and under their login profile and lastly going back to our computer where we have encrypted it in originally we're going to have a look of some options that are there available for managing a bit locker if we right click the c drive and select manage bit locker we can see that we can once more back up your recovery key if you need a copy of it or you can also turn off bit locker if you choose so all right guys thank you so much for watching i really appreciate your support if you have any questions feel free to ask them if you have any comments i'll be glad to entertain them as well and if you get a moment, please share this video with your friends. Thank you so much. I hope this helps you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, we're going to talk about VPN, Virtual Private Network. This video is really good for people trying to get into help desk or desktop support. First video or first part of this video is going to be a presentation on VPN. It's going to explain what VPN is, how it functions, why we use it, and this and that. The second video is going to be a VPN troubleshooting example on how to troubleshoot VPN, things to look out for. And the third part of the video is kind of a things to kind of watch out for when it comes to dealing with a VPN, especially when it comes to resetting passwords for users while they're on VPN connection. This is a really good and important video to learn, and I hope you find it very easy to follow. That being said, please take one second to click like on this button. It really means a lot to me when I when you guys do that. It really is just kind of a, a excellent and a wonderful way that makes me happy that you guys do for me. I really appreciate it as always. Thank you so much. So what is VPN? VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. And the way that usually works is, let's say you start working for some business, for some company, and they decide that they want you to work from home occasionally, right? So what they do is they give you a laptop. They give you a laptop or maybe even a desktop, but typically it's just a laptop. They give you a computer and they say, okay, take this home and then VPN from home so that way you can work for us. What does that mean? Well, they want you to connect from home to the company's network so you have access to all the resources that you normally do so that you can work from home, right? That's what the VPN is in the nutshell. So where can you VPN from? You can VPN from home, you can VPN from coffee shop, a restaurant, a store, um, you know, anywhere there is internet access, right? So this is how it kind of works. You create a virtual private connection from any other location that has access to the internet, which allows you to connect to the company's network. And I've, I will explain what how this works your company has a centralized computer that deals specifically for vpn there are servers that uh there act as a proxy if you will that allows you to have access to all of the other uh, computers on that same network on your work network right so you have a, a server that's a VPN server that you connect to, and this allows you to have access to the company's network, right? VPN is encrypted and it's safe. It's fully encrypted and it's safe. This is where uh, authentication comes in um, in a couple of different uh, forms, right? Um, the first thing that we need to do and have is software, right? VPN uses software. You 
basically open up this software that's going to be installed on your computer you open it up and this software will typically ask you for authentication meaning login and password however there's a little bit more to it right you come to this screen and it says username and password and you know you have your normal username password that you use for your normal computer for for your you know for your computer that you go to work you know you go to work you you know you log in with your log in a password and that's fine however vpn is different it's going to have a little bit more to it um a lot of times and i hope most of the time there's a um a, some form of token authentication involved whether it's hard token or soft token so what i mean by that is it's a generated it's a randomly generated number that you use in combination with your password right you have your username that's most likely not going to change it's your regular username however you'll have a password and combination of of the numbers that come from the token so imagine a hard token is basically something that's kind of small sort of like a thumb drive size and has a randomly generated number on it that changes typically every 60 seconds you can have the soft token that basically does the same thing you open it up on your computer and it just displays a bunch of random numbers that change every 60 seconds so you type in your username your password and the randomly generated number and then you will log in as a result when you're authenticate, authenticated now you have full vpn connection which is encrypted the company's network says oh, okay you're fine now you have full access to the network resources at the company that you work for so it's the same as if you were sitting at the company's office at your office right it's the same thing you have full access to your work files your emails and everything else that's available to you at your office right that's the whole point of vpn you have full access while you're at home when you create a vpn connection to all the resources at work as somebody who might be working help desk or just tech support for a company you'll have people who work remotely and nowadays we have a lot of people working from home so in order for them to actually be able to work now they have to connect to the company's network but now they can't work because they're not on the company's network they're not physically there at the office so they have to use vpn software to connect directly and attach themselves to the network of the company this is why they use vpn software to do so now what i have up right now is just a home user vpn that anybody can use not to be confused with a business vpn this is the reason i have it up this is going to be totally different this home one that you can go to google.com and download free vpn all it does is just hides your location so that way it looks like you're connected to the internet from some other country that's all it does it's completely different from business vpn in the sense of access to, to the resources that you need to work as somebody who works for a company all right so this is a sample of regular free vpn that regular people use not workers so let me show you here's the list of servers that they pick so if they for example run this and they for example click brazil suddenly now they're going to look like they're connected to the internet from brazil so they're basically trying to hide their location this is not the same thing as a business VPN. All right, that being said, let's look at a business VPN, how it kind of looks like. When it comes to business VPN, you typically get something similar to this. You launch the application and you get a similar pop-up to this. And it asks you for your username, your password, and a second password. So what is this second password? We know this is pretty straightforward. The username is probably going to be your network login or your domain login id it's going to be the same thing as what they use when they're at the office so it's going to be the exact same thing most of the time it's going to be the exact same thing as what they use at the office their username is going to be exact same thing 
I'm sorry for repeating that. I just want to make sure that you know this. And the password is going to be the same thing as they use for the office when they log into their computer. Second password, however, is different. This is usually an RSA token. So what is RSA token? RSA token is a one-time password that is always randomized. I think it usually lasts 60 seconds once you get that one-time password and then it allows you to log in. You may have seen this with some websites. Some websites use one-time passwords to access your different types of accounts. It's very similar to that. So let's concentrate on this second password part of it first. This is kind of what it looks like. This is an old school way of getting that, that one-time password. It's a uh, token that is gen randomly generated. So basically what happens is you press a button, for example, like here or there, and it generates a random number that you use as the second password. A lot of times these are either hardware tokens. This is what they are. These are hardware tokens, but there are also software tokens. Let me just kind of scroll down to show you that. You can get a software token that kind of looks like this. Here it is, this one here where it says VPN token. This is something that's installed on their computer as well. So they'll have an icon on their computer with the VPN software. So the VPN software is going to be separate, and now, but they have to launch this VPN token to get this random code to use as part of their login, login as the second password. It might be the way they put in the password, the second password for the VPN token might be slightly different, varying from VPN software to another, but in the nutshell, they're going to need that VPN token or RSA token, if you will, in order to get that second password so they can log in and access the VPN or the network that they're trying to connect to. You can also have a mobile version of that. So you can have a mobile phone. I don't know if I have an example of that here, but you can install an app on your, some companies have an option of installing app on your phone that generates this random token. So that's the first thing to be concerned about when it comes to connecting through VPN when it comes to customer connecting to the VPN. So this is the main thing that you see when it comes to VPN uh, with help desk when people call in or contact the help desk. They're, most of the time they're going to say, I can't connect to the VPN. The main thing to learn when you work for some company is to learn how they are connecting. That's the main thing. Now let's move on to other things. Let's look at a VPN servers and how they are different from uh, how they are different from, let me see here, from regular VPNs. This is kind of what it's going to look like for somebody, for example, working in the United States. When they will launch their VPN software, they may get a list of servers that kind of look like this. And they're all going to be in US. And all of these are most likely the servers for the exact same company. So this is all the same network. They're all on the same network. They're just different location. This is very normal when they are launch their VPN software. They will see a bunch of different servers and they may choose to select one of these. The reason it, you want to know about this is because sometimes some of these servers will be down. It happens. Sometimes there will be way too many people trying to connect, for example, to the same one. Let's look at the, let's look at the capacities here, for example. You can see that the Los Angeles one is the very first one. So people automatically tend to click on the very first server available. And you can see that in this example, there's 13% capacity already, meaning that it has the most, well, this one has a lot too, 15%, but people a lot of times tend to pick the very first uh, VPN server for their company. Either way, if they're having trouble suddenly connecting to, for example, Los Angeles here, just ask them to connect to Miami, New York, San Jose, or Seattle. So that's one other thing to kind of keep in mind when it comes to connection issues. Now, the other thing uh, that is very common when it comes to VPN connection is that software is simply not there. So you have to have a, a way to uh, reinstall software to reinstall VPN software for the user. And a lot of times what happens is a company will set up 
a website that user can log into before they are connected to VPN. So for example, what happens is they would get a link, they would type in that link, whatever that may be, get my VPN software. Dot com. For example, this is not, I don't even know if this is a real website or not, but this is kind of what would happen. They would get a link and keep in mind, they're, they're still there. At this time, they're not connected. Their problem is they cannot connect the VPN and they don't have software either. So they, what happens usually is they will have a link that they go to. And once they go to that link, they can download the software and install it. So you may have to help them install that software as well if they need admin privileges this and that that's just a basic troubleshooting when it comes to installing software but keep that in mind if they don't have it there has to be a way to get that vpn software installed onto their computer before they're connected to the vpn you, you see what i'm saying there has to be an external access or a way to initiate the VPN software installation so that way they can afterwards connect to the VPN and have all the resources available to them afterwards um, so they can just get back to work and start working. All right guys I believe this covers the VPN uh, troubleshooting when it comes to help desk or general tech support. Let me know if you've encountered anything else that might be related to VPN. I think I covered kind of the most common issues when it comes to VPN. Let me know in the comments if there is anything that I've missed. I'd be interesting to hear different scenarios, different options, but keep in mind, there are many, many different ways of initiating VPN. Companies a lot of times have their own proprietary software, you know, different prerequisites, meaning they may have a different uh, security so some companies, as far as I know, may not even require a second password or RSA token, which is kind of silly, but you do see that with smaller companies uh, that may necessarily have the manpower to set all this up and you know maintain, do the maintenance on it and keep up with all of that stuff. So it's going to be it's going to vary a little bit, but in general, what I've explained to you is exactly the main things. They're, they're exactly the, the main things to be concerned about and to learn when it comes to troubleshooting VPN connections. So with this knowledge, you can literally go, for example, to an interview for a help desk. And when they ask you about the VPN, you can explain to them how VPN works in this type of sense. Again, it's totally different from VPN that you download from the internet to hide your location. It's completely different. It, it works the same way when it comes to connections, but it's not the same function because here you are just hiding your identity from the rest of the internet while VPN for a business allows you connect, allows you to connect to the company's network. So that way you have access to all of those resources. So that way you can work so you can get back to work. So this issue happens a lot when person's password expires their password expires and suddenly they cannot get onto vpn they can typically log into their computer but they can't get on their vpn because they don't get that prompt to change their password at all and they can't just do control alt delete this is where you can usually click change password or it would just it would just force you to change the password they can't do that because they're not on VPN yet. They are disconnected at this time. So the only thing they can do as they typically do is just call help desk and ask for a password reset. But we got to make sure that we don't just jump into resetting until we do a couple of things first. Let's have a look how I handle this call. And I hope you like my role playing. Uh, if you do, please take a second to like this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. So user decides that they need to change their password, so they need help with that. So what they do is they pick up the phone and call the help desk. And it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Can you uh, reset my password? I'm having a lot of trouble logging in. Can you reset my password? Sure thing, sir. I can reset your password. So this is something you would normally say to anybody who calls in and asks for a password change or a reset. So what can you do with that? The thing is, though, 
you have to keep in mind that when he's on VPN, he will not be able to take that temporary password that you've given to him and change it to his permanent password. Well, why is that? He's not connected to the same domain that you're changing his password on. So the question we need to ask him first is, are you able, sir, are you able to get on VPN? No, I, uh, I can't. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm not on VPN. I can't log into VPN. That's why I need you to reset my password. Sure thing, sir. But keep in mind that unless you're on a VPN, uh, me changing your password is not going to help you. Now, just to make sure, are you already logged in to the computer? Oh, uh, no, not, not at the time. It's not at the moment. Uh, you want me to log in? Yes, please, sir. Uh, please log into the computer and make sure you stay logged in. Uh, I can't give you a temporary password uh, because the system is set up in such way where you can't change it to your permanent password until you're connected with your VPN first. And in order for you to connect to the VPN first, I got to give you a permanent password because it just won't work. You can't use your temporary password to log into the VPN. And once you are logged into VPN, uh, you can go ahead and update all your other systems by simply locking your computer and then unlocking your computer with your new permanent password. Unfortunately, yet again, I can't give you a temporary password because of the current uh, setup and the system setup situation that we have. And um, that's the only way I can help you with that. I hope that works out for you. Well, that will that'll work out for me. I just, uh, you know, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to make sure that I use this per permanent password. And then I just want to make sure I can get on right now. Thanks for your help. Sure thing, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you can get on VPN as a, as a number one thing. Uh, so that way, you know, you can get back to work or do whatever you need to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else I need to, you need help with? No, I'm okay. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. And you as well. Have a good one. Bye-bye. And there you have it, my friends. The only thing left to do here is show you footage from one of my videos on how to reset a password in Active Directory. Let me know if you like my puppeteering. I know you can probably see my mouse pointer moving the hands up and down. I hope this is something that people uh, might uh, find enjoyable. I uh, just kind of kind of a overview of what we gone over. The number one thing to keep mind in mind here is that if somebody is trying to connect to VPN, they need to have a working permanent password. If their password has expired, they obviously can't change it uh, when they are not connected to the VPN. Because remember, when you call help desk, you give them a temporary password, at which point they get a notification or forced to change it to a permanent password. That doesn't happen when you're trying to connect to the VPN. And if you're not on VPN, you're not going to be able to get that notification or that prompt at all. So you got to give them a permanent password. And if they decide to change it afterwards to something else, they can. So this is something you can mention as well. All right, thank you so much for watching. And again, here is my video on how to change passwords and Active Directory. All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left-hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select Users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right-click the Users folder and select Find. In here, you can type in the name of the user, and he said Irvin underscore C-A-N. So let's go ahead and click Find Now. And here it is. We found the user. We can simply select it, double-click it, and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in. So the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked, in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account, select apply, 
or OK, and this will unlock the user's account. Now we can get back to them and let them know to try again. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find, and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin CAN so we can find this user. Here, since we found it already, we don't have to dig through the actor directory. A lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password. Is that now, since you already found it, you don't have to dig and kind of like, you know, your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user. You can just find it here and then right click and reset password. And we're going to change the password to something temporarily. And then again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. And now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. All right, guys, I hope you find this video useful. Please share it with your friends. Let them know about me and ask them what they think. Are these videos useful to you? I think they are. I appreciate you watching. Have a good day. And don't forget to ask me any questions that you may have in the comments below. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. In today's video, we are talking about prioritizing work and specifically talking about tickets and the ticketing system that might be used at your company. So let's say you do help desk or you do some kind of desktop support, tech support for some company and you have a ticketing system where trouble tickets come through and you're supposed to work them to resolve issues that you know users submit. This is directly related to my article that is called Top 10 Hard Desk Hard, hard desk, top 10 hard desktop support interview questions and answers. There's a link at the end of the video if you want to read this. But um, this is not the only video. This is part of the series that I'm making and this is a number seven video. So if you'd like to check out the other ones, there will also be a playlist at the end and also uh, some links to a couple of other videos that were very cool to make. All right, so let's get to it. This is from a question number seven. One day you come into work and you find the major systems are down. However, you also see the ticketing system has 50 or more unassigned tickets. What would you prioritize and how would you go about dealing with this problem? So here's the thing. If you're being interviewed and somebody asks you this, they want to know what you find as a biggest priority and what you should do when it comes to production impact. So this is incredibly important. The way I would explain this would be in four different steps. Be first, second, third, last. So that's how I would explain it. The reason for that is so that the potential employer can realize that I, you know, that I know what I'm talking about, that I have the basic knowledge, not to sound egotistic or anything. It's just that I have basic and even general knowledge on how to deal with a situation where you have to prioritize your work. So first, I would ask which systems are down and how many users are impacted. This will determine which issue is to be worked first. 
tickets would be the last priority. So here's the thing. If a large number of users is impacted by a system that is down, then that's definitely something you would prioritize. So think about it. Let's say there's a company with thousand people and system major system is down. That means we have thousand people that need to be, uh, you know, they need to go back to work basically as soon as possible. So this is why we need to prioritize this. This is some of one of those common sense type of things, but yet, you know, potential employer wants to know this. And this is also good to know if you already are working help desk or some kind of desktop or tech support, right? It's definitely more people than 50, right? And then, then after you're done with that, tickets would be the last priority. Second, if multiple system issues are related, then I would handle this issue on my own if possible, depending on what the issue is. If issues are not related, and in this case, I would recruit help from coworkers and possibly assign individually if manager is not present. So this is incredibly important. If users report that multiple systems are down, which is directly related to the question, then there is a correlation there. Chances are that all of these systems, if they went down at the same time, chances are that they are somehow related to either servers, databases, or whatever it is that they all are, they, they all have relation to. So chances are you might want to handle this issue on your own to make it a more proactive uh, situation handling because it's all related to one thing. So basically what would happen is you see that multiple systems are down, right? And then you realize, you know, especially if you have the experience working for the company, chances are you will know right away. Okay, yes. Um, okay, wh what's wrong here? This website is down. Uh, this application is down and this other thing is down, are they in any way related? Then you, if, you, if, they, you know, if the answer is yes, then you can say that, okay, just let me know which ones, how many people are affected, how many users are affected, I should say, and then I will report this issue to the people that have access to these systems. Meaning, let's say database is down, chances are you doing tech support at the location or help desk, that you won't have access to the to this database for a specific system. I mean, there could be hundreds of systems that are used by a company, you know what I mean? So you might as well handle all of this or chances are you'll have a crisis bridge or, well, this is what we call it at my company, but there is a bridge or a conference line that you would call and the uh, person on the other line would basically be the mediator and they would handle, um, you know, the, the kind of logistics part of it as in, you know, they would ask you, well, how many systems are affected? Which ones? And then you'd give them all this information, how many people, this and that. And then they would say, okay, all right, I'm going to start the bridge and I'm going to start paging people, meaning that he's going to reach out to proper people that you may not know who they are. If issues are not related, in that case, I would recruit help from coworkers. Means that if it's not related, you cannot handle multiple issues especially if it's a big issue, you know? So you ask your coworker, hey, can you help me out with this? And chances are they will, because you know, hopefully you work in a, in a, at a cool place like I do. <laughs> uh, anyways, and possibly assign individually if manager is not present. So, you know, chances are a manager would handle um, assigning of uh, this different uh, situational issues to other coworkers, but if they aren't there, it, if, if, if it's a legit place, and I, I mean, I shouldn't say like that, if it's a cool place to work at, and then everybody is on equal terms, equal expertise and this and that, chances are they will help you and you can just ask them, you know, can you help me with this? So it wouldn't necessarily be assigning individually because manager is not present, but you would basically recruit them to help you out, recruit their help to help you out deal with other issues because you can't possibly handle uh, multiple issues that are not related, right? I mean, it's, it's that, that's what I would suggest, especially if, if it's a huge issue. Because think about it, think about it this way. If multiple systems are down and they're not related, how can you possibly acquire information that these uh, 
application owners or sys uh, database owners or server owners, how can you possibly give them the information um, to that? For example, let's say, okay, how many people are affected? And you say, um, I don't know, a, a thousand. Okay, give me some examples. So you have to handle this. You have to go to the users and then you would have to ask them, okay, uh, can you give me this information? Basically, you have to get a lot of information for a certain system in order to troubleshoot this properly. If they are not related, you can't possibly work with two, two different teams on two different issues efficiently. Third, I would proceed to troubleshoot the issue and get as much information as possible before reaching out to any other support groups that manages specific aspects of systems affected. So that kind of ties into what I was saying earlier. You want to have all the information ready because they will ask you, okay, how many people, which systems, can you give me an example of IP addresses, which link they're using, if it's a website, well, which application are you using, which uh, version of the application are they using? All of this information you have to have ready if you want it to go smoothly. You know, yes, you can, you can forget something. You can forget to, you know, get which version of the system it's being used or, you know, whatever else. That's okay. As long as you have the majority of things ready, that way it will mitigate the uh, production impact. In this case, support team, uh, in this case, support teamwork is essential to resolve major system issues that are not at immediate access to myself or desktop support team. So yeah, everything, everything that I'm talking about here ties in to everything that I said previously. Support team is essential to resolve major system issues that are not at immediate access to myself or desktop support team. You know, after you reach out to all these people that support these different applications, you have to have a good teamwork with them in order to resolve this properly. Lastly, once issues with major systems are resolved and the bulk of users are back to work, then I would concentrate on resolving tickets on a side. So, yeah, I mean, of course, it goes without saying that during crisis issues, all the management would be notified of progress, solution, and root cause. So this is, you know, very important. Once you come across an issue, you would want to report the statuses or give the status updates to all the management, um, including your own manager, but the management of the people that users report to because they would want to know why do we have thousand people not working so you want to send them updates periodically usually this is usually done with just you know email you send a group email to all the management of the departments that are affected and maybe some of the users and um, that way everybody knows on which page you're at or which page you're on I should say so that way they know that you're working on it and usually every half hour you can send you know this is just going to depend on on the place you work at and what your management what your manager requires but usually what i do is every half hour i send status updates that seems like a a, a good time frame to do so so that way they know what's going on and then once it's all resolved um you would provide a root cause to the management not necessarily the management of the users but to your boss and so that way your boss can follow up with these application owners and uh, work on, you know, making sure that this doesn't happen again. And then we can concentrate on resolving tickets that are unassigned. Of course, you know, you, you just go back to work <laughs> and work these 50 plus tickets. That's a lot of tickets if it's like just you to do. Good luck doing it all in one day. But hey, it's possible. I don't know. There might be some simple ones. Um, the most I've done, I think, was like 30 but that's because I had to physically uh, like go to people's desks and work with them like on one-on-one -on -one type of basis type of thing uh, but yeah I mean that's what basically do just go back to working tickets and then you know call it a day and you would of course prioritize those but I'm sure you have you would have some kind of system that helps you do so and you know this and that all right guys I hope you find this video useful if you'd like to check out my equipment that I use, my computers and stuff like that, there's a link in the description as well. Um, share with your buddies. Uh, see what they think of my teachings, if you will. I really appreciate you guys watching and supporting me in every way. 
I see comments uh, more often now with great support and I really appreciate that. All right, guys, have a good day. There will be more, so stay tuned. Don't forget to subscribe and smash the like button. Actually, don't smash it because other people got to use it. I, heard, I, said, <laughs> I saw this uh, joke uh, today. Uh, it said, don't smash the button. Don't smash the like button because other people got to use it. Just click it. <laughs> All right, guys, have a good one. Bye-bye. Oh, hey, looks like you decided to check out my channel. You probably watched one of my other videos and there might be something that you liked. And now you're maybe considering, uh, you know, subscribing and whatnot. But, you know, check out my other stuff first. I don't want you to, like, subscribe to me at all unless you like some of my other stuff. Check it out. I got more IT stuff. I don't know if you watched that or not, but I got a lot more of hardware stuff. So if you liked any of that, I... Uh, you know, I have plenty of more of that and I have plenty of more coming your way. So what are you waiting for? Either check them out or subscribe because there will definitely be more. And, uh, you know, I try to explain this stuff as best as I can. So it's easy to understand whether it's IT or the hardware stuff. My way of explaining things is very unique and different from anybody else. So keep that in mind. And uh, while you're here... I want to say that I love you and thank you for watching my stuff and doing any type of other interaction that you did with my video. Like, you know, stuff that people ask you to do, like, hey, can you click like, can you leave a comment, this and that. Look, if you felt like I deserve any of that stuff, I'm sure you already did all that stuff. And again, I always say this in all of my video videos is that if you need help with anything, you let me know. Also, this is my, this is my uh, logo. By the way, my name is Irvin, also known as Couple Man. I probably should have said that in the beginning, shouldn't have I? Oh well. Anyways, I guess you would already know that. You know, what am I doing with this hand? Doesn't this look like I'm? <laughs> doesn't this look like I'm holstering like one of those revolvers in those Western movies? You know, like pew 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 pew, bang bang ba bang bang bang. Bing, bang, pew, pew, bang. Okay, it got really weird at that point. I'm sorry, guys. But anyways, bang, you're it. I don't know what that means, but I'm being really goofy. And you know what? I'm just going to leave it like this. I don't care. It is a trailer after all. And chances are you haven't watched the whole thing anyways. So, bye. Bye again. I think it just got weird, didn't it? Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. Today's video is on Zoom. The reason it's on Zoom is because it's currently a very popular platform that people use for video conferencing meetings, even just meetings with their family. So yeah, we're going to talk about Zoom because it's very popular, a lot of people are using it. So we need to know how to fix certain things like audio and video or camera issues if you will. We're certainly going to talk about all of that but before we do that, please take one second to click the like button. And as always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I will answer them. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So here's what Zoom looks like when you install it. This is the Zoom application installed on your computer. When somebody gives you just a link and you've never used Zoom before, and chances are if they just sent you a link, you will simply click on the link and the link will say, hey, do you want to install Zoom? And then you click open zoom or install zoom and it's going to install it and then what you get and what you actually see is this window this is the window that you would typically see first time you use zoom and then you realize maybe my audio is not working people can't hear me or people can't see me we're going to definitely talk about that but the also a first pop-up that might you might see is it's going to ask you whether you want to use your computer uh, as audio so you have to make sure that you click use my computer as audio so that's going to pop up and you just click on that and that's very simple but then even then if you don't have your audio set up correctly it may not work let's look at the microphone uh, icon here you can see there's activity there that means it's detecting that there is a microphone it's picking up all those sounds from the microphones coming through that's good however we may have multiple microphones how do we know which one is being used correctly or if any so what if that's not happening that means we need to tell it 
which microphone needs to be used. So if we click on this little arrow here, we're going to see a lot of stuff. And you can see I have a lot of stuff. The reason I do is because, you know, I'm a YouTuber. I have lots of equipment. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that shows up. If you simply have a headset, if you simply have a headset, all you got to do is find out what is the name of it. In my case, I have a headset and it's called Plantronics C610. So I'm going to make sure I select that as the speaker because otherwise I won't be able to hear people. So now my Plantronics C6, C610 is selected. So that's my speaker. That's what I'm going to hear inside of my Plantronics headset that I'm going to put on my head. And then same thing for microphone. I'm going to make sure that this microphone is selected. And notice it's still working. The reason it's working is because it's selected as same as system and I have multiple ones. So it's probably picking up my microphone that I'm speaking to right now, which is not my headset. But for Zoom meeting, I want to use my headset. So I'm going to select it. And then I'm going to double check here, make sure it's selected. And you can tell that it's selected by simple, you know, check mark that you have here. And that's one way to make sure that you're using a separate like if you have multiple things like me this way you can keep track and make sure that you know if you want to use it separate from other equipment you just have to make sure that it knows what you want to use and now my audio is set this is if you're using a headset if you're using like a laptop if you have a laptop you have to make sure that the microphones laptop and speakers are selected so if you're not using a website and just your built-in laptop camera and the microphone, make sure that Realtek is selected for the speakers like this, speakers and the camera. Since I'm not using a laptop, all you see is speakers and no, cam no microphone here. But if I was to, for example, switch to my a, uh, webcam and like, for example, I have a uh, microphone on a webcam that is called HD Pro Webcam. And I'm going to select that if you want, if I want to use that camera. Now, this webcam doesn't have speakers, so I'm going to make sure that Realtek is just enabled, which is my PC speakers, right? So, again, don't pay attention to this last part too much unless you have these specific things. But if you're using a headset, make sure you select the correct headset in both of the, these menus. That way, it makes it simple for you. But if you have a laptop, just a laptop, you won't have this many things in here so just make sure that the real tech is selected but if you have a webcam make sure that the webcam is selected and uh, the PC's speakers so now you can see how I've selected the microphone for the Plantronics and it's actually picking up a little bit less of it because it's kind of uh, about a foot or so away from me so it's picking up less of it right now I'm speaking into something else anyways that's the audio. Uh, we can certainly test it. You can test it here, test speaker and microphone, and it goes through this setup where it detects the levels of it. And then it tells you, do you hear the ringtone? And it's a really good way to actually make sure that your headset or your audio is working. So I highly suggest you use that for testing. And then you can also have, if you have a phone embedded, that's another thing. Uh, but you know, this is uh, this is video specifically for somebody who chances are just installed a Zoom for the first time, and this phone integration is something else. So I don't necessarily want to talk about this because it'll be way too much and way too confusing. Um, and then uh, you can, if you click Leave Computer Audio, uh, that means you can just like call into the meeting and use your like phone, like your cell phone, you know or your, your home phone if you have them. And then if you want to really look at the audio settings, you can click on the audio settings here, and then you can see again what is selected in just a different separate menu. But it's the same thing we did earlier, except that you can adjust the output levels and this and that, you know? And then there are other things you can do, like use separate audio device to play a ringtone simultaneously. For example, if you have a headset, but you want your ringtone to come through the computer speakers, make sure that this is checked like that, and then select speakers, real tech. So now this time it, the ringtone is going to come through the PC speakers. There are a lot of issues, uh, a lot of issues, a lot of things you can do here. And then, you know, just play with them and make sure, you know, kind of find out what your preferences are. 
and then you know like for example you can automatically mute your microphone when you join a meeting these are all personal preferences you can go to advanced and deal in and you know adjust the background noise but this is fine as it is i wouldn't worry about it just kind of leave it at that otherwise you can just cause issues uh, more issues with the uh, audio and if it works you know don't try to fix what's not broken type of thing you know so just make sure that your proper microphone and speaker are selected do a quick test on them and make sure that works now let's look at the video video all right now i just have a picture there and if i click start video you can see me here talking and this is uh <laughs> this is my puppet here i guess and i just have that for and you can see me over here in the in the right hand corner uh right there you can see me uh just kind of talking and waving so i'm the puppeteer if you will so my <laughs> video is enabled here but if i want to stop at any time i can just click stop and then if i want to select a different camera I can certainly do that and for example select this HD you know uh, webcam or whatever your webcam is it's going to be listed there now keep in mind that if you have a camera open in another program that it may not work at all like in this example if I select my pro webcam here it's not going to work because I have it open in another program so if I click start it just doesn't do anything it's it literally says cannot start video fail to start video camera please select another video and camera settings i know you can't see that error pop up because it's on my second screen where my puppet is and i'm going to actually switch to it so maybe, maybe hopefully it stays there yeah you can see it right there that there is the error cannot start video because i had um camera um i clicked on a camera that's been used by something else so make sure that no other program is open and using your camera that's why you get that error you know otherwise it's you know it's pretty straightforward you select the camera you want to use and that's that now and then you can look i mean let's look at the video settings here what we have here and uh you can set different uh, options of course select the camera you want to use again but you can also see that you can change the aspect ratios enable hd you can mirror your video you can touch up your appearance to make yourself look prettier and um uh, you know different personal preferences that you want to show people about you camera is one of those things that is you know i don't like using it um for obvious reasons because i'm ugly but you know you know some people like it some people like it so and that's fine um i personally don't care for it here's a some kind of fun thing that you can look at and that is virtual uh backgrounds so let me see if this works since i have a green screen going on i wonder if it'll actually detect it decently or do anything with it and I'm going to select that I have a green screen oh wow hey that's pretty cool actually look at that would y'all look at that all right all right let me let me close it here I'm going to start video hey that's not bad so if you have a green screen this works really cool doesn't it I like that that's pretty cool it looks like I'm in space and whatnot let's change to something else choose a virtual background oh at the beach I wish I was at the beach right now. Look at that. Would y'all look at that? That's pretty cool. Oh, look, it's moving. <laughs> That's actually pretty fun. I've seen other people's, you um, other people using virtual backgrounds, and it kind of looks off because they don't have green screen. But in my case, I have a perfect green screen because it's software. There's no cloth behind me or anything like that. It's just my puppet, and he. Um, has a perfect green screen because it's 100% green ski and let's do one other oh okay huh i think this one's the best although it's not moving and then there's none you can see there's my perfect green screen over here you know all right guys i hope you like this video i think it's really fun to actually create this video i uh, uh it's it's cool it's cool like it's not that hard to use but yeah people still have issues and that's understandable it's okay to have these type of issues you know it's okay as long as we know how to fix them these are normal computer issues that happen all the time trust me so that being said i'm going to wrap it up please take a moment to like the video and if you have any questions let me know bye bye Welcome my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Coolman. In today's video, we are talking about software or application will not install. This 
idea for the video came from my article that is called Top 10 Desktop PC Issues and Problems with Solutions. I will post a link to this at the end of the video so you guys can check it out. So let's talk about this. Software application will not install. This is one of the most common things that you may have, uh, that you may have encountered using your computer where you simply try to install a program and it just refuses to do it. So let's have a look at some of the things that could be causing this. First, not enough drive space. So of course, if you go to your computer and you know, you go to your file explorer and you go to the C, you know, it may say that you are running out of space, in which case chances are that local disk C will be in red. And then you could tell that there is not enough space. Second thing is newer version is already installed. So sometimes people overlook this, uh, believe it or not, but they may get an error that sim simply says you already have a newer version, therefore I'm not going to install this. So you proceed to install it, then it would just pop up and say, you already have a newer version. So for example, if I go to add remove program and have a look, for example, I don't know, let's just pick a random thing. This is AMD Catalyst Control Center for video card, uh, for the video card driver. So let's say you have an AMD video card and you try to install an older version it will say, well, you already have this version, which is newer version, and then you can't install over it because it's an older version. Sometimes people overlook that and they just think that, you know, something else is wrong. So that covers that. The other thing that could happen is you didn't install prerequisite software. For example, uh, VC uh, Red Ist X64. I, I'm not sure how to even pronounce that, one, but that's what it's called. Uh, or Microsoft.net any of those versions or DirectX. DirectX a lot of times is related to, you know, video games. Uh, video games will come with package of this one, VC Red, Red Dist X64, also 32-bit version, and uh, its own version of DirectX that was used during the, uh, I guess, the build of that software. So you, of course, need that. Same thing goes for Microsoft.net. So let me show you what I mean. I'm glad that I kind of left it at this window here because you can find this type of stuff in here as well. So let's go ahead and just type in Microsoft and see what kind of things we see under that name. These are all just basic things that come with the Microsoft. But if you scroll down, you can see that there are Microsoft Visual C++ redistributables. Redistributables. Sorry, I, I try to say that as best as I can. English is my second language, so uh, forgive me on that. But you can see there are different versions of that. So let's say you install software and it's not running. Let's just say it's not running for some reason. There may not be any error or anything like that. Well, chances are that you didn't install either any of these versions that your computer may need. And the reason for that is whenever that program is, was built, it had this Visual C++ redistributable there to begin with. So it was based off of that. I hope you, I, I don't want to make it too techy sounding or too nerdy sounding, but basically that's what it is. So you're going to need the same version. It's, it's like trying to do something on a different type of, uh, um, I want to say, uh, let's say you're trying to play uh, soccer on a baseball stadium. It's kind of like that. <laughs> okay, so the same thing goes for the Microsoft.net. Uh, this computer doesn't have it here, but it would basically show up the same way. It would say Microsoft.net version 1.0, 1.5, or you know 2.0, whatever it is that the current version is. So it would be the same thing. You may sh you may need that as well, but that one is not as often installed as is Microsoft Visual C++ redistributable. redistributable. Uh, anyways, uh, and the same thing when it comes to DirectX. DirectX, uh, let me see here, I forget whether it actually shows up here. It doesn't, but we can certainly search for it. So if you type in DX Diag, it will find it and will run the command. And it just says, 
you know, are you know, it just wants it's asking you whether you want to check whether, whether the drivers are digitally si signed. And here it is. This is the direct X. Um, same kind of type of deal. It's just that it may not show up in the add remove that I showed you earlier, but it will be kind of same thing as Microsoft uh, C++ thing that we looked at earlier. Um, however, it will just kind of update this version of DirectX. This just told this just tells you what the version is installed already. Uh, this is not the actual DirectX program. This is just a diagnostic tool that tells you which version you have. So you can kind of look at it and you know, figure out whether you need to update it. You know what I mean? Uh, but usually it, you would get this with a package and this is just a good way to kind of look up to see what you have in your system. So the next thing is basically not compatible with the operating system. So a lot of times older programs will not function on the newer operating system. So for example, you have a Windows XP program that you want to run on Windows 10, but it doesn't work because it's just simply not compatible. Or of course, if you're trying to install something that's like Linux based and you're trying to install it on Windows, of course, it's not gonna work. So here are some of the solutions. Um, for the first one is free up space on hard drive. That's self-explanatory. If you don't have enough drive space, you simply free up space. Simple as that or choose a different, you know, installation media, whether you have a second hard drive or what have you. Uh, the other thing is look for previous installations of newer software and install or prerequisites. So if you already have a newer version installed, of course you would just look for that and um, install all the prerequisites. This is kind of uh, talking about the part where I mentioned you didn't install prerequisite software as stated previously. So you would just make sure you install those. You can also install them by possibly install them by reinstalling the program itself, or you can acquire compatible operating system, which is related to the last cause for this. You know, I realized that there are, you know, quite a few other issues um, that could, that you could come across when it comes to errors, um, you know, this and that. Uh, when you use your computer, these are just some of the most common ones that you would encounter and um, if you have any ideas or other causes or other issues that could be related to not able to install software or application, you know, feel free to let me know in the comments below. I would uh, gladly, I would, I would be glad to hear from you and uh, possibly answer those for you. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you want to check out my gear, my setup, there is a link in the description box below as well. I will be making more of these videos, so be sure to subscribe and share with your buddies. I'd appreciate a like too. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Disable it. Enable it. Amazing. Look at that. Disable. Enable. That's amazing. Oh man. Just, I'm going to be using this. I'm going to be using this. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kumbu Man. So today I am testing this new AI thing from NVIDIA. It's called RTX Voice. So what it's supposed to do is remove any background noises that you have when using your microphone. So what this requires is actually an NVIDIA card, but you don't have to have an NVIDIA card to actually install this. What it does require is to have Windows 10 and to have the most current driver, which is 410.18 or newer. So you got to have those things in order to use this. But then again, you don't need to have an RTX card to use this. And here are some of the supported apps. One of them is OBS, XSplit. Twitch Studios, Discord, Google Chrome, Battle.net, Zoom, Slack, and all kinds of different things. So especially nowadays, if you're working from home and using, for example, Zoom or Skype or any of these listed uh, voice chats, this will work for that. So it's supposed to be very simple to install. And of course, I'm going to test it, but I'm going to test it in a way where it's kind of extreme. I did raise the sensitivity of my microphone 
uh, during this video so that way you can pick up on any ambient sound so any background noise but I will test it with um, what I have is a contraption that dehumidifiers uh, or it's, it's called a dehumidifier but it dehumidifies the environment that it's in so basically draws out water from the environment and my office is in my basement so I have it down here and when I turn it on it's really really loud this is why I only run it overnight but I'm very interested to actually see if this will work because I uh, have uh, lots of things that are near me that make noise and uh, I don't necessarily need it because my settings are pretty good but I'm curious to how well this is going to work I I'm assuming this would be great for some people who are uh, you know really have background noise uh, and especially if they have lower quality mics anyways so I'm here at this website and here is the link to it if you want to check it out or you can just Google Nvidia RTX voice and the first thing we got to do is download the app so I'm just gonna click on that and then afterwards while it's downloading here you can see that the setup is very simple so this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to follow these instructions Friends, if you like my videos, please take one second to click the like button. It really makes a big difference for me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, good thing I have fast internet, so it's almost done. These, and that was like a few seconds, and here it is. I'm going to run it. I'm going to install it on my computer, and then we're going to test it to see how it goes. And uh, yeah, it should work really well. I've seen some other people test it out. And I was very impressed by it. This is why I'm doing this test right now. So we'll see how well it goes. I know I clicked on it to install. There it is. It's coming. And of course, it looks like it's checking to make sure that you do have NVIDIA uh, card installed, I should say. And uh, so, yeah, uh, unfortunately, oh, well, it looks like it finished already in the driver and all that. Okay, well, it looks like it's starting up right away, and the version, it's 0 0.5. All right, and now I'm going to pick my microphone, which is this, and I'm going to click Remove Background Noise from my microphone. Let's see, I wonder if I'll have to restart OBS. I'll try not to do it, and I'm not going to, I'm going to set this here to that, because... Okay, I'm going to click on this too. Remove background noise from incoming audio as well. So in case you are using, for example, your computer speakers or just desktop speakers or whatnot, you know, that are not headphones, you might want to enable this. This is what it looks like to be. And then you can control the levels of suppression, noise suppression. So I'm assuming now that this is configured properly, at least in this NVIDIA RTX part of it. I will probably have to go into the stream labs and uh, you have to change some settings. So let's have a look and you can see now that the microphone is actually still very sensitive. You can see that there's a background noise when I stop talking. It's picking up on that because I've raised the sensitivity to it. So let me go to the properties of this, see if we can find it. Oh, okay, here it is. So it changes it to so you can select microphone as the NVIDIA RTX voice. So you got to make sure that this is done. Let's see what happens. Oh, okay. So it's supposed to automatically adjust this. I tell you what, let me uh, turn on the um, space dehumidifier, and then we're going to see how it sounds like with it on. And I'm going to disable it. Oh, look at that. So it's automatically kind of adjusting there. Let me, let me turn on. I'm going to turn this on. Hold on. I'm coming. All right. I know you can hear that noise. Oh, wow. It killed it. I didn't do nothing. That's amazing. Let me see. Oh my god. That is that is so amazing. Look at all that noise that is happening there. I'm going to enable it. Look at it. Did you see how it adjusts it right there? That is amazing, guys. Oh my god. 
I, I can't wait to hear this in post whenever I edit this video. Look at that. Disable it. Enable it. Amazing. Look at that. Disable. Enable. That's amazing. Oh, man. Just, I'm going to be using this. I'm going to be using this. Oh, this is cool. This is cool. And I'm going to leave this on too. All right, guys, please take a moment to click the like on this, uh, click the like button on this video. And this is so cool. So anybody who is working from home now or has a bunch of background noise and, uh, you know, all, all the, anybody that has, uh, dude, dude, I can't even speak because this is pretty exciting. Anyways, if you have a lot of background noise, do yourself a favor and download this if you have an NVIDIA card. It's free. All right. Thank you so much for watching. You have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, I wanted to show you how to back up user files before you reimage their computer. So this is incredibly important because whenever you reimage a computer, you, you are reinstalling the entire operating system, meaning that local C drive will be deleted completely. Everything that's on it is going to be removed, whether it's files or, or documents or any programs that are installed. So it's incredibly important to know which one of these things to look for and to create a backup of before you do this so that user doesn't lose all of their stuff, right? This is self evident that it is very important so let's look at the main places that the user would store or create files and that would be in their local profile so if you go root to c and you go to users you can see that there are different local profiles inside of it in our case we have three which is buco Cobalt test account and yt login so let's say the user is using the YT login, which is what I'm using right now. We want to make sure that everything inside of it is saved, but we don't necessarily need all of it, but maybe we do. We'll see. Let's go inside of it and see what we have. What you typically use as a user, let's say you just kind of imagine yourself what you would use. You would probably use desktop. So if you go to desktop folder, you can see there are things inside of it. You can see my files document and there's a test document here. And you can see them right here. This is what's on my desktop. So if I go back and I go to a documents folder, you can see I have a couple of different things there. So if I go to my documents, you can see that those are the exact same things that I have. As you can see, it's the same thing. This is what I have stored in my documents. So if I go back out of that and then, for example, look at favorites, there will be favorites there. So these are some of the main things you'd want to create a backup of before you re-image their computer. Of course, um, sometimes users use downloads folder as their storage, storage location. So this is something you might want to backup as well. Now, to be safe, yes, I recommend that you copy the entire folder that is used for their pro local profile. So in our case, YT login, I would want to create a entire copy just in case the user decided to save things inside of totally different folder. For example, let's say they went into pictures and they saved a bunch of documents. I don't want to lose them by, you know, going in here and say, okay, well, I don't need to back up the entire profile. I'm just going to back up, you know, desktop, documents, downloads and favorites, which is something that users typically use. So if I create just a backup of that, but they happen to save something in any of these, it's gone. So this is why I recommend that you, you know, copy entirety of this local profile. Now, of course, whenever the computer is reimaged and they log in back into that new computer, the new profile is created. You don't want to go back in here and copy the old profile back because the problem comes with things that are, for example, in app data. App data, local roaming typically, they contain information and configuration for specific, you know, specific software that is in there. So you don't want to copy all of this stuff over. They could cause potentially issues and corruption to the new 
uh, to the new operating system literally whether it's you know installing the same operating system over it can still cause problems or you're let's say upgrading from windows 7 to windows 10 or you know or or, or what have you uh, you don't want to copy back everything that's uh, there yes a lot of places all of this is done automatically but i wanted to show you how it's done manually and some of the other things that you have to watch out for to make sure that you know they don't lose anything another place to look for user saved files is under local c if they have the ability to create a folder or save files in the root of c chances are the users may have done so especially if they have a lot of files that they deal with so they want to make sure they, they just want another place to save files to and they don't realize that the safest place is actually their local profile so if you go to the side of the root of c chances are there might be a folder in there in here called hey you know my saved files so you kind of have to look for that and also create a backup of it as well because and, and it will stand out like this you know you, you get yourself familiar what typically is inside of root of c but if something like this shows up yes you have to uh, you know you kind of have to make sure that there is a backup of that as well so let's go ahead and create a backup i usually do this on a, another network location but you can if you're remoted into that computer you can just save it to your computer or whatever is available locally in our case we're just going to go to the local uh, d drive and i'm going to use that as a backup i'm going to create a folder here called backup and i'm going to go inside of that and then i'm going to open up i'm going to go inside of the the user's profile again and uh, we're going to back up this entire profile i'm just going to create a whole copy of it and that's simply done just copy paste we're going to create a backup of that and then again we're going to go back to the root of c and look for that folder where it says saved files and we're going to copy that over as well so typically once you're done this and the computer is re-imaged what you want to bring back is those four folders that i've mentioned typically so once the pc is re-imaged you would go back into your backup and as soon as this populates let's see how much do we have here oh it's almost done okay so the main ones you would copy back typically would be desktop documents i'm just going to skip this uh, it's trying to just to copy a, a shortcut uh, desktop documents favorites and downloads folder you know this may vary from place to place depending on the restrictions uh, you know meaning that what are the folders that are restricted or what are the, the features that are restricted on your company's uh, computers or whatnot but now that i have a backup of it as you can see this is our backup we're just going to go back in here and once the user logs back in it's going to create another uh, profile under the same name so we'll go inside of that it will be just like this and here you can do this literally like this you can just highlight from your backup desktop documents downloads and favorites and paste it back in there now it's gonna it's gonna ask me here to uh, uh you know replace oops it didn't detect that's the saved files that was odd copy here we go paste so it's going to ask me to replace the files because they're identical over there um, they, they're already in there that's why it asked me to replace the files but that's what you would do it would basically just merge the backup with the new one and that's how you would successfully back up all of their information and again some businesses may have different way of doing this but this is how you do it typically manually and uh and that's that guys i hope you like this video if you wanted to look at uh some of the profiles that are on the computer if you go to computer properties and advanced settings you can see all the user profiles that are inside of it which are under advanced and then select settings here for user profiles and this will uh it may take a little bit to populate depending on how many there are but this is what would show up and these are all the local profiles that are on your computer you can see there's buco kaboomman test account and yt login the default profile is also a local profile but it's a default profile for all the users which is definitely related to it but not something you would create a backup of all right guys please leave a like if you have any questions i'll gladly answer them 
and I uh, I just wish you a wonderful day. <laughs> Have a good one. Bye bye. Hi there, are you looking to get an IT job? Well, I can help you with that. My website, CosmicNova.com, can prepare you for the most important part of getting that IT job. Sure, you can apply for the job, you can get your resume straight, you can get that interview, but can you pass that interview? That's the most important part of it. Sometimes it comes down to just personality, but what else can you do with that? Well, I can prepare you exactly for those specific IT jobs. For example, I have videos and articles on that. My website, CosmicNova.com, links to everything that you need to get that IT job. Are you applying for a help desk? Are you applying for system administration, desktop support, network operations, network administration, or other ones? It doesn't matter. I can prepare you for all of those. Check out my website, CosmicNova.com, or just follow the link below. I will help you with not only written material, but I also have videos on it specifically made and voiced by yours truly. It's all professional, guys. Come check it out, and it's free. What do you got to lose? Just click on the link and stop by. I wish you best of luck. Welcome to CosmicNovo.com, a science and technology website. We have many articles related to these topics, but also offer a helping hand in IT job assistance. That being said, a collaborating YouTube channel under the name of Kobuman has a large amount of support video material to further assist you. Thank you for stopping by and we wish you best of luck. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin Olson and Kobo Man. In today's video we have a refresh course for help desk desktop support or tech support in general. What I do is every couple of months I would take the videos that I've made over that time and combine them into a single video that you can watch without having to go through and find these individual topics on your own. So let's see what we have. First thing, we have a real world scenario where the issue is no administrator access at local level. I will show you how to do that. I will also talk about BitLocker encryption and its use in a business environment. Third part of that is installing software through PowerShell. So it's an introduction to PowerShell and how to use it to install and uninstall different programs. It's really good to use for somebody who might be interested in that. Last part of the video talks about file association along with some Java troubleshooting. Guys, let me know if you like this type of stuff. If you have any comments, please leave them below and I'll answer them as well. And if you got a moment, please click the like button. This really makes a huge difference for my channel. I really appreciate that and I hope you enjoy this video. Thank you. And in today's video, we're going to look a real world scenario in which you may come across in tech support. In this situation, we cannot access a remote computer so we can make changes to it or fix something on it. So what happens is we, for example, try to backdoor into it to make some changes. We would simply, you know, for example, type in uh, backslash backslash name of the computer that we're trying to access. And then we would try to hit enter and the error would be, well, you don't have administrator privileges, so you can't do anything with that. Or we are trying to remote desktop into it and it would be the same thing. We would type in the name of the computer, hit enter, and it would say, well, oh, you don't have administrator privileges, you can't access. So what seems to be the problem? Well, here's the thing. As tech support, you probably belong to a group, group uh, policy on the domain that has administrator privileges that's automatically applied to all the computers that belong to that domain. So in this case, what happened was is the chances are that that group policy hasn't applied to that computer locally. So let's say the name of your group on the domain. Let's just open sticky notes real quick so we can have a reference. Let's say the name of your group is IT support. You and everybody else that belongs to that group you and everybody that belongs to this IT support group on that domain has admin access. So at this point, in order to quickly resolve this issue, instead of going through, you know, reimaging the computer, this and that, or trying to force any of these things, we can just simply add IT support group that you belong to with administrator privileges. We can add it to this computer at local level. And if you appreciate this type of content, instead of me playing an advertisement here, please take a second here and just click the like button or subscribe 
to my channel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And this way, I don't have to bug you with ads. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to have a local administrator password or a local administrator login so we can make these changes locally. Obviously, uh, you need local admin uh, privileges. So what we're going to do is go to access our system with using local administrator. Now, this is one of those things that your company will provide for you. Uh, you know, if you have a good company that you work for, chances are that every computer that they have will have a backup login, which will be a local admin, local admin and will have a specific password for it. So you're going to have to find this out. You're going to have to look up the name of the computer that you're trying to troubleshoot. For example, you can see here that the name of this computer is called tech support. So you would access the database that has the passwords for the tech support, um, for, for the local admins on tech support, and then you're going to find that what that password is and what the login name for that is, and then you would log into that computer. In my case, I am logged in as administrator using this login. So in my case, it's YT login and it has administrator privileges and it's for this computer that's called tech support and I am good to go. Now I can make changes to the group policy that uh, has applied to this computer. All right, so let's get to it. Now, in order to do this, we're going to have to open up our local group policy. Now, this is the wrong thing to look at. A lot of people look this up and they're like, oh, well, how do I do this? Where is this at? This is the wrong thing. This is local group policy editor for the components of the window or anything that runs on this computer. So what this basically does, you would go in and, for example, allow or disallow a component of the windows or software to run. For example, it would say allow, you know, or, you know, or deny um, whatever is trying to do. Okay. And this is not it. What we want is actually called local users and groups. So in order to get that, we can type in lusrmgr.msc in our run command and we hit OK and it's going to open up our local users and groups. Here's where we're going to apply our changes so that we can go about our business and get to fixing this computer. Now, there are roundabout ways to get this and you can get to this through the computer management as well. If you go to control panel, click administrative tools and then select computer management, you can see that Local users and groups are here as well, which is the same thing as the window that we opened previously, like so. So it's the exact same thing. You can see users and groups here. It's the exact same thing as what we have on this other side. So that's one way to go about it. Now, you can apply this um, IT support group by selecting groups here and this in this left hand side so make sure you select groups not users users are just local accounts groups is what we want so we're applying a group policy to this computer and let me just expand this here so it's easier to see a little bit easier to understand because i really want to highlight the part that we're going to make changes to all right so what we're going to do is add administrators group policy to it. So obviously we're going to select administrators and you can see here, if you read it, it says administrators have complete and unrestricted access to computer slash domain. Get it. So IT support group belongs to a domain. Now we're going to add IT support to the administrators of this computer that is locally. And we're going to now do that and once we do that all the administrators all the people that belong to this it support group will have administrator privileges on this pc at that time so the way you do that is simply select add and we're going to type in it support and then we're going to click ok and in this case it's not doing anything because it's not it's just a fictional uh, you know uh, group policy so what happened is we would add it and then suddenly you would see IT support, a domain group policy applied to this and you would simply click OK and possibly reboot the computer, but it should take uh, effect immediately. At this point, the whole point of doing this is so that not only will you have administrative privileges on this computer, now you can make any changes to it you want remotely or this and that, 
but everybody else that belongs to that group. So all the people that work with you, now they don't have to go through this thing of getting local administrator login, the password, this and that. Now you can make all these changes and then everybody can just log in and that's the quickest way of doing uh, doing this. Now, of course, if the local group, if the group policy hasn't been applied to this computer automatically for some reason, that there may be some other issue that you may want to look at it. However, this is a quick fix and you can just go about your business and then, you know, anything else. I mean, there might be multiple groups that need to be applied to this. It just depends in, depending on the on the system uh, of the business setup that you have where you work at. It's just going to kind of vary, uh, you know, from business to business. In today's video, we're going to talk about BitLocker and its use in tech support or in a business environment, if you will. BitLocker is used for encrypting of your drive so for example let's say you have a computer at work chances are it will be encrypted with some kind of software typically it would be the c drive for example here so there are many types of encryption software and for example one of them is sophos but a lot of businesses are going towards a bitlocker because bitlocker is part of windows operating system and it's free and it's convenient and it works well bitlocker uses aes 256 encryption and that's another reason to use it because it's just about impossible to uh, decrypt it in basically access any data on it unless you have a key for it or direct access hardware access to it so in addition what i'm going to do is actually talk about how it's implemented in a business environment and which kind of uh, operating systems can't use bit locker so for bit locker to work you have to have windows 10 Pro enterprise or educational version of Windows operating system, meaning that if you have Windows Home operating system, you will not have the option to turn on BitLocker. You need to have at least Windows 10 Professional. So that won't work if you have Windows Home. Okay, I digress, so let's move on. So let's talk about the importance of having drive encryption. So what happens is if somebody steals this computer, they can literally take this C drive here, they can take it out of the computer, and they can plug it into their computer, and they're gonna slave it to their computer. It's gonna kind of look like this. It may show up as local disk D, for example, and they're going to try to access it. However, if it's encrypted, they won't be able to access it at all. It would just say, well, you need the key to unlock this drive. So there's a great security feature that comes with any type of drive encryption, but this is um, also made easy with a bit locker. So if they have access to your computer, let's say they steal it, and you know, chances are that you have a password, right? Most of us have a password before they can log into the computer, so they can't get past the password. So they take the drive out and they try to slave it inside of their computer. And if you don't have encryption, they can literally just go inside of C, they can go to your documents and look up anything that's inside and have full access to it. You can see there are some important stuff in here and then we don't want them to have any access to that, especially if you have passwords that are saved, for example, in a notepad. Let's say you have a notepad that you just keep around for a password. For example, let's say you see you have your Gmail password and then you have your login, chances are, you know, Gmail login, and then you may have it saved on a, in a notepad. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you have drive encryption. So keep that in mind. If you are saving any passwords to your computer in a format as such, which is completely normal, you if you don't have drive encryption, then you're just kind of asking for uh, data loss or somebody, you know, God forbid, you know, this is just the worst type of, you know, scenarios that somebody steals your hard drive or they can even access it um, over um, in other ways, right? So that being said, we definitely want to have our drive encrypted. In our case, why not do it? Because it's free. It's completely free with Windows operating system. So let's look at the implementation of this in a business environment. But before I proceed, I would just like to ask you to take a few seconds to click like on this video or subscribe. In this case, I don't have to play an advertisement for you. Instead of waiting 30 seconds, you can just spend five seconds here and click like or subscribe. I really appreciate it, guys. I really do. Thank you so much. So let me show you how BitLocker is enabled. If you just have a personal computer, you can simply right click any of the drives and then you can select turn on BitLocker. 
So what happens is when you click turn on BitLocker, the computer itself will test the drive to see if it's compatible with BitLocker and then it will tell you whether you can turn it on. Chances are that it will be because most drives are compatible with BitLocker encryption. So here we go. It gives you an option to save a recovery key. And again, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. A recovery key can be used to access your files and folders if you're having problems unlocking your PC. It's a good idea to have more than one and keep each in a safe place other than your PC. So this is incredibly important to save somewhere else that's not your PC. I personally, what I do is I either save it somewhere on like somewhere externally and you can there are many options of doing this for me personally i have multiple copies of the bed locker and you know you can so here's an option you can save it on the external usb if you really want to you can save it on uh, you can send it to your email you can uh, just print it out if you really wanted to those are certainly options that you have here and of course you have an option here that says save to your microsoft account I don't really do that because I may lose the password to my Microsoft account. You can save it to a file. That's definitely an option. You can print the recovery key as well. We will have a look here in a moment on how you would use the recovery key as well on an encrypted drive. However, let's touch on how this is used or implemented in a business environment. So the drive would be encrypted after the computer has been imaged or re-imaged. So after the, the system used in your business, it has finished installing the operating system anew, it would start to encrypt the drive with BitLocker. And at that point, whatever the system has initiated, I mean, this could be done possibly with a you know a, a batch script or some kind of a, a tool that initiates BitLocker and at the same time saves the file to a remote loco location so it, that way you have access or a, a copy of that recovery key in case of a computer crash so let's say user reports an issue where he says or he or she says my computer crashed and you look at it and you're like oh wow this is a hardware hardware problem let's say a motherboard died or something like that and the problem is that you can't just take that drive and plug it into another computer it won't work because BitLocker knows that that drive belongs to another PC so you only the only way to do the only thing you can do here is slave the drive and let me just cancel this or no, let me just move this out of the way. You can slave with your drive, and it would kind of show up like this, like local disk D, and then you would have an option. You would have a, like a lock key, and I'll show you this, and it would ask you for recovery key. So that's the thing. It would have a copy of this key somewhere else remote, and this process would encrypt it, save it somewhere else. So in case of a crash, of a hardware failure, you would have the system or a tool. It really depends on the business setup environment. It could be just a, a file spreadsheet somewhere. We don't know. But I digress. It would have that key, and then you would look it up probably by using the host name or maybe the serial number of that computer, you would look up what the key is for that so that way you can recover user data. So let's go ahead and do it manually here so to see what happens. I'm going to save it to a file and I'm going to click here, save. And you will see a specific error. And uh, for, for this here, I'm just gonna leave the BitLocker recovery key as it is. So that way I don't need, I don't need to change it anything. It's self-explanatory, I already know what it is. But I wanna show you what happens if I was just to click save here. And you can see, right away that the BitLocker wizard here says, you can't save to this PC, please choose another location. So let's go ahead and try a desktop. We're gonna click save. Again, says this location can't be used. Your recovery can't be saved to an encrypted drive. Choose a different location. You see how everything kind of comes back to this to have a remote somewhere else recovery key located so that way you don't so that way you can recover the data, right? In case of a crash or anything like that. I mean, as far as I know, you may like, you may forget a password for your drive and then you can recover it with a recovery key. As long as you remember to keep a key somewhere safe that you know to look for it. Okay, so let's go ahead and save it to another drive. I'm gonna to try to see if I can save it to this other drive that is not encrypted. So I'm just going to leave it at D here uh, matter of fact, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it BitLocker Keys and 
I'm going to go inside of that and then I'm going to save it as so. So let's go back in here and make sure that we do have that bit locker key where's our thing bit locker keys and here's our file if we look inside of it here are our keys here's the recovery key here's the identifier for it and that's you can see that that's reflected in the file name as well and uh, here is our recovery key in case of a crash so you can see that the recovery key in this case is just a combination of different uh, of uh, numbers uh, with dashes and this is 256 bit encryption for your drive okay now that we have the key saved i can go ahead and, and click next it gives you an option on how to encrypt it you can see the encrypt disk usage encrypt used disk space only and it's faster and that's set up for brace brand new computer so if it's a brand new install this is what typically what happens and anything else that's added to it you save new files programs this and that it's going to encrypt it automatically as it states here and but if you have a computer that's been used for a long time you might want to encrypt the entire drive which is slower but this is what happens so you know chances are if you remember that you know once your computer is reimaged just you know use uh, the fast one and that should be fine because everything else you add to it later on will be uh, encrypted as well so let's go ahead and click next new encryption mode here's a choose a, which encryption mode to use as you can see here, there is a two different types of mode. Uh, the newest version is installed or introduced in version 15.11 of Windows 10. And if you aren't sure, you can just leave it at compatible mode. So that way it's backwards compatible for all other versions of Windows that you may be running. If you're not worried about it, you can just leave it in new encryption mode because I believe the newest version of operating system, I believe it's 19 something so we're well past that either way it's fine uh, I'm just gonna leave it in compatible mode just in case and then I'm going to it's gonna ask you are you ready to encrypt this drive encryption may take a while depending on the size of your drive he says you can keep working which is fine although your PC might run more slowly so it's asking you if you want to do a, a bit locker system check in this case all it is doing is just making sure that the hard drive itself is in good running condition meaning that there are no errors with the drive itself and you can certainly do that just to be sure so let's go ahead and do that and then again don't forget i will show you how it looks like uh, when we are trying to recover data on a an, an encrypted bit locker drive so what you're looking at here is what happens if somebody tries to boot from the bit locker hard drive this is the error they get you can see it's referring to a recovery key id and if you remember it's the exact same one that we have for our hard drive so i literally put it in another computer try to boot it from that drive as well and then now it's saying well you need the key to even even attempt to even get to the login screen of this pc and here is our reference number we can compare it exactly to our key and it's this here and then we have the identifier for it so now it's asking for this specifically all right now let's see what happens when we log in to our computer and see it as a slaved drive so here we are our encrypted drive is now slaved now we can see that it has a little lock key on it so let's double check it and see what happens here we go again it's asking for that bit locker recovery key all right let's give it a shot and see what happens with that i'm going to open up our recovery file here is our key i'm going to copy this entire key like so i'm going to try it again i'm going to paste that in there i'm going to hit unlock and there you have it guys now you can see the little lock is unlocked and now we can go inside of this make any changes and recover user data which is typically located in users and under their login profile and lastly going back to our computer where we have encrypted it in originally we're going to have a look of some options that are there available for managing a bit locker if we right click the c drive and select manage bit locker we can see that we can once more back up your recovery key if you need a copy of it or you can also turn off bit locker if you choose so in today's video we're learning some of the basics of powershell specifically on how to install or execute application installation so what will uh, what i will teach you here is how to use some basic commands that would lead you towards creating your own scripts 
that will allow you to install software through the PowerShell. So basically, once you go to the internet and you download something, it's going to be inside of downloads folder and whatever you decide to install, let's for example, take this example here, Media Creation Tool 1809, you would simply double click it and you get the prompts and you go to the prompts and then you install everything like that. Well, you can also execute this through the PowerShell. So there are a couple of ways of doing this, which will help you get to the point where you create your own script to run PowerShell remote installs or even local installs, if you will. And that is to get to the same directory. So if we type in CD downloads, it's going to take us to that directory. The reason it got us to that directory is because we were already partially there. But if we really wanted to navigate to this, it would be simple as this. We're going to type in users, name of the local profile that I'm using, which is YT login. And then I'm going to type in downloads. It's going to get us to the same place. So if we type in the IR, we can see that that media creation tool is indeed there as well so this is one of those things you might want to double check every time you create or before you start to create your scripts <clears throat> by the way this is going to be a little bit more advanced so it's a little bit more advanced for uh, you know people who are more familiar with computer software but if you're new to computers i will try to go as slow as possible comparatively speaking here's the same directory in a gui form so this is inside of our windows and we can see that it's exact same stuff that we see in here so let's go ahead and execute it from the powershell and the way to do that is to type in start process and then type in media creation tool dot exe See, now we get the same prompt to uh, go through our uh, prompts to, you know, basically install our software. However, if you want to make this to be a silent operation, you would do the same thing and then just do a switch or a command, which is forward slash S. This would execute it silently if it is an MSI package, typically. It won't work here because this is executable. It's designed to literally go through the prompts like that. But if you do have MSI package, it will allow you to do so like so. And for example, of an MSI package, in case you don't know, is for example, this one. This is an MSI installer for that, and that is that .MSI. Now, here's another example of how to do it on from a remote uh, remote location. In our case, we might have something on a network level, which is for me located here. I went ahead and created a folder for this example on forward uh, backslash backslash Koboman1, and that is the PC name or the server name that you might be using. And then I'm going to type in folder name repo1. So if we look inside of this one, the IR, we can see that we still have that media creation tool inside of that. So the same way we can execute it from here as well. So we can start type in the same way, start process media creation tool 1809.exe. Since we're in the disk directory already, I can just hit enter and we're going to get that pop up again and it's installing. So I went ahead and canceled that. This is where you're getting all these errors. Now, we can the same way we can start our script by typing in let's see here start dash process and then we're simply going to navigate to the network location let's see here and then it's going to be cobbleman one for uh, folder name repo one and then we're going to do a backslash and then we're going to type in media creation tool 1809.exe. Then we're going to hit enter. And now we have that pop up again. And again, if you want to make this silent, you're going to have to create your own MSI package or something like that and basically design it so it is silent. So meaning that nothing happens that you see visually, it just kind of installs it. So that's how you would do it. Uh, that's how you would start to create your script for a remote location using PowerShell. Now, you can also use a package manager to download different applications or access different applications and execute them like so, but you would have to have some kind of a 
package manager that would allow you to do so. So let's look at a repository that's online available right now that you can kind of look at as an example of that. So there's one that was set up for testing by Microsoft, which we will navigate here in a moment. Let me just do a quick clear here so that we don't have any uh, confusion here. And in order to find these packages, we can type in find dash package. And then we need to specify a provider, which that means is, you know, dash provider. This is basically indicates that we're going to now type in the provider name. In our case, the provider or our server name, if you will, is Chocolaty. I think that's how it's pronounced. So we're going to hit enter here and see what happens. So here's just the run of all the things that are available as in packages on this repository or uh, server, if you will. So how do we get any of these packages downloaded to our computer? We just kind of have to know which one we want, but we can also kind of, if we're specifically want to look for some specific, let's say, I don't know, uh, let's say notepad. So we can stop it from kind of going through all the things and see if there's anything available for notepad. Because you can see there are so many different things here. And if there's something specific that you can there you're looking for, you're gonna have to, you know, kind of remember that or specifically search for. So let's stop this process here. And I'm gonna leave it up just for the sake of reference. I'm gonna open up a new PowerShell and we're going to access the same repository but i'm going to tell it to look for a specific name and in our case we're going to use an example of namepad so we're going to type in again find dash package and then we're going to type in provider and then server chocolatey and i'm going to specify a command which is name that tells it i'm okay i want you to look for this specifically or anything or any derivative of that or anything like that. I'm gonna type in notepad and I'm gonna use asterisk. So I'm gonna type in and everything that's uh, that has a notepad there's in, inside of this uh, repository, it's going to show up as so. So now we can see all the things that are available as a package um, inside of this repository. So yes, we can now download these packages and uh, we're going, we can use them in our package manager to push this type of different software. So what can we do with this point? Well, we can install one of these packages. So let's go ahead and pick a, a random one. Let's let's pick this one, Notepad++. We're gonna do Control C on this, so we have it saved. And then again, we're going to uh, use some commands. And this is this case, instead of typing in find package, we're going to type in install package. Install package, we're going to uh, type in provider once more. And then we're going to type in chocolaty, and then we're going to specify name, and then we're going to say notepad plus plus. So let's see what happens when we execute that. And now it's asking us whether we trust this source, which is for the right reasons. If you're going to look at this repository, make sure that you feel comfortable with installing this on your computer. And here it asks you, are you sure you want to install software from chocolaty? And I can say yes. Yes to all, no, or no to all, suspend, or or if you're unsure, you can type in help. So in my case, I'm just going to type in Y for yes, and I'm going to hit enter. And now it's installing this package. So let's see what happened. Did this actually install it? This is actually what happened. When we did that, it actually just downloaded that repository into our folder that is created on the root of C, and it's going to be in our libraries. And here is our chocolatey. Uh, well, there's a core extension. Well, there it is. Notepad++ is what we just got here. And there are a couple of different packages here that are installed. Ah, this one actually came with the installer. So that's cool. Now we can actually execute this installer if we really wanted to. And all right. I found that some of these uh, packages are not com incomplete that I've downloaded, for example, Visual Studio here. This one doesn't seem to have the actual the actual uh, executable in there. But this one actually installed. What is this one? This is part of the same one. 
Okay, well, we can execute this now, and all we got to do is just copy this path here, and then we can type in again, start process, and then we can specify that, and then we, we need to get the name of that installation. Let's do the uh, x64, the 64-bit version of that. And I'm going to paste that in there. And I'm going to hit enter. And here it is. Now let's see if it works silently. It errored out because I clicked no, as you saw. I'm going to use the S switch. Let's see if this... Nope. So yeah, it has to be an MSI package for it to install silently. And this one is just a simple executable. Anyways, guys, I hope you find this kind of interesting because it really is. You can um, do... We can set up scripts that will allow you to install remote uh, software packages into multiple computers, this and that. There are many, many ways of going about it. This is kind of just an introduction to PowerShell. And uh, there are many, many different tools that you can look at. And, uh, and not only can you install, you can also uninstall. And again, there are different ways of doing this. You can use the invoke command or you can just use install package command, you can use the start process command, many, many different ways. And this is the great thing about PowerShell. You can customize this to your needs or to your business needs of just the way, you've, the way it feels the best for your type of business that you'll work at. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about three different videos, three different topics for desktop support, and if you're also learning help desk. Very useful stuff. The first one is about ping command, how to use ping command and how to resolve issues using it. Second one is about traceroute. Ever heard about traceRT command? Well, I'm going to talk about it and we're going to learn about it. Very cool and interesting stuff. Last thing we're going to talk about is reliability monitor. A lot of people don't know about it, but reliability monitor is kind of like software, but it's actually built into Windows. I know it's actually software, but it's part of Windows. And uh, we're going to learn about it because it's kind of cool and not many people know about it. And it can help you resolve weird computer issues that are kind of apparent and easy to actually visualize using Reliability Monitor. It really tells you what's going on. All right, guys, let's check it out. But before we do that, please take one second to like this video. It really makes a big difference to me and my channel. It really helps me grow and whatnot. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing that. So if you're doing tech support or desktop, desktop support or what have you, chances are you'll be using ping command. So what is ping command and its use? I'm going to talk about the first part of it and explain the whole thing. But my written answer here is generally the ping command is used to determine whether your computer has access to external resources or the internet. So anything that is considered external resources is anything that's outside of the connection of your computer. So let's say you're using a desktop PC at work or a laptop, and then you're trying to access an external resource like a shared drive or a server or a website, whether it's internal or external, and you are you can't connect to it or there's a you know, issue with latency or lag of some sort, it's running slow, that's how ping command would be used. And all these things are considered as external resources. So something that your computer connects to over the network. Okay. Now through command prompt, CMD, you can type in, for example, ping www.microsoft.com. And this is an example of a ping command. So let's go ahead and open up CMD. I'm going to top, open up command line, command prompt, or whatever you call it. I keep saying command prompt, command line. I use Linux too, so sometimes I forget which one is which. Anyways, we're going to use this example that we have here, and it's ping www.microsoft.com. So let's see what happens when a normal working website is up and running and see the result from it. Did I misspell that? Of course I did microsoft.com i'm trying to multitask here so <laughs> you will forgive me <laughs> okay so one of the first things that comes up that you will notice here is a number which is an ip address which is 
uh, controlled by the DNS and the DNS basically what it does is takes a domain name in this case microsoft.com and translates it into a an IP address which is the location of this website on a server so the server for microsoft.com is located at 23.45.133.21 so that's the IP address for the server uh, of the server for the mic for microsoft.com okay so now these are real results of the ping command for a normal running website that is up and running and there are no problems so what happens is ping command sends four packets of data so you can see here that it sent four packets they are size of 32 bytes and then it waits for a response and how long it takes to respond which is shown here in milliseconds so this is the first attempt from uh, of the ping to this IP address and we can see that the response time here that it took 14 milliseconds to respond and then the ping command does it again which is the second time and this time it replied in 15 milliseconds and then the third time also 15 milliseconds and then fourth time also 15 milliseconds hence four packets sent right very very easy to understand but of course for it to actually respond for actually to have a response of any sort it has to send back four packets as well so you can see here that the server at 23451331 also sent back four packets which were received at the same size and then we can see that lost zero that means it was successful that means none of the packets failed that all the four pings were successful that's a, an example of successful ping command we know everything is okay with this website so let's go find a website that doesn't work so i went to this website and this website kind of tells you of some of the you know big websites that are down so let's kind of pick a random one here let's pick trivago.com here that's a safe website we're going to type in ping trivago let's do www.trivago.com now if this website is down like it says it is we're going to get some negative results which would be a good example of use of, of how you use a ping command and how to help you troubleshoot the issues so so far we can see that it's timing out what does that mean that the first packet was sent and it didn't connect it waited a certain amount of time didn't connect to the server or the server didn't reply i should say and then it timed out and then the second time as well i'm sorry first time second time and we're waiting for the third one third one timed out i'm sorry i didn't mean to go all full screen here let me kind of move some of this stuff out of the way so it's easier to see and we can see that all four packets sent timed out that means that the server just we you know the the ping you know waited waited you know we waited and the server didn't respond time out there's only a certain amount of time ping command will wait for a response and that's what happened and we can again see here that four packets are sent so and then zero received and in this example trivago.com is located at this ip address that's the server that's the web server for the trivago.com and now we can see that we sent four we waited we waited nothing happened we received zero because it's down and then we lost four that means we sent four and they never came back which gives us 100 percent loss of packets so how does this help us well for for one thing we know the website is down or you know a server that you're trying to access at your job is down right we can you know web server or some some other network component some other network resources you know if you have the name for it or the ip address you can just ping the ip address if you wanted to you can just type in ping you know ip address three five one seven nine dot zero zero two dot two zero zero and here we go again we're pinging trivago's server again except we're just directly bypassing the domain name and we're bypassing the dn well we're not necessarily bypassing the, but we're bypassing 
the uh, domain name, we're going directly to pinging the server itself. And again, it's timing out, which is another indicator that the website is down. So going back to the uh, my question of how does this help us aside from knowing that the website is down? So if it's an external website, what we would have to do is find the web a webmaster for it or a person who has access to the server. Same thing goes for if it's ex internal website. So let's say your business the, or the business that you work for has some kind of internal website that everybody goes to, everybody uses it, you know, this and that. And you know, you don't have necessarily access to it, you would find that webmaster and contact them. So how would you go about that? Well, if you know who the owner of Trivago.com is, you would contact them directly, obviously. But if you don't know who the owner is based off the, the name of the Trivago.com, based off the domain name, you can see who the owner is of this IP address. And this is something that uh, this is something that your company would provide this to you if you're doing tech support. So you would basically have a tool that lets you tool or you know some kind of notes or something i don't know if this is all depends on this varies from place to place you know but for example at my main job i know i will know who owns this ip address so not only can i look up to see who owns trivago.com for example i can also look up who owns this ip address and then i would contact that guy who is the owner of this ip address or a guy or a gal or whatever um, I, I would contact them and say, hey, this website is down. But the only time I would do that is if I don't have direct access to this. So let's say it, this is a server that I have, you know, that I'm running and everybody in the business here is using it as just a storage location. You know, let's say this is just a web server that hosts files for everybody in my building that I support. Well, I would simply just try this. You know, if I don't have physical access to it, I would open up remote desktop connection, type in 8.35.179.200. See if I can connect to it, you know, and it's going to fail because obviously I don't have access to it. And, you know, that's okay. But if I have physical access to it and... I know where it's located in the data center or in a server room or whatever it is, chances are this, you know, this server might be just turned off or, you know, there might be something else bad with it. But at least I will know that there is something wrong going on by using the ping command and that will get me to either me fixing it or finding who can fix it. And that's how you would use ping command in a business and environment either way uh, for this we're going to need a command line which we're going to open up right now so in order to use traceroute we're basically going to use the example from the article it's simply typed in trace rt <clears throat> pardon me trace rt followed by the name of the website you're trying to reach this doesn't have to be a website. It could be a server of some sort or a switch, or I should say just an IP address of uh, a network uh, component or a location. So, and that gets me into why would you want to use trace RT before I even hit enter here and then a bunch of stuff comes up. I want you to understand why you would want to use it. So let's say at your work, at your office, for some reason, you cannot reach CosmicNova.com. However, from your phone, which is, by the way, on a network on a different network entirely, you can reach Cosmic Novo just fine. Also, another example is an application that uses um, network connection to work. For example, an application that has to reach to a database that could be located in totally different state country this and that it could be at the end of the world it could be that it's not working that's another reason you would want to use traceroute or simply there is a server somewhere we can't reach whether it's used for storage or this and that 
we would want to use traceroute to figure out why you can't reach it from your office network but you can reach it from any other network so what it does in the nutshell traceroute it traces all the routes taken on the network to reach cosmicnovo.com in this example so it's going to map it out for me <clears throat> so think about it this way let's say you have a date or you are going somewhere that you've never been before you open up your phone you go to google or apple or whatever that you're using you type in in your navigation the address that you want to visit and it gives you all these routes that it takes you know it says go straight go left go right this and that the trace route kind of does the same thing in a sense however trace route it will tell you whether there are certain roads or routes that you cannot take or that they're broken or non-existent so that's a very simple explanation of what trace route does it tells you whether a certain turn is broken or non-existent hence the name trace route I hope that's an easy one to understand there. So we're going to see an example of this. As soon as I hit enter here, we're going to see what happens. And I'm going to explain um, all the steps that it's going through. All right. Hitting enter. We trace out executed. This is typically what happens. It takes maximum of 30 hops as in 30 roads or 30 paths, if you will, in order to reach the final destination, which is this IP address for this website and this may take a while this is why i have a finished trace route of all the routes taken for that website and i will show you what that is right now so let's have a look at some of the things that kind of stand out the first thing the first hop that shows up is basically pinging my ip address of the local computer so the computer i'm using right now local um, IP address for that is 192.168.1.1. So that's a typical local IP address. Second hop is basically trying to ping my IP address, external IP address for the internet. So my internet provider, which is Charter, is actually blocking that information for security reasons. It automatically blocks it. There's nothing I can do about it, but it's perfectly normal to see a second hop fail timeout like this. And then you can see that hops three through eight are all from my internet provider, charter.com. Is Charter is my internet provider. And you can see all these, if you will, switches that it takes in order to access the internet. It goes the outside of the charters network so it goes through all of these and it seems everything seems fine so that's perfectly fine and then finally reaches the internet and then it has to go through this switch here and again it looks normal this route is normal and then it goes to the number 10 again it's normal then we look at 11 and we can see that there's increased millisecond response not necessarily too bad because we're not talking like 80 milliseconds, 100 plus or something like that. However, something does stand out here and that there is a third on, on the third response or third attempt ping of it is there is no response whatsoever a timed out. So if we are having issues connecting to the final destination, potentially we could look at the switches or servers that are located at these two IP addresses. So the first one is 7214.23.232, I'm sorry, dot seven zero, and this other one that starts with 172. So because we see uh, no response here at all for the third uh, ping there, we can kind of possibly assume that there might be some kind of a latency issue with these two switches or nodes, if you will, or they could be server or whatever it is that they are we can look at that because it could be a server somewhere and the reason i say server is in a sense depending on which type of thing are we troubleshooting are we troubleshooting a website are we troubleshooting application connection this and that so it could be a you know part of the final destination of like for example application that maybe uses some kind of database that is located 
at the server or whatnot or server itself could be the firewall we don't know but we need to know kind of why what's causing this you know delay or lack of response whatsoever if there is a problem right but typically that's associated with higher millisecond response time so in our case this is probably just normal and chances are that these servers here just have a limit of how many times you can ping it so we're going to move on from that and then it goes through a bunch of different nodes here which could mean that it's just blocking this is very typical that these nodes are literally just blocking these type of um, connection requests which is fine we can this is pretty normal but every time you see a gap in between where it fails somewhere this is something we would have to be concerned about and we'll potentially look at that here in a moment but this is an example of a good trace route response and then it finally reaches uh, the uh, destination of 130.211.160.109 uh, which is where cosmicnovo.com is located as you can see here so it took all the routes and it took it 23 routes to get to the final destination and we know that everything is okay here all right so i found a website that's supposed to be down a safe website and let's see do i have that going here yep i had it uh, tested it. it's anthem.com which is basically insurance provider health insurance provider and i saw that it's down let me just double check here one more time i'm going to ping it one more time to double sh to, to make sure that it's down and then we're going to do a trace route on it to see if we can figure out what's uh, causing the problem chances are it's the web server itself but it could be something in between too so i'm going to do a trace out on that as well and then i'm going to and you can see that it failed you know sent for received zero it's timing out definitely down so we're going to do a trace route rt anthem.com and see what kind of response we can get Again, this may take a while, which I will just fast forward to the results so we can see what's going on with that. So as we are looking at the results of Anthem.com, you can see that they are similar to what we had earlier in the sense that it's taking same routes initially. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about. See, this is the first one, and we can tell that it takes, you know, hits my LAN, and then it goes through all of these charter uh, switches, if you will. And if we go back here, we can see that the, they are the same switches and it takes that same route. However, after it hits those, it decides to go another way, which was indicated, which was dictated by a this switch. This switch says, okay, well, now you know you're done with the charter network now you have to go through this something else so let's look at the previous one i'm sorry let's look at the previous one here and did we take the same one five one six six so in our case after the one six six charter sent us to this other one which ends with one two which by the way is probably next to it so there is a switch probably next to it in the same data center you can see how it's only off by three ip addresses anyways it decided in this case for the anthem.com which is this top one it decided to bypass the next switch which typically would have been this one to route to cosmicnova.com um, well it, well it had to take another one here so instead of going to any of these other ones you can see that this one just said okay well this is going somewhere else and it takes a different route and it goes to this other probably internet provider of some sort which i'm assuming is related to at&t and it doesn't say that here but the reason i know is if you look at these seven through ten you can see that the switches names are STL, which is, stands for St. Louis, ORD probably stands for Orlando, Florida. And uh, you can see that they're called atlas.cogento.com. And you can see the IP address that are connected to there. However, if you look at number 10, 
you can see that it says ATT here, so which is AT&T, probably Orlando. So it goes through Florida somewhere, and then it continues with switches that are located or that are that belong to AT&T, and then routes it further. And you can see that it hits another three gateways, uh, most likely um, in uh, on on an AT&T server before it reaches its final destination. This is still taking forever, so once it's finished, I'll I'll show you. Uh, what the end result is for Anthem.com. However, I want to talk about a point of failure that may occur that may show up in trace route command. And here's a really good example. We can look at these AT&T switches here. So 11 through 13. Trace route is can tell you immediately whether something failed and in, in the path that it's taking. So it's, we can imagine that in this example, that number 12 here timed out. So let's pretend this one timed out, literally timed out, and we need to figure out where is it at? Who, wh what's wrong with this? Chances are if it timed out that either it's blocking the, uh, this type of uh, information from being sent back, which happens with my IP address here, uh, but, however, if it's just kind of in the middle here, and we know kind of just kind of by intuition that it's supposed to take another route because it goes to the third one here, but for some reason just one, this one in the middle times out, that's a clear indicator of a switch that is, or the switch that is just bad. So, how do we find out, you know, if it's bad or not? Well, we would have to reach out to this guy or this company and ask them, okay, well, we need to get somebody from AT&T on the call or call them or contact them and say, hey, there's a problem here. And they'll be like, okay, well, let's send me the results of Traceroute from your location. And they send it, you send it to them, and then suddenly they're like, oh, the number 12 failed, but we still know it's kind of on their network because it keeps going to their network. You see what I'm saying? It goes to AT&T. We know all three of these hops are going to be AT&T, but the middle one fails. That means it's still on their network, and the problem is on their network, and they need to look at this. And they would know. It would, I know it would say timed out here, but they would know what the next one would be or should be, or whether there is a break of some sort that prevents everybody, and that one switch is causing the problem. So they would look at this and they say, okay, well, we know it's on this network, Let's scour our network and look for this broken switch. And that's the point of Traceroute. Of course, there could be other examples of that. And that is, let's say this one doesn't time out, but there is a huge, huge latency issue here. That would also indicate, that would also be indicated by Traceroute that there is a problem. So let's say their response time is like 100 milliseconds or even 80 milliseconds. This caused connection timeouts on the application and or a user end as well. So let's say there's a huge latency here. There's another reason why they would want to look at that switch or server and kind of see what's going on. The reason I say server is because it could be the final destination. We don't know. But in our case, we know it's not. It's just a switch that it's taking. And then with the trace route information, we can send forward this information to them and say, okay, well, you know, this is probably what's going on. Now, this thing is going to time out, and I'm going to kind of tell it to skip by hitting enter the attempt. For some reason, it gets stuck like this, waiting to get a re uh, response from the switch. And then I'm going to fast forward this to the end result. So as the final result of the trace route is coming up, we can see that the uh, anthem.com is just simply down. This is what it tells us. The normal response from the trace route when everything's okay is indicated in my other window here. And you can see that the final hop gives us the final destination address. In our case of anthem.com, it doesn't. It never reaches it, and this is clear indication that there's something wrong at the web 
server level. So the webmaster for anthem.com needs to look at it and resolve the issue at the server level. So, but you know, when we know that the website is down for everybody, this is not necessarily the reason we would use traceroute.com or traceroute to command for, we would simply just use ping command to see if it's up or down. But if there is an issue of latency, if there is an issue of website or an application working for some people, but not others that are on a different network, that's when we would use a trace route. So it's for troubleshooting connection issues that are specific to a network, you know, meaning that just because I can reach it doesn't mean that some other people can as well. So this is how you would use trace out to figure out where is the breaking point on their end and why can't they reach or why can't I reach a certain web server, application server or what not. And in today's video, we're going to talk about reliability monitor. It's one of those tools that comes with Windows 10 that people don't really talk about or mention, but it's actually a really cool monitor that kind of uh, filters everything out for you when it comes to system issues or system events. So it's similar to Event Viewer, except it's a little bit easier to follow, a little bit easier to navigate through. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. So let's go ahead and pull up reliability monitor. You can simply search for it and just type in reliability monitor and what comes up is view reliability history. Alternative way to get into it is through control panel. If you go to the control panel, select security maintenance here and then expand maintenance. And then from here, we need to click on view reliability history. We're going to click on that. And now it expands our reliability monitor once more. So what is, again, reliability monitor? You can think of reliability monitor, for example, as a highly filtered version of event viewer. So instead of giving you all the details for that one day on your computer, um, it gives you kind of filtered version of it that's much easier to follow. And it kind of mostly points out um, software updates and critical issues that may happen on your computer. It lists successful and failed software and driver installations as well, crashes, apps, and programs that stopped responding and other errors, of course, on a time-based scale. So what does that mean? That means it shows you events for every viewer, every day, I'm sorry, just like event viewer, except it's a lot more sp simplified and it gives you this kind of a graph with dates aligned as this. You can see the only main thing that keep in mind is that reliability monitor, monitor only goes back as far as one month. So it only gives you one month of uh, event viewing when it comes to issues on your computer, which could be good enough to kind of troubleshoot all the computer issues that are happening. So you don't necessarily need to go back over a month ago to figure out what is going on right now with your computer. On top of that, uh, reliability monitor, it can often provide important clues about the cause of sudden changes in system behavior as well. And that can be determined by the events that happened. And it can also kind of gives you an idea why, for example, my computer is crashing. What happened with the application? Why did it stop? You know, this and that. So again, it's an event viewer in a sense, except it's a lot more user friendly, if you will, or IT support friendly. So with a reliability monitor, let's go ahead and look at an example. And here's a good one. It says here that on October 5th, 2019, something happened. So if we just click on this bar, we can see that it gives you the details as well. But it also points out a critical event with this circle with a, a red circle with the X in it. And then we have the uh, warning one uh, war exclamation mark here, which is in yellow. And then we just uh, we have regular event here, which is in blue. So let's look at the first critical event. And it says Windows was not properly shut down. And you can see how it's easily laid out for you. And it gives you the date here. And it says, you know, it's October 5th at 8 a.m. And then, of course, on the right hand side of it, you can click on view technical details, which will give you more information on it if you select that. So you can imagine, you know, your let's say your computer is unstable and says, you know, your computer is shutting down just 
randomly. Windows was not properly shut down. So what does that mean? It means that either somebody pulled the plug, the power went out, or something caused the crash. So let's go ahead and click on view technical details and expands it. And it gives you a little bit more information. But as far as the computer knows, it's just it just knows that Windows was not properly shut down. So this could mean literally that it lost power. And then it also in description, it says the previous system shut down on, uh, let's see, what is this, six days ago was unexpected. So it gives you an idea that, hey, this happened also five days ago. So that can give you a clue of what might be happening. So you can either ask the user, hey, do you remember it shutting down before? Or you can simply confirm what the user is saying, hey, this happened before. And then you look and look at it, you, you can say, hey, did this happen about five days ago? And then you can see that there's a pattern going on here. So very similar to Event Viewer. And of course, I have a video on Event Viewer. If you want to check that out, I'll toss a link on the right hand side here. So let's look at the uh, exclamation uh, one that it's just a warning and it says here Google update helper and it says unsuccessful application reconfiguration and it happened at on the same day at 8.08 um, a.m. So let's say somebody's complaining about Google Chrome for example because Google Chrome is the only product I have on this computer and of course it's going to have a Google update helper and then I can see well all right well something's going on here. And then obviously it says here unsuccessful application reconfiguration. So I'm going to click on view technical details and it's going to give me a little bit more of the information. And again, it kind of uh, repeats what it said earlier here and, and on the top. And then in the description, it says Windows installer uh, reconfigured the product and it gives you the product name and that is Google Update Helper. And it gives you product version, product language manufacturer, Google LLC. And then it gives you reconfiguration success or error status so at this point we don't know what happened because if it says unsuccessful uh, application reconfiguration as far as we know it could be just permission issues but at least we have an error status which is the error code 1638 so we can simply google this and find out on the internet what the what this error actually means but again it could be just simple permissions issue you know and if user is complaining about google not working properly google chrome or this and that this kind of gives you a clue at least a starting point so let's just look at some of the uh, uh blue um, events that happened and informational events are down here and then again you can see there is uh, another google update health uh, helper and then it says here successful application reconfiguration and it happened kind of exact same time uh, where the where it unsuccessfully did it so that means most likely that it did get its uh, permissions that it needed to do so and then it actually did it so we can kind of confirm here that that well that was successful and we can see that the error status is zero so right away we can see well that's not the problem just because it failed here it actually succeeded below here so we're done with the google issue here and then of course we just have a regular event and it says here cumulative update for uh, .NET framework for Windows 10 and it says successful Windows update. So generally speaking, informational events are just that. It gives you information that something usually just happened normally and that is also good to know so that way we can kind of uh, exclude those things as possible problems for this PC. So with this tool, we can just keep going and scrolling through all the events. You can see some of them are just blank. There is basically just means there's no issues on those days. And then we got again, just the, you know, the blue event that happened and it's just normal. But well, the ones we want to kind of concentrate on here are the ones that are critical events. For example, this setup host.exe stopped responding on October 13th at 8. 53 a.m. and then we can just keep going and kind of look at those issues and what see what happened and it kind of gives you a really good starting point when it comes to figuring out what is wrong with all of these computer issues that may be happening and sure i can go through all this stuff together with you and let's just go ahead and take a quick look this one looks a little bit different because it's a setup host.exe and it says again stop responding at 8 53 a.m and it gives you quite a bit more detail and this is going to vary from program to program of course 
but again it gives you starting place to help you troubleshoot what the issue is and for example this one says stopped interacting with windows and it was closed to see uh, more information about the problem um, check the problem history in the security maintenance control panel so it gives you another starting point here it also gives you application path in some cases and you can see where this program is located and this is a windows component and then let's look at the same thing similar and it says uh, for this uh, yellow exclamation mark right underneath that it says notepad plus 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 unsuccessful application installation and uh, we can see more details of this one as well again this one happened on 8 51 a.m and it says windows install install the product blah 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 and then installation success or error status so this is most likely a failed installation and then we can look up again what the error is to clarify that information well there you have it guys this is a very useful tool in my opinion if you don't want to look all the information um, in the event viewer if you find that confusing because i can see how event viewer could be uh, harder to navigate through especially for new people to tech support so hey if you get an issue from a user or a report or user reports an issue it says hey my computer is unstable i don't know what's going on reliability monitor monitor is a good place to start to give you a quick look to see what's going on with that pc all right i hope you like this video please share it with friends if you have any questions please let me know leave any likes and i will See you next time. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about VPN, Virtual Private Network. This video is really good for people trying to get into help desk or desktop support. First video or first part of this video is going to be a presentation on VPN. It's going to explain what VPN is, how it functions, why we use it, and this and that. The second video is going to be a VPN troubleshooting example on how to troubleshoot VPN, things to look out for. And the third part of the video is kind of a things to kind of watch out for when it comes to dealing with a VPN, especially when it comes to resetting passwords for users while they're on VPN connection. This is a really good and important video to learn, and I hope you find it very easy to follow. That being said, please take one second to click like on this button. It really means a lot to me when I when you guys do that. It really is just kind of a, a excellent and wonderful way that makes me happy that you guys do for me. I really appreciate it as always. Thank you so much. So what is a VPN? VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. And the way that usually works is, let's say you start working for some business, for some company, and they decide that they want you to work from home occasionally, right? So what they do is they give you a laptop. They give you a laptop or maybe even a desktop, but typically it's just a laptop. They give you a computer and they say, okay, take this home and then VPN from home so that way you can work for us. What does that mean? Well, they want you to connect from home to the company's network so you have access to all the resources that you normally do so that you can work from home, right? That's what the VPN is in the nutshell. So where can you VPN from? You can VPN from home, you can VPN from coffee shop, a restaurant, a store, um, you know, anywhere there is internet access, right? So this is how it kind of works. You create a virtual private connection from any other location that has access to the internet, which allows you to connect to the company's network. And I've, I will explain what how this works your company has a centralized computer that deals specifically for VPN. There are servers that uh, there act as a proxy, if you will, that allows you to have access to all of the other uh, computers on that same network, on your work network, right? So you have a, a server that's a VPN server that you connect to, and this allows you to have access to the company's network, right? VPN is encrypted and it's safe. It's fully encrypted and it's safe. This is where uh, authentication comes in um, in a couple of different uh, forms, right? 
Um, the first thing that we need to do and have as software right vpn uses software you basically open up this software that's going to be installed on your computer you open it up and this software will typically ask you for authentication meaning login and password however there is a little bit more to it right you come to this screen and it says username and password and you know you have your normal username password that you use for your normal computer for for your you know for your computer that you go to work you know, you go to work, you you know, you log in with your login and password, and that's fine. However, VPN is different. It's going to have a little bit more to it. Um, a lot of times, and I hope most of the time, there's a, um, a some form of token authentication involved, whether it's hard token or soft token. So what I mean by that is it's a generated, it's a randomly generated number that you use in combination with your password, right? You have your username that's most likely not going to change. It's your regular username. However, you'll have a password and combination of, of the numbers that come from the token. So imagine a hard token is basically something that's kind of small, sort of like a thumb drive size and has a randomly generated number on it that changes typically every 60 seconds. You can have the soft token that basically does the same thing. You open it up on your computer and it just displays a bunch of random numbers that change every 60 seconds. So you type in your username, your password, and the randomly generated number, and then you log in. As a result, when you're authentica authenticated, now you have full VPN connection, which is encrypted. The company's network says, oh, okay, you're fine. Now you have full access to the network resources at the company that you work for. So it's the same as if you were sitting at the company's office, at your office, right? It's the same thing. You have full access to your work files, your emails, and everything else that's available to you at your office, right? That's the whole point of VPN. You have full access while you're at home when you create a VPN connection to all the resources at work. As somebody who might be working help desk or just tech support for a company, you'll have people who work remotely. And nowadays we have a lot of people working from home. So in order for them to actually be able to work, now they have to connect to the company's network. But now they can't work because they're not on the company's network. They're not physically there at the office. So they have to use VPN software to connect directly and attach themselves to the network of the company. This is why they use VPN software to do so. Now, what I have up right now is just a home user VPN that anybody can use. Not to be confused with a business VPN. This is the reason I have it up. This is going to be totally different. This home one that you can go to google.com and download free VPN, all it does is just hides your location so that way it looks like you're connected to the internet from some other country. That's all it does. It's completely different from business VPN in the sense of access to, to the resources that you need to work as somebody who works for a company. All right. So this is a sample of regular free VPN that regular people use, not workers. So let me show you. Here's the list of servers that they pick. So if they, for example, run this and they, for example, click Brazil, suddenly now they're going to look like they're connected to the internet from Brazil. So they're basically trying to hide their location. This is not the same thing as a business VPN. All right, that being said, let's look at a business VPN, how it kind of looks like. When it comes to business VPN, you typically get something similar to this. You launch the application and you get a similar pop-up to this. And it asks you for your username, your password, and a second password. So what is this second password? We know this is pretty straightforward. The username is probably going to be your network login or your domain login ID. It's going to be the same thing as what they use when they're at the office. So it's going to be the exact same thing most of the time. It's going to be the exact same thing as what they use at the office. Their username is going to be exact same thing. 
I'm sorry for repeating that. I just want to make sure that you know this. And the password is going to be the same thing as they use for the office when they log into their computer. Second password, however, is different. This is usually an RSA token. So what is RSA token? RSA token is a one-time password that is always randomized. I think it usually lasts 60 seconds once you get that one-time password and then it allows you to log in. You may have seen this with some websites. Some websites use one-time passwords to access your different types of accounts. It's very similar to that. So let's concentrate on this second password part of it first. This is kind of what it looks like. This is an old school way of getting that, that one-time password. It's a uh, token that is gen randomly generated. So basically what happens is you press a button, for example, like here or there, and it generates a random number that you use as the second password. A lot of times these are either hardware tokens. This is what they are. These are hardware tokens, but there are also software tokens. Let me just kind of scroll down to show you that. You can get a software token that kind of looks like this. Here it is, this one here where it says VPN token. This is something that's installed on their computer as well. So they'll have an icon on their computer with the VPN software. So the VPN software is going to be separate, and now, but they have to launch this VPN token to get this random code to use as part of their login, login as the second password. It might be the way they put in the password, the second password for the VPN token might be slightly different, varying from VPN software to another, but in the nutshell, they're going to need that VPN token or RSA token, if you will, in order to get that second password so they can log in and access the VPN or the network that they're trying to connect to. You can also have a mobile version of that. So you can have a mobile phone. I don't know if I have an example of that here, but you can install an app on your, some companies have an option of installing app on your phone that generates this random token. So that's the first thing to be concerned about when it comes to connecting through VPN when it comes to customer connecting to the VPN. So this is the main thing that you see when it comes to VPN uh, with help desk when people call in or contact the help desk. They're, most of the time they're going to say, I can't connect to the VPN. The main thing to learn when you work for some company is to learn how they are connecting. That's the main thing. Now let's move on to other things. Let's look at a VPN servers and how they are different from uh, how they are different from, let me see here, from regular VPNs. This is kind of what it's going to look like for somebody, for example, working in the United States. When they will launch their VPN software, they may get a list of servers that kind of look like this. And they're all going to be in US. And all of these are most likely the servers for the exact same company. So this is all the same network. They're all on the same network. They're just different location. This is very normal when they launch their VPN software. They will see a bunch of different servers and they may choose to select one of these. The reason it, you want to know about this is because sometimes some of these servers will be down. It happens. Sometimes there will be way too many people trying to connect, for example, to the same one. Let's look at the, let's look at the capacities here, for example. You can see that the Los Angeles one is the very first one. So people automatically they tend to click on the very first server available. And you can see that in this example, there's 13% capacity already, meaning that it has the most, well, this one has a lot too, 15%. But people a lot of times tend to pick the very first uh, VPN server for their company. Either way, if they're having trouble suddenly connecting to, for example, Los Angeles here, just ask them to connect to Miami, New York, San Jose, or Seattle. So that's one other thing to kind of keep in mind when it comes to connection issues. Now, the other thing uh, that is very common when it comes to VPN connection is that software is simply not there. So you have to have a, a way to uh, reinstall software to reinstall VPN software for the user. And a lot of times what happens is a company will set up 
a website that user can log into before they are connected to VPN. So, for example, what happens is they would get a link, they would type in that link, whatever that may be, get my VPN software. Dot com. For example, this is not, I don't even know if this is a real website or not, but this is kind of what would happen. They would get a link and keep in mind, they're, they're still there. At this time, they're not connected. Their problem is they cannot connect the VPN and they don't have software either. So they, what happens usually is they will have a link that they go to. And once they go to that link, they can download the software and install it. So you may have to help them install that software as well if they need admin privileges this and that that's just a basic troubleshooting when it comes to installing software but keep that in mind if they don't have it there has to be a way to get that vpn software installed onto their computer before they're connected to the vpn you, you see what i'm saying there has to be an external access or a way to initiate the VPN software installation so that way they can afterwards connect to the VPN and have all the resources available to them afterwards um, so they can just get back to work and start working. All right guys I believe this covers the VPN uh, troubleshooting when it comes to help desk or general tech support. Let me know if you've encountered anything else that might be related to VPN. I think I covered kind of the most common issues when it comes to VPN. Let me know in the comments if there is anything that I've missed. I'd be interesting to hear different scenarios, different options. But keep in mind, there are many, many different ways of initiating VPN. Companies a lot of times have their own proprietary software, you know, different prerequisites, meaning they may have a different uh, security so some companies, as far as I know, may not even require a second password or RSA token, which is kind of silly, but you do see that with smaller companies uh, that may necessarily have the manpower to set all this up and you know do the maintenance on it and keep up with all of that stuff. So it's going to be it's going to vary a little bit, but in general, what I've explained to you is exactly the main things. They're, they're exactly the, the main things to be concerned about and to learn when it comes to troubleshooting VPN connections. So with this knowledge, you can literally go, for example, to an interview for help desk. And when they ask you about the VPN, you can explain to them how VPN works in this type of sense. Again, it's totally different from VPN that you download from the internet to hide your location. It's completely different. It, it works the same way when it comes to connections, but it's not the same function because here you are just hiding your identity from the rest of the internet, while VPN for a business allows you connect, allows you to connect to the company's network. So that way you have access to all of those resources. So that way you can work, so you can get back to work. So this issue happens a lot when person's password expires their password expires and suddenly they cannot get onto vpn they can typically log into their computer but they can't get on their vpn because they don't get that prompt to change their password at all and they can't just do control alt delete this is where you can usually click change password or you would just it would just force you to change the password they can't do that because they're not on VPN yet. They are disconnected at this time. So the only thing they can do, as they typically do, is just call help desk and ask for a password reset. But we got to make sure that we don't just jump into resetting until we do a couple of things first. Let's have a look how I handle this call. And I hope you like my role playing. Uh, if you do, please take a second to like this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. So user decides that they need to change their password, so they need help with that. So what they do is they pick up the phone and call the help desk, and it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Can you uh, reset my password? I'm having a lot of trouble logging in. Can you reset my password? Sure thing, sir. I can reset your password. So this is something you would normally say to anybody who calls in and asks for password change or a reset. So what can you do with that? The thing is though, 
you have to keep in mind that when he's on VPN, he will not be able to take that temporary password that you've given to him and change it to his permanent password. Well, why is that? He's not connected to the same domain that you're changing his password on. So the question we need to ask him first is, are you able, sir, are you able to get on VPN? No, I, uh, I can't. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm not on VPN. I can't log into VPN. That's why I need you to reset my password. Sure thing, sir. But keep in mind that unless you're on a VPN, uh, me changing your password is not going to help you. Now, just to make sure, are you already logged in to the computer? Oh, uh, no, not not at the time. It's not at the moment. Uh, you want me to log in? Yes, please, sir. Uh, please log into the computer and make sure you stay logged in. Uh, I can't give you a temporary password uh, because the system is set up in such way where you can't change it to your permanent password until you're connected with your VPN first. And in order for you to connect to the VPN first, I got to give you a permanent password because it just won't work. You can't use your temporary password to log into the VPN. And once you are logged into VPN, uh, you can go ahead and update all your other systems by simply locking your computer and then unlocking your computer with your new permanent password. Unfortunately, yet again, I can't give you a temporary password because of the current uh, setup and the system setup situation that we have. And um, that's the only way I can help you with that. I hope that works out for you. Well, that will that'll work out for me. I just, uh, you know, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to make sure that I use this per permanent password. And then I just want to make sure I can get on right now. Thanks for your help. Sure thing, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you can get on VPN as a, as a number one thing. Uh, so that way, you know, you can get back to work or do whatever you need to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else I need uh, you need help with? No, I'm okay. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. And you as well. Have a good one. Bye bye. And there you have it, my friends. The only thing left to do here is show you footage from one of my videos on how to reset a password in Active Directory. Let me know if you like my puppeteering. I know you can probably see my mouse pointer moving the hands up and down. I hope this is something that people uh, might uh, find enjoyable. I uh, just kind of kind of uh, overview of what we gone over. The number one thing to keep mind in mind here is that if somebody is trying to connect to VPN, they need to have a working permanent password. If their password has expired, they obviously can't change it. Uh, when they are not connected to the VPN. Because remember, when you call help desk, you give them a temporary password, at which point they get a notification or forced to change it to a permanent password. That doesn't happen when you're trying to connect to the VPN. And if you're not on VPN, you're not going to be able to get that notification or that prompt at all. So you got to give them a permanent password. And if they decide to change it afterwards to something else, they can. So this is something you can mention as well. All right. Thank you so much for watching. And again, here is my video on how to change passwords and Active Directory. All right. Let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left-hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right click the users folder and select find. In here, you can type in the name of the user and he said Irvin underscore C-A-N. So let's go ahead and click find now. And here it is. We found the user. We can simply select it, double click it, and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in. So the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account. 
select apply or OK and this will unlock the user's account. Now we can get back to them and let them know to try again. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin CAN so we can find this user here. Since we found it already, we don't have to dig through the actor directory. A lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password is that now since you already found it, you don't have to dig and kind of like, you know, your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user. You can just find it here and then right click and reset password. And we're going to change the password to something temporarily. And then again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. And now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. All right, guys, I hope you find this video useful. Please share it with your friends. Let them know about me and ask them what they think. Are these videos useful to you? I think they are. I appreciate you watching. Have a good day. And don't forget to ask me any questions that you may have in the comments below. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kubuman. In today's video we have another crash course of what I typically do every couple months and that is combine some of my most recent videos into one. So it's a single place to start watching everything that I made because I feel like it's important and maybe it's easier to find for people watching. So here we are. We have starting off a couple of videos on VPN. First VPN video talks about troubleshooting VPN. Some of the most common things to kind of look for and kind of explain to you what VPN is for those people who are new to IT. Video explains things to think about when it comes to working on VPN and especially when a user asks for a password reset. Following on that, we have Zoom troubleshooting setup and audio issues that you may come across when it comes to Zoom. Following that is a video on how to deal with a broken monitor. And then after that, we have a video on broken links, website links. And the last video is basically about installing Windows 10. I hope you like it. Please take a moment to like this video and share it with your friends. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them as usual. All right, let's get into it. As somebody who might be working help desk or just tech support for a company, you'll have people who work remotely. And nowadays we have a lot of people working from home. So in order for them to actually be able to work, now they have to connect to the company's network. But now they can't work because they're not on the company's network. They're not physically there at the office. So they have to use VPN software to connect directly and attach themselves to the network of the company. This is why they use VPN software to do so. Now, what I have up right now is just a home user VPN that anybody can use. Not to be confused with a business VPN. This is the reason I have it up. This is going to be totally different. 
this home one that you can go to google.com and download free VPN, all it does is just hide your location so that way it looks like you're connected to the internet from some other country. That's all it does. It's completely different from business VPN in the sense of access to, to the resources that you need to work as somebody who works for a company. All right. So this is a sample of regular free VPN that regular people use, not workers. So let me show you. Here's the list of servers that they pick. So if they, for example, run this and they, for example, click Brazil, suddenly now they're going to look like they're connected to the internet from Brazil. So they're basically trying to hide their location. This is not the same thing as a business VPN. All right. That being said, let's look at a business VPN, how it kind of looks like. When it comes to business VPN, you typically get something similar to this. You launch the application and you get a similar pop-up to this. And it asks you for your username, your password, and a second password. So what is this second password? We know this is pretty straightforward. The username is probably going to be your network login or your domain login ID. It's going to be the same thing as what they use when they're at the office. So it's going to be the exact same thing most of the time. It's going to be the exact same thing as what they use at the office. Their username is going to be the exact same thing. I'm sorry for repeating that. I just want to make sure that you know this. And the password is going to be the same thing as they use for the office when they log into their computer. Second password, however, is different. This is usually an RSA token. So what is RSA token? RSA token is a one-time password that is always randomized. I think it usually lasts 60 seconds once you get that one-time password, and then it allows you to log in. You may have seen this with some websites. Some websites use one-time passwords to access your different types of accounts. It's very similar to that. So let's concentrate on this second password part of it first. This is kind of what it looks like. This is an old school way of getting that, that one-time password. It's a uh, token that is gen randomly generated. So basically what happens is you press a button, for example, like here or there, and it generates a random number that you use as the second password. A lot of times these are either hardware tokens. This is what they are. These are hardware tokens, but there are also software tokens. Let me just kind of scroll down to show you that. You can get a software token that kind of looks like this. Here it is, this one here where it says VPN token. This is something that's installed on their computer as well. So they'll have an icon on their computer with the VPN software. So the VPN software is going to be separate, and now, but they have to launch this VPN token to get this random code to use as part of their login, login as the second password. It might be the way they put in the password, the second password for the VPN token might be slightly different, varying from VPN software to another, but in the nutshell, they're going to need that VPN token or RSA token, if you will, in order to get that second password so they can log in and access the VPN or the network that they're trying to connect to. You can also have a mobile version of that. So you can have a mobile phone. I don't know if I have an example of that here, but you can install an app on your, some companies have an option of installing app on your phone that generates this random token. So that's the first thing to be concerned about when it comes to connecting through VPN when it comes to customer connecting to the VPN. So this is the main thing that you see when it comes to VPN uh, with help desk when people call in or contact the help desk. They're, most of the time they're going to say, I can't connect to the VPN. The main thing to learn when you work for some company is to learn how they are connecting. That's the main thing. Now let's move on to other things. Let's look at a VPN servers and how they are different from uh, how they are different from, let me see here, from regular VPNs. This is kind of what it's going to look like for somebody, for example, working in the United States. When they will launch their VPN software, they may get a list of servers that kind of look like this. 
and they're all going to be in US and all of these are most likely the servers for the exact same company so this is all the same network they're all on the same network they're just different location this is very normal when they are launch their VPN software they will see a bunch of different servers and they may choose to select one of these the reason it, you want to know about this is because sometimes some of these servers will be down it happens sometimes there will be way too many people trying to connect for example to the same one let's look at the let's look at the capacities here for example you can see that the Los Angeles one is the very first one so people automatically they tend to click on the very first server available and you can see that in this example there's 13 percent capacity already meaning that it has the most well this one has a lot too 15 percent but people a lot of times tend to pick the very first uh, VPN server for their company either way if they're having trouble suddenly connecting to for example Los Angeles here just ask them to connect to Miami New York San Jose or Seattle so that's one other thing to kind of keep in mind when it comes to connection issues now the other thing uh, that is very common when it comes to VPN connection is that software is simply not there so you have to have a, a way to uh, reinstall software to reinstall VPN software for the user and a lot of times what happens is a company will set up a website that user can log into before they are connected to VPN so for example what happens is they would get a link they would type in that link whatever that may be get my VPN software Dot com for example this is not I don't even know if this is a real website or not but this is kind of what would happen they would get a link and keep in mind they're they're still there at this time they're not connected their problem is they cannot connect to VPN and they don't have software either so they what happens usually is they will have a link that they go to and once they go to that link they can download the software and install it so you may have to help them install that software as well if they need admin privileges this and that that's just a basic troubleshooting when it comes to installing software but keep that in mind if they don't have it there has to be a way to get that VPN software installed onto their computer before they're connected to the VPN you, you see what I'm saying there has to be an external access or a way to initiate the VPN software installation so that way they can afterwards connect to the VPN and have all the resources available to them afterwards um, so they can just get back to work and start working all right guys I believe this covers the VPN uh, troubleshooting when it comes to help desk or general tech support let me know if you've encountered anything else that might be related to VPN I think I covered kind of the most common issues when it comes to VPN let me know in the comments if there is anything that I've missed I'd be interesting to hear different scenarios different options but keep in mind there are many many different ways of initiating VPN companies a lot of times have their own proprietary software you know different prerequisites meaning they may have a different uh, security so some companies as far as I know may not even require a second password or RSA token which is kind of silly but you do see that with smaller companies uh, that may necessarily have the manpower to set all this up and you know make, do the maintenance on it and keep up with all of that stuff so it's going to be it's going to vary a little bit but in general what I've explained to you is exactly the main things they're, they're exactly the, the main things to be concerned about and to learn when it comes to troubleshooting VPN connections. So with this knowledge, you can literally go, for example, to an interview for help desk. And when they ask you about the VPN, you can explain to them how VPN works in this type of sense. Again, it's totally different from VPN that you download from the internet to hide your location. It's completely different. It, it works the same way when it comes to connections but it's not the same function because here you are just hiding your identity from the rest of the internet while VPN for a business allows you connect allows you to connect to the company's network 
So that way you have access to all of those resources. So that way you can work, so you can get back to work. So this issue happens a lot when person's password expires. Their password expires and suddenly they cannot get onto VPN. They can typically log into their computer, but they can't get on their VPN because they don't get that prompt to change their password at all. And they can't just do control alt delete. This is where you can usually click change password or it would just it would just force you to change the password. They can't do that because they're not on VPN yet. They are disconnected at this time. So the only thing they can do as they typically do is just call help desk and ask for a password reset. But we got to make sure that we don't just jump into resetting until we do a couple of things first. Let's have a look how I handle this call. And I hope you like my role playing. Uh, if you do, please take a second to like this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. So user decides that they need to change their password. So they need help with that. So what they do is they pick up the phone and call the help desk. And it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Can you uh, reset my password? I'm having a lot of trouble logging in. Can you reset my password? Sure thing, sir. I can reset your password. So this is something you would normally say to anybody who calls in and asks for a password change or a reset. So what can you do with that? The thing is, though, you have to keep in mind that when he's on VPN, he will not be able to take that temporary password that you've given to him and change it to his permanent password. Well, why is that? He's not connected to the same domain that you're changing his password on. So the question we need to ask him first is, are you able, sir, are you able to get on VPN? No, I, uh, I can't. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm not on VPN. I can't log into VPN. That's why I need you to reset my password. Sure thing, sir. But keep in mind that unless you're on a VPN, uh, me changing your password is not going to help you. Now, just to make sure, are you already logged in to the computer? Oh, uh, no, not not at the time. It's not at the moment. Uh, you want me to log in? Yes, please, sir. Uh, please log into the computer and make sure you stay logged in. Uh, I can't give you a temporary password uh, because the system is set up in such way where you can't change it to your permanent password until you're connected with your VPN first. And in order for you to connect to the VPN first, I got to give you a permanent password because it just won't work. You can't use your temporary password to log into the VPN. And once you are logged into VPN, uh, you can go ahead and update all your other systems by simply locking your computer and then unlocking your computer with your new permanent password. Unfortunately, yet again, I can't give you a temporary password because of the current uh, setup and the system setup situation that we have. And um, that's the only way I can help you with that. I hope that works out for you. Well, that will that'll work out for me. I just, uh, you know, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to make sure that I use this per permanent password. And then I just want to make sure I can get on right now. Thanks for your help. Sure thing, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you can get on VPN as a, as a number one thing. Uh, so that way, you know, you can get back to work or do whatever you need to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else I need to, you need help with? No, I'm okay. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. And you as well. Have a good one. Bye-bye. And there you have it, my friends. The only thing left to do here is show you footage from one of my videos on how to reset a password in Active Directory. Let me know if you like my puppeteering. I know you can probably see my mouse pointer moving the hands up and down. I hope this is something that people uh, might uh, find enjoyable. I uh, just kind of kind of a overview of what we've gone over. The number one thing to keep mind in mind here is that if somebody is trying to connect to VPN, they need to have a working permanent password. If their password has expired, they obviously can't change it 
uh, when they are not connected to the VPN. Because remember, when you call help desk, you give them a temporary password, at which point they get a notification or forced to change it to a permanent password. That doesn't happen when you're trying to connect to the VPN. And if you're not on VPN, you're not going to be able to get that notification or that prompt at all. So you got to give them a permanent password. And if they decide to change it afterwards to something else, they can. So this is something you can mention as well. All right. Thank you so much for watching. And again, here is my video on how to change passwords and Active Directory. All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left-hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select Users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right-click the Users folder and select Find. In here, you can type in the name of the user, and he said Irvin underscore C-A-N. So it's going to click Find Now, and here it is. We found the user. We can simply select it, double-click it, and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in, so the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked, in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account, select apply or OK, and this will unlock the user's account. Now we can get back to them and let them know to try again. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find, and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin CAN so we can find this user. Here, since we found it already, we're going to have to dig through the actor directory. A lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password. Is that now, since you already found it, you don't have to dig and kind of like, you know, your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user. You can just find it here and then right click and reset password. And we're going to change the password to something temporarily. And then again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. And now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. But before we do that, please take one second to click the like button. And as always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I will answer them. All right, guys, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So here's what Zoom looks like when you install it. This is the Zoom application installed on your computer. When somebody gives you just a link and you've never used Zoom before, and chances are if they just sent you a link, you will simply click on the link and the link will say, hey, do you want to install Zoom? And then you click open Zoom or install Zoom and it's going to install it. And then what you get and what you actually see is this window. This is the window that you would typically see first time you use Zoom. And then you realize maybe my audio is not working. People can't hear me or people can't see me. We're going to definitely talk about that. But the, also a first pop-up that might you might see is it's going to ask you whether you want to use your computer uh, as audio. So you have to make sure that you click 
use my computer as audio. So that's going to pop up and you just click on that. And that's very simple. But then even then, if you don't have your audio set up correctly, it may not work. Let's look at the microphone uh, icon here. You can see there's activity there. That means it's detecting that there is a microphone. It's picking up all those sounds from the microphones coming through. That's good. However, we may have multiple microphones. How do we know which one is being used correctly or if any? So what if that's not happening? That means we need to tell it which microphone needs to be used. So if we click on this little arrow here, we're going to see a lot of stuff. And you can see I have a lot of stuff. The reason I do is because, you know, I'm a YouTuber. I have lots of equipment. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that shows up. If you simply have a headset, if you simply have a headset, all you got to do is find out what is the name of it. In my case, I have a headset and it's called Plantronics C610. So I'm going to make sure I select that as the speaker because otherwise I won't be able to hear people. So now my Plantronics C610 C610 is selected. So that's my speaker. That's what I'm going to hear inside of my Plantronics headset that I'm going to put on my head. And then same thing for microphone. I'm going to make sure that this microphone is selected. And notice it's still working. The reason it's working is because it's selected as same as system. And I have multiple ones. So it's probably picking up my microphone that I'm speaking to right now, which is not my headset. But for Zoom meeting, I want to use my headset. So I'm going to select it. And then I'm going to double check here, make sure it's selected. And you can tell that it's selected by simple, you know, check mark that you have here. And that's one way to make sure that you're using a separate, like if you have multiple things like me, this way you can keep track and make sure that, you know, if you want to use it separate from other equipment, you just have to make sure that it knows what you want to use. And now my audio is set. This is if you're using a headset. If you're using like a laptop, if you have a laptop, you have to make sure that the microphones, laptop and speakers are selected. So if you're not using a website and just your built-in laptop camera and the microphone, make sure that Realtek is selected for the speakers like this speakers and the camera since i'm not using a laptop all you see is speakers and no cam no microphone here but if i was to for example switch to my a uh, webcam and like for example i have a uh, microphone on a webcam that is called hd pro webcam and i'm going to select that if you want if i want to use that camera now this webcam doesn't have speakers so i'm going to make sure that realtek is just enabled, which is my PC speakers, right? So again, don't pay attention to this last part too much unless you have these specific things. But if you're using a headset, make sure you select the correct headset in both of the, these menus. That way it makes it simple for you. But if you have a laptop, just a laptop, you won't have this many things in here. So just make sure that the Realtek is selected. But if you have a webcam, make sure that the webcam is selected and uh, the PC's speakers. So now you can see how I've selected the microphone for the Plantronics and it's actually picking up a little bit less of it because it's kind of uh, about a foot or so away from me. So it's picking up less of it. Right now I'm speaking into something else. Anyways, that's the audio. Uh, we can certainly test it. You can test it here, test speaker and microphone and it goes through this setup where it detects the levels of it and then it tells you, do you hear the ringtone? And it's a really good way to actually make sure that your headset or your audio is working. So I highly suggest you use that for testing. And then you can also have, if you have a phone embedded, that's another thing. Uh, but, you know, this is uh, this is video specifically for somebody who chances are just installed a Zoom for the first time. And this phone integration is something else. So I don't necessarily want to talk about this because it would be way too much and way too confusing. Um, and then uh, you can, if you click leave computer audio, uh, that means you can just like call into the meeting and use your like phone, like your cell phone, you know, or your, your home phone if you have them. And then if you want to really look at the audio settings, you can click on the audio settings here. And then you can see again what is selected in just a different separate menu. But it's the same thing we did earlier, except that you can adjust the output levels and this and that, you know. And then 
there are other things you can do, like use separate audio device to play a ringtone simultaneously. For example, if you have a headset, but you want your ringtone to come through the computer speakers, make sure that this is checked like that, and then select speakers, Realtek. So now this time it, the ringtone is going to come through the PC speakers. There are a lot of issues, uh, a lot of issues, a lot of things you can do here. And then, you know, just play with them and make sure, you know, kind of find out what your preferences are. And then, you know, like, for example, you can automatically mute your microphone when you join a meeting. These are all personal preferences. You can go to advanced and deal in and, you know, adjust the background noise. But this is fine as it is. I wouldn't worry about it. Just kind of leave it at that. Otherwise, you can just cause issues, more issues with the audio. And if it works, you know, don't try to fix what's not broken type of thing, you know. So just make sure that your proper microphone and speaker are selected. Do a quick test on them and make sure that works now let's look at the video video all right now i just have a picture there and if i click start video you can see me here talking and this is uh <laughs> this is my puppet here i guess and i just have that for and you can see me over here in the in the right hand corner uh right there you can see me uh just kind of talking and waving so i'm the puppeteer if you will so my video is enabled here, but if I want to stop at any time, I can just click stop. And then if I want to select a different camera, I can certainly do that. And for example, select this HD you know, webcam or whatever your webcam is, it's going to be listed there. Now, keep in mind that if you have a camera open in another program, that it may not work at all. Like in this example, if I select my pro webcam here, it's not going to work because I have it open another program. So if I click start, it just doesn't do anything. It's, it literally says cannot start video, fail to start video camera, please select another video and camera settings. I know you can't see that error pop up because it's on my second screen where my puppet is. And I'm going to actually switch to it. So maybe, maybe hopefully it stays there. Yeah, you can see it right there that there is the error cannot start video because I had um, camera, um, I clicked on a camera that's been used by something else. So make sure that no other program is open and using your camera. That's why you get that error, you know? Otherwise it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You select the camera you want to use and that's that. Now, and then you can look, I mean, let's look at the video settings here, what we have here. And uh, you can set different uh, options. Of course, select the camera you want to use again, but you can also see that you can change the aspect ratios, enable HD, and you can mirror your video. You can touch up your appearance to make yourself look prettier. And, uh, you know, different personal preferences that you want to show people about you. Camera is one of those things that is, you know, I don't like using it um, for obvious reasons because I'm ugly, but, you know, you know, some people like it, some people like it. So, and that's fine. Um, I personally don't care for it. Here's a, some kind of fun thing that you can look at and that is virtual uh, backgrounds. So let me see if this works since I have a green screen going on. I wonder if it'll actually detect it decently or do anything with it. And I'm going to select that. I have a green screen. Oh, wow. Hey, that's pretty cool actually. Look at that. Would y'all look at that? All right, all right, let me, let me close it here. I'm going to start video. Hey, that's not bad. So if you have a green screen, this works really cool, doesn't it? I like that. That's pretty cool. It looks like I'm in space and whatnot. Let's change to something else. Choose a virtual background. Ooh, at the beach. I wish I was at the beach right now. Look at that. Would you look at that? That's pretty cool. Oh, look, it's moving. <laughs> that's actually pretty fun. I've seen other people's um uh, you get other people using virtual backgrounds and it kind of looks off because they don't have green screen but in my case i have a perfect green screen because it's softer there's no cloth behind me or anything like that it's just my puppet and he um has a perfect green screen because it's 100 percent green ski and let's do one other oh okay huh i think this one's the best although it's not moving and then there is none. You can see there is my perfect green screen over here, you know. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. I think it's really fun to actually create this video. I, uh, uh, it's, it's cool. It's cool. Like, it's not that hard to use, but, yeah, you know, people still have issues. And that's understandable. It's okay to have these type of issues, you know. It's okay. 
As long as we know how to fix them, these are normal computer issues that happen all the time. All right, guys. So here's our ticketing system. If you haven't watched my videos on how to use ticketing systems, I certainly have them. Check out my help desk playlist. So in this case, uh, we're going to work on this ticket from uh, this gentleman here. And we're just going to select it because it's not assigned or anything like that. So the first thing we're going to do is assign it to ourselves. And I'm going to click over here real quick and I'm going to assign it to myself. So what do we have here? This ticket is about my monitor is not working and then there is a number and it says call me. And this guy's name is Mike Moser. So in this case, this customer really wants us to call them. So in this case, we're not going to communicate via email or through the system or through an instant messenger or anything like that. This guy wants to be called. So we're going to call him and we're going to try to help him with a broken monitor. Now, I know that a lot of uh, uh, people are working from home nowadays. So in this case, we're going to ro role play um, into assuming that this guy or this customer is actually working from home. So that way we can kind of provide uh, at least current time type of uh, situation. But then again, of course, when you do help desk, you will help people that are working from home as well. So let's give him a call and see how that goes. Hey, this is Mike. Hello, sir. This is Irvin with Help Desk. I have your ticket about monitor not working. Now, just to make sure, is this Mike Moser? Yeah, this is Mike Moser. All right, sir. I just wanted to see uh, what I can do to help you with this. Um, so your monitor is not working. Yeah, that's right. My monitor is not working. I don't know what's going on this morning. I uh, logged in and I couldn't, I don't know. It's just, it's just a blank screen. It's just black. It like, kind of looks like it's dead. So I'm not sure what I can do here. Sir, um, do you, um, when was the, no, just to make sure. Is your monitor turned on? Like, is there a green light on it or like some kind of indicator that's turned on? Yeah, it does. It does look like it's turned on, but I don't know what's going on. All right. No problem, sir. Now, does your, uh, now just, I just want to make sure, is your computer turned on? Do you see any like indication on the computer itself that there's like a blinking lights or is there any activity on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's uh, it, it's working. I uh, pressed the on button and uh, it, it's it turned on. Everything seems to be working. It's just the monitors. I I can tell. I can tell that the I can hear the noise whenever I turned on the the, the computer. I heard the noise. You know that 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 noise that comes up every time you turn on a computer. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that that's pretty good. Uh, that's a that's um that's a good thing actually. It's better than, you know, better for your monitor to be broken rather than the computer itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. So um, do you by chance have two monitors? Yeah, I I actually do. Yeah. That's great, sir. So if you can, um, can you please unplug the one monitor that's not working? Yeah, I can try that. Hold on. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So what's going on? Chances are that only one of the monitors is broken and not both of them. So if you unplug the one that's not working, the other one should come up with a picture. Uh, all right. All right. I'm, I'm going to try here. Hold on. All right. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it does. The second monitor does work. Yeah, I see. I see the where I can log in and stuff. Well, that's great, sir. So uh, thankfully, it's just one monitor that's broken. Um, in this case, it, it really does sound like the first one or the one that your main one is. It wasn't working. It was just kind of dead. And I know you didn't uh, unplug anything before that or anything like that. No, no, no. I didn't touch anything. It's just, you know, that's I, I just I, this morning is just not working. All right. So the reason I say it's good is because this way you can at least work with mo one monitor for, for now. But um, we can certainly replace your uh, broken one. So, I mean, there are a couple of ways of going about it. You can order a new one through the, the system that you have in place, maybe through the, through the company's website or something. I think there's an ordering website. Or if by chance you go to your local um, office uh, where they have the you know, IT guys locally, maybe they can give you a new one or something like that. Because I know you work from home. So, um, all right, all right. Well, I'm glad I got one working. Uh, 
all right, I guess I'll just deal with this one or just work with, with the one for a time being. Uh, all right, uh, well, thanks for your help. Yeah, no problem, sir. If there is anything else that you need help with, please let me know. Uh, but yeah, it does sound like just one of those monitors is, is broken. And, ch you know, chances are that if it's an older one, that just happens all the time. Um, all right, um, anything else? No, nah, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for your help. All right, sure. No problem. You have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. All right. So now that we have finished talking to the customer, the next thing we have to do is uh, leave a uh, note or and even close the ticket in this case. So this is a good situation in which we can uh, do so. Uh, chances are, I mean, depending on the setup in your business environment that you may want to route this ticket to their, to his local support. It depends on whether he's going to actually go physically to the office where he works and get a monitor from there, you know, but we haven't, since we haven't gone through that with him and he doesn't know for sure, he can deal with that on his end. But of course, we're going to add a eternal note that simply says customers main monitor is not working um let's see here what what else can we say can we provide more detail or or uh, about what we did or are we just going to say that we resolved it by unplugging it well it's up to you I and mean, this is about a style of you how you work so, but I like to provide details. So what I'm going to do is type in instructed Mike to unplug the first slash broken monitor. After doing so, it appears that the monitor is indeed broken. And then we're going to type in a workaround down here. And again, this is your personal preference on how you put these notes in, but you want to put down what you did and how you resolved it. That's for sure. Your, how you do it, it's up to you. And this is what I'm going to do. Workaround. He will use his second monitor for time being. Later, he will acquire a new monitor. And that's pretty much what I'm going to leave here. Because what I did here is, you know, stated that indeed his monitor, main monitor is not working. Asked him to basically test it. Because uh, that's been about the only thing you can do when you're not physically there. Asked him to unplug the first broken monitor. A lot of times you would... Just check the cables, see if everything is plugged in. But I kind of went with my guts here and just kind of asked him to unplug the first broken monitor. Because this situation also happens where people assume that their computer is broken, but it's actually not. What's going on is that their main monitor goes out, but their second monitor is actually just blank screen or it's just it's just black, right? So there's nothing going on. They assume their computer is broken. In this case, he kind of assumed it was a monitor and he was right. It's, it's the main monitor that's broken, and I instructed him to unplug the first broken one, and after that, it appears that the monitor is broken indeed. However, he has a workaround, which is his second monitor for time being. So we're going to save that, and uh, we're going to change the status to complete, and... Uh, I think that saved it. I always forget whether there's actually a save button because I use a bunch of different ticketing systems. And definitely at my main job, I use a different ticketing system and there's actual save button that I have to click after I completed. Well, there you guys, there you have it, guys. Uh, this is how you resolve this simple monitor ticket, but it's a good kind of um, shows you how to deal with a customer in, in a sense. And I hope you like my role playing. Obviously, you can tell that it was me doing the voice. I... Uh, I, I kind of went with um, Dr. Fauci's raspy voice. If you recognize that uh, or if you see that in that, <laughs> let me know. But that's kind of what I went with. It was the, uh, I think his name is Anthony Fauci, right? You guys know what I'm talking about um, if you're up to date on the current situation in the world. All right, guys. So 
let's look at this ticket i have a, this a mock-up ticket that i created in this uh, service desk system and it's called my email is not working the uh, description would say hi my email is not working this is my link and then they show you a link and there's a link right there we can click on it we can check it out that's perfectly fine and then we have an attachment of an error and if we click on that it gives us a lot of clues to what the problem is so i love seeing attachments of the errors because they can save me a lot of time when it, when it comes to working tickets and we already you know we can already guess what the problem here is because we've seen this type of website before many many times chances are we all use this type of website and we can see immediately why mail is not working their email is not working and if we click on the link sure enough it's not working because it's broken but as as we can see here we we know that we are just missing the l there so if we just type in l there just a sec type in l we can see that the email is working so we can simply come back to the customer or user and just say hey this is the correct link which is perfect and great this is easy ticket to do and it's no problem right the situation what I want to talk about is related to when a user or a customer reports a link not working of a website that you're not familiar with at all so we can fix this one easily just by adding L but when we go to a website for example imagine if this was the problem here this link up here imagine if that was the problem how would we even know that this part of it is not missing just that eight how do we know that so we won't we won't know that it's not like we know every hyperlink for each website to know for sure whether the user is using that specific link i mean it can extend to as far as we know a limited length so how do we deal with that specific issue so let's pretend that this is a website that's not google.com that's something totally different now we have to reach out to the customer and preferably this issue i would handle preferably over the im or instant messenger if available within that company if not you may have to call the user and talk to them directly that might be another option and the way i would go approach this i would reply to the customer i would say hello my name is Irvin with help desk I have your ticket about broken a link and then if if it's again if it's a website that we're not familiar with we don't know for sure because the thing is though we click on the link and we also get the same error so we don't know whether they're using the correct link or not or if the website is down for sure so we have to figure out first whether it's the broken link because 90% of the time it's the wrong link that they're using and it's not necessarily their fault or anything like that we have to make sure that we're respectful towards the user or the customer because this type of stuff happens you know especially if they're pushing back saying that it's not you know it's you know there that is there is the correct link but that's okay we're going to get to that part here so hello my name is Irvin with help desk I have your ticket about broken link and then we can say um, if we're suspecting a wrong link that they're using is anybody else in your group having this issue or we can say is anybody else in your group able to access this website All right so we can send that off to them and wait for their reply but you know since since it's a website we don't know we, we kind of want to resolve this as quickly as possible we don't want to necessarily wait for them to receive an email from the ticketing system for the notification wait for them to reply this and that that i mean that's fine if you know or if they happen to be watching their email all the time but chances are they're not this is what i'm saying you might want to reach them over the im if possible or if you want to call them so a lot of times they come back and say this customer yes that is the correct link right so they may come back and just say that then then what do you do and if you're still suspecting uh, that 
it is the you know that it that it is the wrong link you can say can you please check with one other person just to be sure and then they might come back and say uh, usually after a little bit because they are you know chances are they are probably checking you know and then uh, you know if they come back and say yes it's working for them so this is your clue right here immediately we immediately have like even higher suspicion that it is indeed a wrong link a wrong link that they might be using if is if this is working for somebody else and not for them and it's obviously not working for us that's because i Irvin, and the customer and the customer we both have the wrong link that was provided by the customer and then if they keep saying if they keep insisting they are using the same link as me you can say can you please show me the screenshot of a working website so you got to be you got to be very careful with this you got to be kind of uh, systematic in a way but also respectful at the same time you can't just tell them no you are using the wrong link that's not that's not the way you deal with uh, customers or users on the help desk so customer would you know reply with screenshot and then you would look at that screenshot and then chances are that that screenshot will have that clue to you of what the correct link so you're looking at it and then you're like well you are unfortunately you are using the wrong link because you're missing like an eight or in our case of the email here you know we can go back to this if we look at it we can say well in this case you're missing an L so that indeed is the wrong link unfortunately and that would resolve that sure at some point you will come across an issue where it's a website that it, it you know the website is down for everybody so and and that's different you know if you you know especially if you're familiar with the website you'll know yeah this is not normal this and that but in this case this is how you deal with a customer or a user that simply has a wrong link for whatever reason it happens you just got to be respectful and be systematic about it and very professional about it this comes up a lot on help desk wrong link tickets it's very very common thing all right guys i hope you i hope you like this video i tried to make it as as a real world example as possible and explain it in a way where it's easy to understand please let me know what you think in the comments below if you have any questions i have a lots of help desk videos that are very uh, very useful very popular a lot of people like them and i hope you have a wonderful day okay all right i'll see you next time bye bye oh wait wait i almost forgot to mention guys i have a lots of written stuff that's related to help desk network administration system administration all kinds of it topics i don't even remember how many i got but it's on my website it's at cosmicnovo.com so if you go there you can see that i have a bunch of different written versions of all kinds of different it stuff that you can read if you're if you would if you would rather read um, some of this stuff then you can certainly do so on my website so in my recent video i was installing windows 10 on the laptop that i've upgraded with an m.2 drive and my excitement and happiness went quickly from that to being very angry at trying to install windows 10 on it i do realize that this version of windows 10 is 1909 i feel like things changed or maybe i missed something please let me know this video that you're about to watch is completely unedited aside from the part of me just adding this intro but everything else is just straight through without cuts and my experience was not not very good installing windows 10 
it, the the stuff and the amount of things they were making me do just to get into the Windows 10 was very infuriating at some point and uh, I hope that doesn't translate to you guys but I just wanted to share it you know this is unedited uh, fairly long clip so here you're going to watch me basically install Windows 10 on this laptop alright here it comes uh, now we're going to see how quickly we can install Windows on it keep in mind that the USB stick that I put on there is uh, that I plugged in it's a very old one that is super slow too so but you know I digress we'll see how fast we can install operating system on it uh, if it takes too long I'll certainly uh, edit that out but hey uh, who knows uh, maybe it's gonna be pretty quick alright you know to select new install by the way if you're just there's our drive going to create a new partition I'm just gonna leave it a default because I want to use all of it and what was I gonna say so it creates a bunch of different partitions one just has to be like that for um, just the way operating system works do you want to proceed yes and uh, yeah very important otherwise you won't be able to boot and I get that question a lot from uh, my video on installing an M.2 adapter um, very popular video I want to say it's almost 400,000 views at this point. People always ask me, can I boot, you know, can I boot OS through it? Well, if your computer supports uh, UEFI, then yes. Uh, that's, that's definitely possible. But not just the regular UEFI either. Sometimes you got to have the most recent one, most recent version. I'm going to get, what was it, the most current one? 1.3 or 1.4? I'm not sure, but... Um, this one is uh, definitely going fast considering it's it's loading from a USB 2.0 on a really old thumb drive that matter of fact I think I washed one time in my pants because it's one of those that you put on your keychain you know um, it, it it fell off the keychain and it stayed in my pants in my pocket but uh, I still use it it's an old 32 gigabyte drive it's slow but hey that's going pretty fast so I'm happy with that I um, what we're gonna do here I'm going to do a fresh install I'm going to install crystal disk and we're gonna run that right away matter of fact I'm not even going to install any drivers for this Samsung NVMe I'm gonna test it without any Samsung drivers installed whatever Windows gives me I'm gonna test it with that what happens happens right and I'm gonna make sure I disable uh, any, I'm gonna put basically a laptop this into airplane mode so there's no Wi-Fi um, enabled. I'm only going to enable it just so I can install Crystal Disk. But I don't want any updates to start doing because that's the first thing that happens once you install a fresh Windows copy. Oh yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Windows 10, if you already had Windows 10 on the computer, you can just reinstall it. And if you get that pop-up, do you want to register and whatnot? Uh, don't worry about that, as soon as you get on the internet, it's going to be it's going to register it you know so because it knows it's hardware based so it's okay for you to install a new hard drive I mean they know that you're going to install a new hard drive because it knows um, it's, it's basically going to know that it's the same computer and it's the same key same key and same license so you don't have to worry about oh am I going to be able to reinstall Windows on it yes you can I will definitely get a pop-up do you want to register it or you know this and that but as soon as I get to the, on the internet, get on the internet, it's going to work. Um, same thing if you're doing a fresh install on a brand new computer, if you have a Windows 7 key, you can also use that to, um, you know, to activate your Windows. That's what I meant to say. Register, activate, not register. You know, it's, it's different. It's activate. Registering Windows is basically creating a Windows Microsoft account to register your product. But how long have I been speaking? This is almost done. It's 95%. And um, that's getting ready files for installation. We'll see how long it takes to install uh, everything else. But so far it's going really fast, considering it has to read from a, something super slow. But that's okay, you know. I, I think it's going to be really fast anyways. Wow, it instantly installed features. Uh, there's, there can't, you can't get any updates, because it's not connected to the internet and wow that's it's going pretty fast let me do a little zoom out action here 
you guys can see the little progress bar down there. Oh wow, it's already done. Oh my god. Oh wow. Okay, okay. See, it's gonna restart up there. Oops, sorry about that. I need to shake the screen. I just accidentally hit the, the tripod. So it's rebooting right now. And should I unplug it? No, I was thinking about my USB stick. Hopefully it doesn't because it's gonna hopefully it doesn't try to boot from that again. I, uh, well, I'm just going to let it be. If I have to remove the thumb drive in a second here, I'll certainly do that. Alright, come on, baby. Come on. Come on, baby. Let's make it happen. Let's make it for the people. Let's make it happen for the people watching. By the way, guys, since we're waiting on this, come on, man. Click the like button. Click the like button. I know you got one second. Okay, so it's trying to install it again. So I'm just going to pull the hard, the uh, thumb, thumb drive out real quick and I'm going to cancel this. It's what I should have done right away. So once I, once it, this happens, it's, it's going to, it, it's done. That, that was, what was it? I'm going to have to check. Maybe three minutes or something like that. Maybe three minutes to install from a slow thumb drive. Man. I'm very optimistic to see how fast this is going to go. Wow, did you see that? That went quickly. All right. Now, usually also whenever you create a new like a login account for somebody, that can take a while too. Basically your login ID whenever you, you know, trying to do something on the computer and you got to have a login ID. We'll see how fast that goes. I suspect here very shortly it's going to come up to that window where it's going to ask me do you want to activate all these Windows 10 features and whatnot which I personally like to disable but for the sake of moving the salon I'm just going to leave it enabled later on I can disable it I um, I don't like I don't like all that you know too much data being sent over the internet to Microsoft or anybody else I like to keep things as private as possible. All right. The screen went dark and it rebooted once more. Let's give it a sec. Give it a sec here, guys. Give it a sec. It's almost there. It's almost there. All right. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. I sound like a. <laughs> Here we go. I was gonna say I sound like uh, Elvis, but I probably don't. Elvis Presley. There it is. Cortana. I'm Cortana. No, How Cortana. No, come I'll on, Cortana. Sign in here, attach a Wi-Fi there, and we'll have your PC ready for all you plan to How do I get an exit out of this? Use your voice or the keyboard along the way. Come on, Cortana. Need to stay quiet, just select the little microphone icon towards the bottom of your screen. Yes. Come on. Come on, Cortana. All right, cool. Sure. Skip. And uh, let's do, I do need to connect real quick to my Wi-Fi, which is this one. I'm going to put my password in. I think that's right. Sure, sure. Come on. Let's see how fast we can do this. By the way, by the way, this is like one of the record times for installing Windows 10, honestly. This is all real time. I haven't cut once. I haven't cut even one time. I can't wait to see the, uh, the test, the crystal disk test on this. I'm really curious. I don't want to see what's new on Windows. Come on, man. Just just get in there. Just a moment. All right. I'm waiting. All right. There it is. Nope. I'm not going to use Microsoft account. No. No, 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 no. Come on. I don't want to use this. Come on, and back. Uh, 
let's just do that in Cobble Man. I don't want to, look, I hate this. Get a new one. Get, get a new create account. I'm trying to create a local account and it's being so so difficult. They changed it. Create an account. No. I'm not 